Good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order at 10 a.m. As many of you know, the governor has recently signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that I, as head of the Chicago Plan Commission, determined that an in-person meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is not practical nor prudent. I wanna make sure our virtual meeting makes, meets all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, I am making determination pursuant to the newly created section 72 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is not practical nor prudent. Similarly, I'm also making a determination pursuant to the newly created section 85 that because of this disaster, as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Chicago Plan Commission or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place in as much as there is no physical meeting place. Before we get into the full meeting agenda for the July 15, 2021 Chicago Plan Commission meeting, I would like to ask everyone that because we are meeting virtually, please be mindful of your surroundings in terms of noise. Please remember to keep yourself muted when you are not speaking. The meeting is being recorded and also live streamed for public viewing. And we welcome all the live stream viewers. Lastly, if you are an active participant in the meeting, especially if you are speaking, please do not watch the live stream as this will cause audio interference. Thank you. I want to also provide quickly provide guidance to those who have pre-registered to provide testimony on the cases presented for public hearing today. Those who requested to testify at the public commission today should have already submitted testimony forms, which include the speaker's full name and address, as well as the public hearing item number, and those forms have been gathered by the staff. I would also like to remind our presenters to be, please be mindful of their presentation length. Um, you will have three minutes to speak. Um, when your name is called, your microphone will be unmuted to allow you to make your comments. The public comment portion of the meeting is not a question and answer session of staff or the applicant, but an opportunity for attendees to voice their opinions on a particular proposal. Out of respect for others, please do not interrupt or disrupt the speakers and any individual who, who does um, may be muted and remove from the virtual signing session. So with that, let me uh, do a roll call, uh, beginning with Commissioner Biagi. Yes, or here, <laughs> sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Brumfeld. Here. Commissioner Burnett. I saw you, I think I saw your feet earlier. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is here. Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Burnett is here. I knew it. Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Flores. Here. Commissioner Garza, I think I saw you as well. Present. Yeah, present. Commissioner Grossman. Yes. Good morning, Commissioner. Commissioner Kelly. Commissioner Lightfoot, Commissioner Lyons. Here. Commissioner Moore. Here. Commissioner Murphy. Here. Commissioner Novada. Commissioner Osterman. Commissioner uh, Barkley. Commissioner uh, Barkley. Commissioner Dreyes. Here. Commissioner Searle. Commissioner Searle. Here. Here. Commissioner Shaw. Shaw. Yes. yes. Commissioner Sposato. Commissioner Tunney. Commissioner Viega. Here. Here. And Commissioner Here. Here. Great. All right, fantastic. Before we get into this month's regular business, I would, you'd probably notice the name you hadn't heard before. Um, I would like to take a moment to welcome Lester Barkley as an ex officio member of the Chicago Plan Commission and congratulate him as on his appointment as chair of the CTA board. Uh, welcome, Mr. Barkley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will now approve the minutes from the July, June 17, 2021 regularly scheduled Plan Commission meeting. The minutes were distributed prior to today's meeting. Do I have a motion for approval? Move by Biagi. Commissioner Shaw. Moved by Commissioner Shaw, seconded by? Biagi. I'm sorry, who is, it? who is the second on that? 
Commissioner Biaggi. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. Sure. I'm going to uh, go through it. We have to do roll call. I'm going to go through this quickly. Commissioner Biaggi? Yes. Rumfeld? Yes. Uh, Burnett? Portal Visa, yes. Cox, not here. Flores? Yes. Uh, Garza? Yes. Grossman? Yes. Hell, let's see. Lyons? Yes. Uh, Moore? Yes. Uh, Murphy? Yes. Barkley? You are All right. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Uh, yes. Tony Villegas? Yes. 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 Great, thank you uh, very much. Motion passes. So prior to commencing the public testimony and regular business listed on the agenda, we have two cases for which the applicants are seeking a deferral to a date certain of August 19th, 2021. The first item is listed as D9 on the proposed agenda, a proposed amendment to plan development number four submitted by Glenstar O'Hare LLC for the property generally located at 8535 West Higgins Road. The site is currently zoned Plan Development 44, and the applicant seeks to change the designation to Plan Development 44 as amended. The amendment would allow the applicant to divide subarea B into three subareas. Subarea B1, which will include a 90-foot tall seven-story building with 297 dwelling units and 270 required accessory vehicular parking spaces. Sub areas B2 and B3 will retain previously approved development rights for future office development with the maximum height of 190 feet and 1,230 required accessory vehicular uh, parking spaces. No changes, no changes are proposed to sub area A. This is in the 41st ward. I'm sorry, if I was speaking quickly to get us through what's gonna be a very long agenda and I need to slow down for, or maybe I don't, because I know she's such a pro for our, um, our court reporter, our clerk uh, reporter. So can I get a motion to defer this item to a date certain of the August 19th, 2021 plan commission? Uh, Moved by Commissioner motion. Shaw. Seconded by Garrison. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me do the deferral here. Uh, Commissioner Biagi. Sorry, yes. Um, Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Um, Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Grossman. Yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Barkley. Yes. Commissioner Dreyas. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Uh, yes. Commissioner Diegas. And Commissioner Yes. Okay, great. Madam Chair, if you can uh, just note that Commissioner Cox is here and I vote yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and we're getting an uh, echo on your um, on your speaking. So my, I don't know if you have the live stream on or two devices, but I just wanted to alert you to that. Uh, motion passes. The second deferral item is listed as D1 on the posted agenda, a proposed residential business plan development submitted by FRC Realty Incorporated for the property generally located at 1017-1039 North LaSalle Street and 125 West Maple Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from RM-5 residential multi-unit district to DX-7, downtown mixed-use district, and then to a residential business plan development. The applicant proposes to construct a 39-story, 418-foot tall building with 303 residential units, 3,698 of which are, uh, are ground floor commercial space, and 124 parking spaces with accessory and incidental uses on the property located at 125 West Maple Street, sub area B. The property located at 1017 North LaSalle Street, sub area A, will continue to be improved with the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Cathedral. The existing six unit apartment building and coach house at 1015 North LaSalle Street, sub area A will remain. 
bonus FAR of 1.50 for subarea A and bonus FAR of 4.5 for subarea B will be taken and the overall FAR of the plan development will be 9.5. This is in the second ward. Can I get a motion for this item to a date certain of the August 19, 2021 plan commission? Moved by Commissioner Shaw. Second by Commissioner Searle. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, roll call, uh, Commissioner Biagi? Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld? Yes. Commissioner Burnett? Yes. Commissioner Cordova? I'm sorry, I was like waiting for her to answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Commissioner, a uh, note for the record that Commissioner Cox also has joined the meeting. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Flores? Yes. Commissioner Gazza? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Grossman? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Mr. Searle? Yes. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Viegas? Yes. And Vegas. Yes. Great. Thank Madam you. Chair, Commissioner Navarro is here too, and I'm a yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Commissioner Nevada, for the record, is here, and she is a yes in that referral. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Commissioners, we will now take public testimony for the items remaining on the agenda today. I will also remind the speakers that items D1 and D9 have just been voted to be deferred until August 19th, 2021. And as such, in light of the lengthy agenda today, you may choose to still speak today or are instead welcome to sign up ahead of the following month's meeting. Uh, we do have a large group of people that are signed in to speak. Uh, those people include, um, some have parties that they aren't gonna speak. Some of those have included um, on Maple Street, uh, Gina Corcolis, Joe Dusek, Julie Mueller, Kelly Gosler, Michelle Frenzel, Net Noel Torres, Peter Sakaris, uh, Rigoberto Mendoza, Tamra Hanna. Uh, again, that item has been deferred, but you're welcome to speak if you want to, or instead you may come back and then sign up to speak next month. Next speaker will be Butler Adams on item D6. Uh, next speaker again is Butler Adams on item D7. Again, next speaker, Butler Adams on D11. Then two speakers for item D12, Butler Adams followed by Deborah Carabin. The last set of speakers would like to speak about item D13, Charlie Isaacs, Dr. Mariana Lalonde, Dietry Reddy, Mark Kaplan, Melanie Etner, Sarah Jacobson, Ana Guevara, Kathy Powers, Paul Siegel, Michael Rohrbeck, and State Senator Mike Sims. Simmons, excuse me. That concludes the list of those who completed speaker forms. Um, we will now then I go to public testimony. Let me first call then on uh, Gina Corpolis. Hey everyone, uh, Gina Corpolis is not here. Okay, how about Joe Dusick? Uh, not here. Julie Mueller? Uh, no, not here. Kelly, Kelly Gosler? Uh, not here. Michael, Michelle Frenzel? Not here. Uh, Noel Torres? Not here. Peter Sakaras? Not here. Uh, Rigoberto Mendoza? Uh, not here. And Tamara Hanna? I'm not here either. Okay, I, I assume we'll hear from them next month. Okay, next speaker, Butler Adam, item D6. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, good morning, commissioners. My name is Butler Adams for the uh, record. Um, on 215, I'm sorry, on 1215 West Fulton, I do love this project. I love the height and the X-brace design. It's uh, very refreshing to see more bolder proposals uh, popping up in the West Loop area. And personally, I wish the entire downtown area would have uh, more bold proposals. Um, I, I am slightly disappointed on how the tower meets the base in this particular project. It seems uh, more plopped on and less integrated than it should be. 
Um, I would like to see the X brace in this design actually brought down to the ground, which will give a sense of a kind of visual stability for the building itself. And I do really think it's time for us to start looking at revising the West Loop guidelines. It seems like things are kind of getting played out and played out and played out over and over and over, over again in the West Loop area because of these guidelines. It would be nice to see a little bit of an update so that you don't have the entire Fultonization of the entire area. Um, from looking at the designs right now in terms of how the design has changed uh, over the months, um, I do like how the base is in one of this, uh, on the west side of this project, I should say, along uh, Fulton. But I'm wondering about this low rise portion along Fulton itself. Why does it even need to be there? It seems like the units in this low rise portion, I guess it's about five stories along Fulton. Why is it not being in integrated into the tower itself and just raise the height of the tower? and allow this space along Fulton to be a uh, green space. The neighbors always complain about there not being enough green space in the area with all the new development. And it seems like uh, with this site being slightly larger, that uh, one portion of the base can just be uh, gotten rid of, just bumped out of the tower up by another five floors and have the northern portion of this uh, property green space. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, but when neighbors constantly complain about there being a lack of green space, this would seem to be kind of a solution of incorporating green space. But again, for this particular proposal, um, I am in support of it and I hope that you are too. It's very, very nice. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Oh, let me note for the record that Commissioner Tunney has joined us. Um, and uh, go ahead, Mr. Bill, you're, you're on for the next item as well. Okay, I believe this one is for uh, item 7917 West Fulton Market. Again, for the record, my name is Butler Adams. This is kind of an interesting and unique design as well. Uh, I like, again, the numerous iterations that are shown in the presentation. I think that there are nine of them. The last three are very, very nice uh, from March 26 forward. Um, I wonder if there's a way for the architects to introduce uh, the step down edge at the Lake and Peoria corner, uh, like they did for the uh, northwest corner, it would seem to uh, bring a little bit more uh, symmetry to the west facade of the structure itself. Um, let's see. Oh, personally, I do like the visual depth of the terrace step down from the March 26 version of the proposal. Um, it's much more visually prominent than the current design and helps draw the eye both up and down that particular corner. So if that same kind of a uh, step down corner is introduced to the other part of the building, I think would have the same effect. And it's very awesome. Um, I'll say this again, I would like the city planners and the aldermen and commissioners to look at, again, retweaking the West Loop guidelines. We're kind of seeing the same thing over and over again. I do like the brickwork on this proposal. Um, recently, the Fulton Market Innovation District was updated. The West Loop guidelines were not. So again, I think it's time to, again, take a second look, look at the West Loop guidelines and uh, kind of update those. I think this is another nice proposal from uh, Morris Atomy Architects um, out of New York. This is the same architect the Related Midwest uh, chose for their roughly 51-story tall project a block to the south. And for me, it would be very cool to see both of these buildings built at the same time. But again, thank you for your time. I am in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adams. And you're on for item D11 as well. Okie dokie again for the, for the record. My name is Butler Adams. Uh, D11, I believe is 150 East Ontario. I am not at all a fan of this proposal. I think we have a design straight of the postmodern 1990s and it doesn't even do a very good job of that in my visual opinion. Um, I think it's a very regressive design for 2021 architectural standards. And one of the only redeeming qualities of the project is that it is a mid-block mid project, so it's not very vis visible. So a lot of people won't be seeing this. I'm slightly surprised that the alderman doesn't have a problem with this, with this project, this hotel. Uh, he's kind of dumbed down several other ho hotel proposals in uh, the 42nd Ward, including the hotel proposal at the Spire site. There was one proposed in Lakeshore East, and there was recently, recently a news proposed there was going to be a hotel in the uh, 601 West Monroe project, which has great circulation. So the fact that this building, 150 East Ontario, is within you know, 500 feet of like five other hotels in Ontario can get kind of backed up in that time of day. I'm surprised he didn't object to this one as well, but uh, apparently he has not. But again, um, 
I'm not at all in favor of this project at all. I'm not yes or no in terms of whether it should be approved, but architecturally, when you all come to it, I think you'll understand as to why I hold the position that I do. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Adams. And now uh, to I two people on item D12. Go ahead, Mr. Adams, you're first. Um, I don't really have that much to say about this one. I haven't followed it as closely as I, sh as I should. Um, I think this is the one near the New York residence and that particular project building has 600 units. This has about half. So I know there were some people in the area complaining about the height and density as they always do, but the only way you're going to get more affordable housing in the city is if you add density. And uh, that's one thing that's needed is more affordable housing and that's how you get it. In terms of the de design of this project itself, it's kind of schizophrenic architecturally, the way the balconies are kind of, you know, every which way, but I mean, whatever. That's about all I have for this one. It's just- Thank you. Yeah, appreciate, thank you very much. Appreciate the time you take to speak with us. Uh, Deborah Carabin. Wouldn't you unmute yourself, Ms. Carabin? One second, Jerome, uh, this one. I've unmuted. Okay, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm a resident um, at 3600 North Lakeshore, and this building um, that's proposed and going in is directly to the north of me. So I'm just uh, looking at, in light of the condo collapse in Miami, I wanted to call out to all of the engineering and architectural pros uh, to see oh, what they're doing differently or are they safeguarding us? So nothing like that would happen uh, to our building, which I believe was built in the late 50s. I know things happen underground. Um, just checking with that and wanted to see, uh, ask the ex experts if the foundation of our building uh, will be impacted in any way by the construction of this property. That's it in a nutshell. Sorry. So no, I no, no, the, no, no reason to apologize. That's that those are really interesting questions. Let me find a way later on to um for us to propose those questions since this, is, this isn't a QA session here, but um, I that is something for the plan the planning department or for the commission to at least discuss and see where we are on that. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, last set of speakers would like to speak about item D13. Let me begin with Charlie Isaacs, Mr. Isaacs. My name is Charlie Isaacs. Uh, I'm a tenant rights lawyer at Uptown People's Law Center and a tenant myself in Uptown. UPLC objects to the proposed luxury development at 4600 North Marine Drive. I will give two reasons why, health and housing. First, the plan commission should deny this proposal in the interest of community health. The proposed site is a hospital parking lot surrounded by two census tracts that are majority non-white and majority low-income households. But it's not just a parking lot. It's also the site of an emergency makeshift COVID-19 clinical facility so that locals can receive COVID testing and other services with ease. The advancement of this proposal therefore raises a legal liability problem under the Illinois Health Facilities Planning Act a law that requires state approval of any modification of a health facility. We need to ensure we don't harm the public's access to care, especially while the pandemic lunges forward and news of new variants loom large. The question for you is simple. Why jeopardize an emergency health facility just to create more luxury housing? Why grant rushed approval before we even know if the plan has a permit? From a health equity and legal liability standpoint, we shouldn't even be talking about this right now. The plan commission needs to punt consideration of this proposal for another day. Second, the plan commission should deny this proposal in the interest of housing security. Uptown is undergoing major changes, shifting from a place of diversity to a place of unchecked density. In the area surrounding the proposed site, more than 2,000 new residential units have been or are being built, most of them high end. We are seeing an 18% decrease in households making under $50,000 per year, replaced at a similar rate by those making over $100,000 per year. These changes coincide with a 20% drop in Uptown's Black population, a 35% drop in its Asian population, a 45% drop in its Hispanic population, and a 12% increase in its white population. These stats will continue in their directions 
especially now because the eviction moratorium is about to end. Impacted families who lose their homes will need to find a new place to live. Rather than waiting for federal funds to arrive for affordable housing construction, we're cordoning off a precious piece of lakes, lakefront real estate for high-end housing. This neighborhood desperately needs more affordable units. Too often my clients face unacceptable housing conditions, but the landlord won't do anything because they know the tenant will never move out. Giving tenants options is a key way to boost not only the quantity, but also the quality of affordable housing. The situation couldn't be simpler. Our community lies in your hands. The plan commission usually approves proposals unanimously. We ask you not to do that today. Please postpone consideration of this proposal or deny this luxury proposal so that we can more strategically deploy this land to support the welfare of our diverse lakefront community and reflect the interests of our most impacted residents. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Isaacs. Uh, Dr. Mariana Lalonde. And you will correct my pronunciation. Hi, my name is Dr. Marianne Lalonde and I am the president of the Lakeside Area Neighbors Association, the block club that contains the proposed development at 4600 North Marine Drive. In my written testimony, I described how as a community organization, we were left out of the input process. No changes were made to the developer's plans based on our feedback. I also outlined how the proposed amendment can negatively impact investments small homeowners have made in our neighborhood, specifically at 811 West Eastwood, how it will further contribute to the depletion of OSI funded interior green space in the 46th Ward, and the importance of preserving land on the north side zone for workforce jobs as opposed to residential developments which is in line with ensuring the prevention of the transition of manufacturing to the South side. But in the next two minutes, I would like to speak not as a Black Club president, but as a scientist and energy efficiency professional. The LPO, while an older ordinance, is the protection we have in place to prevent zoning decisions from exacerbating the negative impacts of climate catastrophe. Lincoln Properties has yet to conduct an environmental impact study despite the proposed development being located on the historic Wilson Beach and former Lake Red. The population of the area are around this development will double in the next few years due to the approval or current construction of additional 2,200 units of housing. While we welcome additional density and population in our area, we must recognize the dangers of an overcrowded neighborhood. While vital services like electric, gas heating and communications have taken steps towards reliability, which is maintaining delivery when there's routine uncertainty and operating conditions, climate related events are often unpredictable. Our combined sewer overflow system creates the potential for dangerous water surges, which are not only destructive to rare beach habitats and cause flooding under viaducts, but they compromise the resilience of our utility delivery system, the ability to prepare for and recover quickly from unplanned disruptions. Due to the proximity of, to the lake for this development and the rapid increase in population in our area, this creates a dangerous situation for responding resiliently to climate events. Climate change increases financial as well as physical risk. Sharp increases or declines in energy demand can compromise utility earnings and create cash flow volatility, possibly resulting in price fluctuations that ultimately impact customers. The consequences of climate related events will affect every aspect of the electric power system from generation, transmission and distribution to end user demand. In this case, the developer has submitted subpar plans and in some cases, no plans at all in regard to environmental resilience. And for this reason, I urge the plan commission to delay or dismiss this proposal. Thank you very much. Gayatri Reddy. Thank you, my name is Gayatri Reddy. I'm an immigrant to this country as well as a professor whose work focuses on migration and displacement in Uptown. I strongly oppose the proposed development at 4600 North Marine Drive for several reasons, three of which I will mention here. One, what is needed in the neighborhood is more affordable housing. We have already lost several thousand units of affordable housing in Uptown in the last decade, thanks to the closure of SROs, the conversion of public spaces like schools and synagogues to luxury condos, all while homelessness is increasing, not decreasing in Uptown. The current developer, Lincoln Properties, in lieu contribution <clears throat> to Sarah Circle is entirely insufficient as a replacement using a legal loophole in the ARO that as critics have pointed out, ultimately adds to the affordability crisis in Chicago. If in fact the 46th Ward has quote, shown other wards that affordable housing is an asset in making a strong community as Alderman Kapelman stated, 
That is an argument against and not for building one more luxury condo building, especially on the grounds of a lake adjacent community hospital lot. Two, for at least the last 75 years, Uptown has been a diverse neighborhood. With these luxury developments, the racial, racial and ethnic dem demographic of the neighborhood is rapidly changing with a 12% increase in the wealthier white population and a significant decrease in all other ethnic or racial communities over the last 20 years. We must ask therefore, who is this development for? I implore this commission, please don't allow Lincoln Property Company, which has a proven record of racial discrimination elsewhere to become a vehicle for such tactics and racial transformations in Uptown. Three, the process by which the vote occurred in the 46th Ward Zoning and Development Committee reeks of a democratic deficit. The representation of the Zoning Committee is not reflective of the diversity of the ward. Additionally, the process was flawed and was not reflective of an ideal master PD process which this site warrants. Finally, why was the North Halstead Business Association in Lakeview allowed to change its vote after the official vote was counted while Lakeview Towers, an immediate neighbor of Weiss Hospital that is dedicated to promoting affordability was not allowed to participate in the voting process. In the wake of the COVID pandemic, we need more safety nets for the poor and for disenfranchised communities and not more luxury housing for the rich. Contrary to what the alderman said in his statement, the positive aspects of this proposal do not in fact outweigh the negative repercussions. I respectfully ask the CPC to listen to the people of the ward and please vote not to allow this lakefront community space at Weiss Hospital to be converted into yet more unaffordable condos for the people of Uptown. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mark Kaplan. My name is Mark Kaplan. I'm a board member of Northside Access for Justice and an LSC member at Uplift Community High School. Perhaps more importantly, I have lived and been active in the Uptown community since the early 1970s. We are calling on the Chicago Plan Commission to reject the proposal for the development of 314 units of almost exclusively upper income, smaller unit rental housing at 4600 North Marine Drive. We know that this proposed development, one, is not needed to meet the needs of our community and our residents. Two, will exacerbate and accelerate the current trend of high-end development that has pushed thousands of residents out, families and seniors, because of the loss of affordable housing units and the rapidly rising rents. And three, um, will be another advancement for the policy of white supremacy and racial trans segregation, transforming one of the most diverse and affordable communities in one of the most segregated cities into another area for upper income whites like Lincoln Park. Community and housing patterns do not happen accidentally. They occur as a result of policies and policy decisions that are made by those in power, like you, the Chicago Plan Commission. Uptown did not become diverse and affordable by accident. It became that way because thousands of community residents fought hard, mobilized, protested, built institutions and voted policy for policies that created one of the most racially, ethnically, and economically diverse communities in the city. We have seen the community that we built come under severe attack in the last decade. We have been here before the Plan Commission before, several times. We were here in the 1990s when the Goldblatt's Building Redevelopment Plan was being considered. We urge the Plan Commission to reject that proposal and support a community plan for development. The Plan Commission rejected the community plan and voted yes. We were here about five years ago urging the Plan Commission to reject the proposal for the high income development in Montrose and Clarendon. The Plan Commission rejected the community and voted yes. These two high income developments, close to 500 units, were subsidized by close to $30 million in TIF funds. The residents of these developments are largely white and almost all upper income. While our schools and parks are starving for resources, our tax dollars are being used to support white entitlement and racial segregation. We are calling on you to use your power as the plan commission to reject this proposed development. It is in your power to not allow for the advancement of racial segregation and stand up for real equity in housing and development 
that Chicago sorely needs. Thank you so much. Please vote no on this proposal. Thank you, Mr. Kaplan. Uh, Melanie Eppner. Hello, my name is Melanie Eckner and I live within 250 feet of the PD 37. Uh, I've submitted a written statement and so wanted to just expand on certain points uh, that I brought up there. I'm focusing mostly on the lakefront protection ordinance. Um, I've been studying Uptown's lakefront through a sustainability lens since 2011. Um, and in 2015, I co-founded the Uptown Coastal Initiative with funding from NOAA, the Illinois DNR, and the Illinois Coastal Management Program grant system to raise awareness of and engagement in Uptown as a coastal community. Uh, Uptown has very special history and geography that I, I believe can help inform and guide future decision-making and collective effort around a number of municipal change uh, challenges, particularly along the lakefront. I think one example that everyone will quickly perceive in this light is the large peninsula of land that forms Uptown's lakefront system. Um, it extends from Clarendon to the lake and from Montrose to Foster. Um, this land was engineered as part of a PWA WPA project in the 1930s, um, and it affords today um, uh, many health and ecological benefits, which attracts both wildlife and people. It's really a regional destination. Um, I'd like to focus on one aspect of the local geography and history that I only touched on in my written statement, which is that there is a constellation of historic structures that encircles the current development site under consideration today. Each of the built structures in the constellation have been determined eligible for national register listing. And I'd be happy to provide more information about that, but I wanna focus on just a few of those assets. One is Lakeview Towers, uh, which there are historic high rises that sit kitty corner from the development site to the Southwest. And it's a model mixed income co-op that permits those who have less money to benefit from our healthful, walkable lakefront neighborhood on equal footing with those who have more money and therefore more housing choices. Uh, by providing housing stability, um, Lakefront Towers has enabled families, for example, where parents grew up shuttling between Cabrini Green and Robert Taylor Homes uh, to break the so-called cycle of poverty. Um, and I thought it was really great that one of the other commenters uh, in their written testimony mentioned a study from U of I's Human Health and Landscape Lab that found that girls make better decisions if they have views onto green. Because I think such views have been a factor in the success of the story of Lakeview Towers. Um, another bill is going to be affected is the lakefront pumping station, which hasn't been mentioned yet. It's directly across from the uh, current development site. Um, and there are important aspects uh, at that site that are uh, wise to consider in looking at this particular development. I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Sarah Jacobson. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Sarah Jacobson is not here. Uh, Ana Guevara. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ana Guevara. I am a university professor and a researcher of Uptown's history, an immigrant and a North Side resident. I strongly oppose the rezoning of 4600 North Marine Drive for two reasons, diversity and community. Uptown has been a portal for immigrants, many of whom have been displaced due to structural violence, that disproportionately affects the poor and communities of color. Whether it be policies leading to deindustrialization, race restrictive covenants, the prison industrial complex, or urban development projects that privilege the wealthy, this structural violence has led to the increased pace of gentrification in Uptown, the disappearance of affordable housing, and the displacement of minoritized communities. In the past 30 years alone, the census tells us that the racial demographic of Uptown reveals the grave whitening of this neighborhood with the white population steadily increasing since the 1990s and to date constitutes over half of the population in Uptown at 54%, while minoritized populations have declined steadily and to date these numbers are at 17.8 Black, 14.6% Latinx, and 10.5% Asian. I also take issue with Alderman Kappelman's point in his written statement where he alludes to so-called valid and reliable research 
that show that building more apartments, including luxury units, will help stabilize or lower area rents. There were no concrete scholarly references on Alderman's letter, so I presume that these are the same studies that I am aware of, studies that make an important caveat, and I quote, if cities concentrate new housing in communities of color, that housing could accelerate demographic change, and this change could in turn be unsettling or alienating for longtime residents, end quote. There are also numerous empirical studies that compellingly counter the research that the alderman refers to that tells us that there is indeed a disproportionate impact of gentrification on minoritized communities, that there is a direct correlation between gentrification and displacement of minoritized communities, and between creating luxury apartments and the decline in affordable housing. Lastly, the same set of studies that the alderman may be citing also explain, and I quote, development can be further problematic if it comes in spite of community resistance to it. And the uptown community does not want rezoning of 4600. The community is saying that this development will create a community that no longer reflects the multiracial and working class history of uptown. Supporting this development will not revitalize or create community. A community is one where the people who are at the forefront of fighting for affordable housing are heard. They are calling for building a community that is sustainable, equitable, and one that can provide working class and poor people a livelihood where they can survive and thrive. I hope you will listen to them and be inspired by them. You, you know, don't cut them off. I'll, I'll ease them out. She was wrapping up. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Kathy. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I hope you will listen to these voices and be inspired by them. You as the commission have the power to render a decision that will uplift their voices and in turn our communities. I respectfully you. urge you to reject this proposal. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Cordova for letting me finish my sentence. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Kathy Powers. Ms. Powers, you have to unmute yourself. Let me come back to her. Um, is Paul Siegel ready to go? Unmute yourself. Go ahead, Mr. Siegel. Your, your, the clock is ticking. You're, 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 we could hear you if you speak. Mr. Siegel? Um, hi, Paul Siegel, a uh, resident and activist from Uptown and with a PhD at, from UIC in history with an emphasis on Chicago community history. I'm here in opposition to the proposed development for 4600 North Marine Drive. The 46 Ward Lakefront must be viewed in relationship to the whole Uptown community and the circumstances surrounding this proposal. In particular, the land has been part of Weiss Hospital, which in turn has been part of the Uptown community for some 70 years. Weiss has been purchased by a community with a history of taking over community hospitals and closing them. The placing of unaffordable luxury housing on that land can only encourage the ultimate loss of this needed community resource. Uptown has a history as a racially diverse community in what has been a highly segregated city and as a refuge for people displaced by economic and geopolitical forces within Chicago and elsewhere. This has been and most certainly continues to be a profoundly needed function. Uptown's racially diverse low-income residents have forged a community that has played a unique and positive role in the life of this city, a living history and a cultural phenomenon that is very worthy indeed of preservation. In the last few decades, Uptown's historic role has been greatly undermined by unbridled gentrification. High density, unaffordable housing has been squeezed into virtually every inch of available space where there once was a hospital, a restaurant, a public school, and now directly on the lakefront where there was a hospital uh, parking lot. Thousands of units of low-income housing in Uptown have been lost and not replaced. 
making this racially diverse area more segregated and less affordable. As a consequence of the pandemic, the crisis for many low-income renters has worsened in uptown Chicago and elsewhere. Access to health programs is also a crisis as evidenced by 6,000 racially disparate COVID deaths in this city. Given these interrelated crises, to continue the binge of unaffordable gentrification on steroids in Uptown, to fail to promote development that will preserve Uptown's multiracial character as a refuge for the displaced is the height of irresponsibility. It will be profitable for some developers, but will add nothing positive to the life of the community, to the preservation of the lakefront as a place accessible to people of all races and incomes, or to the preservation of badly needed health services. Uh, finally, um, it is obvious that this development will add to congestion and crowding and will add nothing to the natural beauty of the lakefront. Surely, commissioners, we can do better than this in thinking about the lakefront and its place in Chicago. Thank you, and please reject this terrible proposal. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Uh, Ms. Powers, are you ready? Kathy Powers? Go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Uh, she dropped off, uh, Chairman. She was here. I don't see her now. Okay, she maybe she'll come back. Uh, let's let's look for her in case she comes back before we're done. Um, Michael Ro Rohrbeck. Rohrbeck. Hello, I'm Mike Rohrbeck of Voice of the People in Uptown. We are a community-based, resident-controlled, affordable housing and collaborative service organization. We've been around for more than fifty years helping to create affordable housing opportunities and supporting others in preserving and developing affordable housing, including uh, a pivotal role we played in preserving affordable housing at Lakeview Towers, right next to this project where hundreds of families oppose this deal. Um, I will summarize my written testimony. We are all adults here and can speak plainly. This development company promoting this project lies to municipalities and values investment over healthcare. Sweeteners have been added from cosmetic to whatever, uh, including some infusion of money to the hospital, which the community supports capital improvements and better services at the hospital. But this company is not to be trusted long-term. Also built in as a transfer of $3 million to a proposed development by Sarah Circle, a project that the community will support. Um, but the argument that it would not happen but for this transfer of money is a fallacious one, like it is on so many other kind of tip and other kind of deals. Um, but there, the city will be in a position to support worthy and uh, uh, reputable projects going forward with extra COVID housing funds to be in the pipeline. If this development happens, the affordable units on site will really not be affordable as they'll rent to the people on the upper end of the 60% AMI threshold. Um, there will be overt and covert discrimination like with many high-end housing developers in that they will not affirmatively market to persons with rent subsidies. The project simply will accelerate gentrification and is environmentally insane. It's on our treasured lakefront, uh, a place that you are charged to protect. It's gonna add density where we don't want it. And finally, if we just think logically about the Weiss complex as a potential jewel for our community, for healthcare, services, education, and jobs. What does taking away this land do to that potential? You know the answer. Uh, homeowners, not-for-profits, service organizations, and affordable housing residents are all coming together in opposition to this. We want you to just say no. Thank you very much. State Senator Mike Simmons. Chairwoman Kathy Powers is also. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, State Senator, welcome. 
Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I am uh, State Senator Mike Simmons for the 7th District, which uh, covers this neighborhood. Uh, I've submitted a written statement uh, for the committee to review. Um, I also uh, have uh, I wanted to let you know that State Senator Sarah Feigenholz, who is adjacent to me and overlaps with this uh, development site, has also submitted a letter. She had a family commitment today and was not able to come, but we both are in opposition to this development. Um, I just want to elaborate a little bit on some of the points that are in my written statement. Um, I've got an unusual perspective in this as the first openly uh, first openly gay, but also first uh, African-American and half Ethiopian state senator from this area. Uh, my dad actually came to Uptown as an immigrant 25 years ago. So this really is a point of entry and I've got a direct perspective on the value of Uptown to people from all over the world. And we, I would really be interested in this neighborhood remaining a port of entry for, for those people. As, as folks have said earlier, um, we've seen a double digit decrease in the people of color that can call this area home and a double digit increase of, of, of affluent white residents of the area just in the last 10 years. That has coincided with rapidly rising rents. I myself, five years ago, experienced uh, being priced out of an apartment where the rent suddenly went up $200 and we were within a block of another luxury development. So this is something that is happening uh, very, very uh, rapidly in the neighborhood right now. Uh, the, other, the other issue that uh, we're seeing with that um, is that when those rents are going up, uh, people are not able to stay in the neighborhood. And so, you know, the argument has been made that the reason we're seeing the gentrification in, in Uptown is because people want to be here. This is a destination. I would actually argue that the, the residents that we've seen moved into the area are interested in luxury housing. They're not necessarily coming to Uptown because they'll live in any apartment. So the argument that uh, you know, residents that are affluent that are moving here are going to move into naturally occurring affordable housing, I think is false. They're coming here because they want to move into luxury buildings that have the rooftop gardens, that have the security, that have the swimming pools and all those other amenities. And I would argue that Uptown is, is oversaturated with that type of housing at this point. And I know that from direct experience as a resident, and I know that certainly as a state senator that has a broader, broader perspective. And so I would, I would ask the committee at this time to uh, oppose this development. I think that we are uh, at, a, at a tipping point here uh, with displacement. And as, as folks said earlier, this is the last part of Uptown, this immediate neighborhood that is still very diverse, where we have uh, census tracts that are more than 50% people of color and low income and, and immigrant. And so we, we, we value that. It's a really segregated city. This is the last part of Chicago where everyone can call this home. And this luxury development, I think, will just, will just end that um, and we'll become a, a, a will signal to developers that they can build more and more luxury housing here. So I thank you for listening to me today, um, and I and I, I thank you for considering my opposition. Thank you very much, boy. Right, right on. Um, let's go now to Kathy Powers. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Ms. Powers. Finally. <laughs> I, I'm Kathleen Powers, she, her, hers. I identify as a severely mentally ill person in the community and a physically disabled person. I am so concerned about the uh, welfare of the resource of the White Hospital. I, 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 I just see a diminishment of, of the, the hospital services. In fact, I, I kind of, I'm concerned that after, if a structure like this goes up, the, the traffic will go up. The uh, uh, transportation to the hospital will be diminished. If there are any lakefront uh, uh, emergencies that go on with the added traffic, how well, how well will whites be able to serve? Now, I, I get my services in Edgewater, and if we have mental health crises in Edgewater, in Uptown, in Lakeview, we, we go to Weiss Hospital. We call 911 and we go to Weiss Hospital. What's going to happen when the hospital goes? Because it's going to go. The writing is on the wall. Uh, Lincoln property, uh, people have already spoken about Lincoln property who are trying to buy the hospital and want it rezoned. Uh, pipeline, pipeline uh, LLC, healthcare, 
LLC is, is, has a very bad track record. They closed the hospital in Melrose Park. They, did not, they uh, uh, didn't do what the judge told them to do. And they, they closed the hospital anyway, and they had to pay a fine uh, in contempt of court. The city of Melrose Park sued them. They settled for $1.5 million. So Melrose Park got $1.5 million and they don't have a hospital. This is, this is the writing on the wall. I'm concerned. I'm also concerned about the representation on slide seven uh, uh, that misrepresents the character of Marine Drive. There's a view from Marine Drive looking west and it makes it a appear that the proposed building is in line with Lakeview Towers. This is not the case. South of, south of the, the proposed building is open public land. And uh, the, the, I oppose this, and I hope you oppose it too. I don't know where we'll go to get mental health services if uh, Weiss is compromised. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Powers. Next on the agenda, Oh, let, let me also remind commissioners, uh, there was a couple of references to letters that have been submitted. Um, there were a whole slew of letters that were submitted and some of which that uh, uh, were provided to us um, uh, even as um, latest last night and this morning, they came directly to us. So I ask all the commissioners to, to be sure to look at those um, letters that came in. Next on the agenda are matters submitted in, and we thank, by the way, all the people who took the time to come and share their thoughts with us and express their, their concerns and opinions on this, these matters. Next on the agenda are matters submitted in accordance with the Interagency Planning Referral Act. Do I have a motion to approve item number one under the disposition heading? So moved. Um, thank you. Moved by Commissioner Lyons. Uh, seconded by Commissioner Moore. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova's a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flotis. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Grossman. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Novata? Yes. Commissioner Barkley? We lost him already. Um, Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. yes. Commissioner Shaw? Uh, Commissioner Shani? Yes. yes. Commissioner Vegas? And Commissioner Wagner. Yes. All right, thank you, Commissioners. Now we will move on to the public hearing presentation portion for matters submitted in accordance with the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance and or the Chicago uh, Zoning Ordinance. <clears throat> As a reminder, D1 was deferred. So first item on our agenda is D2, a proposed business plan development submitted by Regal Mile Ventures, LLC, for the property generally located at 1431-1525 East 77th Street, 7700-7716 and 7734-7744 South Blackstone Avenue, 7731-7741 South Chicago Avenue, 7701-7745 South Blackstone Avenue, 7000-7778 South Harper Avenue, 7707-7741 South Harper Avenue, 7706 77 through 7740 South Stony Island Avenue. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from a C2-2, which is motor vehicle related commercial district, uh, M1-2 limited manufacturing business park district and RS-3 residential single unit district to a C2-2 motor vehicle related commercial district, then to a business plan development. The applicant proposes to construct a film studio and supporting offices, which will include communication service establishment, office, parking, accessory uses, and other permitted uses in the C2-2 district 
and incidental uses. The proposed FAR of the project would be approximately 0 0.70 with an overall maximum floor area ratio allowed in the PD of 2.2. This is in the fifth ward. Lisa Washington will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Good morning, Chairman and members of the commission. Again, for the record, my name is Lisa Washington. Um, I, this is a proposed uh, final business plan development. The applicant's name is Regal Mile Ventures, LLC. So this is located within the South Shore uh, community. Uh, the Regal Mile Studio proposed site is bounded on the Northwest, Southeast thoroughfare of South Chicago Avenue on the West, South Stony Island Avenue on the East and 77th Street on the North. Uh, according to CMAPS 2020 uh, community data snapshot and a data ranging from 2015 actually to 2019, um, the population of South Shore is approximately 50,000 people uh, with the predominantly um, African-American non-Hispanic residents, which is approximately 95% of the population. So in one of the most prominent buildings in the vicinity of the Regal Studio site is the Regal Avalon Theater, also known as the New Regal Theater, although not currently in an active institutional use due to the current state of the building structures. There are also several other buildings listed let me step back. So the Regal Mile, the Regal Theater is a landmark building inside and out. Um, there are also other several other buildings listed on the 1995 Chicago Historical Resource Survey. Um, they're located along South Chicago Avenue and Stony Island Avenue. There are several retailers, um, smaller businesses, as well as several religious institutions are located in some of the storefronts fronts, mainly on 75th and 79th Street. It should also be designated, noted, um, that there is an Illinois Enterprise Zone along 79th Street. Here are some photos of the surrounding uh, properties near the proposed site. This is the Regal Theater in the upper left-hand corner, which is along 79th Street. Um, Dr. John Connors Fellowship Hall, which is between Stony Island and South Chicago Avenue. Um, the next top right photo shows the intersection. This is a very inter um, interesting intersection on the south side of Chicago in that it is bisected by three streets, South Chicago Avenue, 79th Street and Stony Island Avenue. Um, and there's other pictures showing for example, Jackson Park Medical Center, which is to the north of the site and other institutional uses. The site for the Regal Studio is currently comprised of vacant land within a triangular shaped block. Um, there is a foundry to the west, a construction company to the east and a fast food establishment to the southeast. Large parcels of land along South Chicago are also vacant. Scattered along the corridor are a combination of commercial business and light industrial establishments. Many existing structures are vacant. Um, there are residential uh, neighborhoods located both to the east and north of the proposed site, consisting mostly of single and two family homes. Um, there are some denser apartments. South Shore is majority towards the east of the community area, multi-units. Um, there are several public uh, schools that are located within the neighborhood, small religious institutions, et cetera. So as stated earlier, um, there are residential manufacturing and commercial zone lots um, at the intersection or at in this, this site. Um, Stony Island, for example, is mostly commercially zoned corridor with some planned development along um, just north of the Regal site. A low density residential neighborhood comprised of single family homes and scattered vacant lots is located just north of the proposed site. Uh, the studio buildings overall uh, 
conversation about this is that it contains, uh, studio buildings are contained to the interior of the proposed site, leaving a 50 feet perimeter setback uh, region where the maximum building height will be about 28 feet or two stories. The triangular site along 77th Street is retained as parking so not to block light from the residential buildings um, across the street. This is showing uh, views along South Chicago, looking southeast. Um, and this is a view on the upper right-hand corner of Stony Island, looking south, um, the east border of the site. Uh, below are some of the uses that surrounds the site, three being the Windy City Auto at 77th Street, houses on the northern side, side of 77th Street uh, across from the proposed site and vacant uh, a white eye. Here are some other pictures showing, this is actually top left, is looking uh, towards the Regal Theater from the fast food site at the triangle tip of the proposed site. Uh, this is looking along South Chicago, looking northwest from the site. The area below is looking north towards the site, and this is a view of Stony Island Avenue looking north. Just some couple of renderings. Um, this is the elevation looking northeast towards the main entry plaza and lobby. Uh, this is southwest um, along 77th Street. This would be and this would be the rendering looking west from Stony Island Avenue, which will be across from the residential units. I think it's important to state that um, we recently planned commission approved the South Shore Corridor study and the proposed site is just north of the, um, one of the highlighted corridors mentioned in the proposed, mentioned in the corridor study. It's important to also state that this is an important um, part of this intersection as it is the gateway to the Invest Southwest uh, 79th Street Corridor. Also the 71st and Stony Island Tax Increment Finance District Future Land Use uh, proposes site to be commercial. I will now turn this over to Richard Clowder, legal representation of the Regal uh, team Thank you, Lisa. Um, Ms. Washington. Um, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the commission. My name is Rich Clowder. I am with the law firm of DLA Piper and along with my colleagues, Paul Shadle and Mariah DeGrino, have had the pleasure of representing uh, the applicant in this matter, Regal Mile Ventures, LLC. With me today are Derek Dudley and Robin Mackay, representatives of the developer, Tim Vock of Bauer Latoza, who's the project architect, J.D. Rossman of Site Design Group, the Landscape Architect, and Chris Hutchinson of Terra, the Traffic Consultant. As uh, Ms. Washington noted, uh, the proposal is to rezone the property from a combination of C22, M12, and RS3 to a unified C22 before establishing a planned development at this site. The site is approximately seven acres, uh, is across multiple adjacent parcels, including parcels which are owned by the city. Um, as Commissioner Cox would uh, note, uh, because he was present on Tuesday, the Community Development Commission recommended approval of the land sale at its meeting on Tuesday, July 13th. Uh, as we'll see in a minute, the city-owned property is located at the northwest portion of the site. Um, the site is currently vacant. A large portion of the site is a former Kmart store, and many of you may remember that it was a Zare store before that. Our proposal is to develop the site with a world-class film production studio, including supporting office space and 95 on-site accessory parking spaces. As you'll see on this on, on the slide before you, the applicant has participated in a very robust community process led by Alderman Harrison's office, as well as Alderman Harris's office. Alderman Harris's ward in, uh, includes property which is intended to be redeveloped uh, in subsequent phases of the project. The project being presented today is the result of extensive community and DPD review. Uh, in response to DPD review, the facade design was selected based on DPD preferences. Additional trees were added throughout the site at the request of DPD's landmark uh, staff, excuse me, landscape staff, and a public plaza was added to the plans. 
We'll now briefly go through the plans and let me turn the presentation over if I could to Tim Vaca from Bauer Latosa. Tim, please take it away. And Lisa, if you would advance to the next slide, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the site, as you see here, is a triangular site that is really composed of three individual areas. The first area is, um, and Ms. Washington, if you can help me by pointing to it, is the main studio parcel that consists of three buildings. And um, that is really the main site that we're gonna talk about today. There's two other smaller parcels. One is the parking lot up in the Northwest corner. And right below that is a smaller parcel that contains a green room. A green room is basically a building that the cast and the crew prep in before they actually do the filming. The main parcel site has a, um, a concept that I want to explain to you where the internal portion of the site is actually an open flex space. It's an internal outdoor yard that provides uh, a staging area for all the equipment that the studios will use, as well as internal access by the staff. It's a highly secured area that the public will not be allowed to enter. Going out from that in, in sort of a circular fashion here, you'll see the three studio buildings that are actually about 20,000 square foot each in size and about 40 feet tall in clear height. They're very large, I would call them black boxes or white boxes that they're the spaces where the, where the, the sets are made and the filming occurs. Going out from that, there is each studio has a building that's a two-story office building that's lower in height that actually faces the street. And it's the face that the public will see, the office buildings, not the taller studio buildings. And this concept grew out of the functionality of the site and the way the, the buildings work, but it was also influenced by putting the, the best face forward to the community. Nobody wants to see a large um, studio box that doesn't have windows, but everyone wants to see a lively building, a lively facade that has color, windows, and that opens up to the neighborhood. So that's really the, the concept of, of our plan. Um, as I mentioned, the site is secured. There is one, if you can advance to the next slide, there is one entry point to the site off of South Chicago Avenue. All vehicles and trucks entering the main portion of the site will drive through that secured gate and gain access to the studios. Also at that point of entry is a small plaza, which could be used for staff. Um, it's in the Southwest corner. Um, if, if you go to the South and point to it, right at the entry off of South Chicago. It's the, oh. yeah, it's, it's really okay. the, the main interface that the public has with the studio. Small events could occur there. It's landscaped, it has artwork, and I can talk about that a little more later. The uh, advancing to the next slide, uh, this is the second floor. The second floor of, of, of all the buildings really is only for the offices. And you can see the office layouts that have been have been diagrammed in that are facing the street. Going to the next slide, the roof plan. All the roofs are flat and the team is strongly committed to uh, providing uh, solar panels, photovoltaic panels on the roof. They will be on the high roof and they will not be seen from the street, but they will contribute to our sustainability goals. There will also be some Mechanical equipment on the roofs. The, uh, the mechanical equipment will be held back from the street facade and, and all the equipment will be screened. Going to the next uh, facade or the next uh, slide here. We have two slides here that show the black and white elevations and I'll skip through these fairly quickly. I just wanna mention that all three facades will be treated with a similar architectural vocabulary. The third uh, slide here uh, on the uh, black and white slide is the section. The section shows 
the height of the two different building typologies. The taller studios have a 40 foot clear height with a maximum height of 52 feet to the parapet. That's the internal building. Facing the street is the office building. It's a two story office building that's much lower with a uh, 30 foot height to the parapet. Next slide. The concept that uh, we have currently proposed for the facades is a, is a very vibrant pattern of, of forms and color that takes its cue from, uh, from street art, from the, uh, the quality of, of a celluloid film strips. And we really want to create a very vibrant, linear, impactful presence in the community on all three facades with this aesthetic. And as you see here, the office building, which is two stories, is really what's our face, it's really our face forward to the community. And behind that are the studio buildings, which are, which are set back 50 to 60 feet. They are precast concrete and they fade in the distance. From the street, you will actually not see the facade of the concrete building quite as dominant as you would here. If you go back to the original renderings you, and look at those, you'll, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, going to the next slide, the materiality of the building. Uh, uh, again, on the street, we're using a, uh, a colored rain screen panel. These are envisioned to be metal panels, perhaps corrugated panels with a uh, a chromatic deep, uh, variation from one end to another. At the entry, this is a, a blow up of the entry plaza, the main entry, you'll see a glass lobby. We intend on using a, a two story glass lobby at the various entry points to the buildings. The plaza would have artwork. We're, we're showing some sculptural elements that provide some security to the plaza as well as potential uh, surfaces on which we can apply uh, digital, you know, some digital interface to, to what's actually happening within, this, within the studio. Behind that could potentially be a green wall at the back of the plaza. And then there would be this tall feature obelisk that would have the studio name. And at the very left-hand side, uh, or the very right-hand side, you would see a gate that goes into the into the campus. The next uh, image here, I'll turn this back over to um, uh, Rich and you can talk about the, uh, the traffic. Um, we're we're going to go really quickly through these slides. This We, we did submit a traffic study. Um, I won't go through it in detail unless there are questions. Lisa, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, here, here's, here's a slide showing circulation and the like with uh, 95 parking spaces located on site uh, away from Stony Island at the intersection of 77th and South Chicago. Next slide, please. Are you able to advance? I've advanced twice. Okay. Okay, th that's fine. We skipped one, but we don't need to. We don't need to include that. Okay. Again, here is here is access to the site for both trucks and cars, uh, marked with the arrows uh, located on the uh, on the schematic here. We can go to the next one, Lisa. Um, this was re this is the CDOT approved site plan. Um, we just noted it for reference. It was updated as of yesterday after extensive review by CDOT, uh, for which we are very grateful. Next slide, please. Um, here's the, here is an executive high level summary of the traffic study it, itself. It indicates that existing streets can easily support additional traffic. I won't read the rest of the slide. Um, Harper, Harper uh, at the northern tip will be vacated. It's indicated that that will have very little impact on surrounding traffic. Next slide, please. Again, here's open space and landscaping. If JD is on the phone, I'd like to turn, or on the Zoom, I'd like to turn it over to him to quickly go through the landscape concepts, which did receive significant uh, review by, by uh, DPD. JD, are you on? Go ahead, please take it away. 
Yes, thank you, Richard. Um, I'll try to make this this short, but as you can see here, this is an overview, um, the entire uh, overall landscape site plan, which shows the streetscape uh, treatments on South Chicago Avenue, Harper Avenue, Blackstone, and East 77. As you can see, we're, we're completely or fully meeting the, the landscape ordinance on those streetscapes, um, you know, heavily treed with uh, a combination of parkway uh, planting, which would be mostly sod. And in addition to that, um, uh, you know, just the, the trees throughout. And then in the Northwest quadrant, you see that parking lot space that uh, Tim mentioned earlier. Um, that is also screened from the streets with your typical landscape setback and trees with, uh, with a shrub hedge uh, behind uh, or in front of an of a ornamental fence. Um, that lot is kept largely open for flex use space. And so we do not currently show uh, internal islands in there, but that is because of the, the, the need for the flexible use uh, for filming activities. And then that's similar to the, the more central outdoor flexible space that uh, is encompassed by the, the three studio buildings that Tim mentioned earlier. Um, we are meeting the, the total tree requirements for that Northwest lot, uh, but due to the, the kind of constraints for that open lot in the middle, um, we, we can't meet quite that amount of trees that are required for the landscape ordinance, but we did make a, an effort to um, get as many as we can. Um, if you go to the next slide, please, will be just a, a, an enlargement of that Northwest parking lot. As you can see here, we're calling out the, the specific tree species and, and giving you some uh, general idea of that landscape setback at that lot. Um, go to the next slide, please. Uh, here is just a, a, a quick um, enlargement of the streetscape along South Chicago Avenue. Again, trees along there um, in sodded uh, parkway with, um, you know, uh, quick access paths in between to break up those, those planters. Uh, next slide, please. And, and this is the, the final enlargement that we have for landscape that just shows the landscape setback along Harper um, to that internal um, entry space for the, 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 um, the filming studio lot. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are just your typical landscape details that we don't need to go over. You can please go forward. Uh, and this is a quick matrix where we uh, highlight you know, the, the areas where we are uh, complying with the, the landscape ordinance. And there are a couple um, uh, points where we are asking for a, a landscape variance. Uh, like I said, in the Northwest lot, we are requesting a variance for uh, the interior landscape islands uh, due to the need of the, the flexibility. And then uh, for the studio outdoor flexible space for the, um, the, the bigger interior space, again, we're asking for a variance on the the interior islands, um, a total of 58 trees are required. We are, we are providing 30 of those around the site um, as best we can. Um, and that is the, the last uh, variant that we're requesting. Um, so that is it for the, the landscape portion. So I'll turn it back to Richard. Thanks. Uh, very quickly to wrap up, the sustainability matrix is in front of you. The project is designed, in fact, to meet the city's sustainable development policy through multiple strategies, adding up to the 100 points. Next slide, please. Um, with respect to stormwater, the project is, uh, includes several stormwater uh, management strategies designed to, designed to relieve pressure on the city system. These include on-site detention and volume control measures. Next slide, please. Um, obviously, MBEWB participation, especially in this neighborhood, is critical. Um, we have established contract participation goals of 26% and 6% respectively with a 50% uh, construction hour to be worked by Chicago residents requirement as well. The applicant is seeking contracting and partnership opportunities at the general contractor level and participation in professional services. The project is anticipated to uh, produce 34 permanent full-time studio jobs and production assignments are anticipated to generate approximately 300 jobs per production. Um, I, before I turn it back over to Ms. Washington to wrap up, I would like to acknowledge Derek Dudley it is his vision that uh, is rendered here before you today. If he could take 30 seconds to just reintroduce himself to this body. Derek is a Southside native, grew up uh, stone's throw from this project, 
um, and uh, his reputation is impeccable and he is uh, intending to uh, bring his vision to this location. So Derek, if the commission could hear from you for 30 seconds, I think that would be great. Don't forget oh, thank to take you, Rich. Off. Yeah, please. Okay. Thank, thank you, Rich. Uh, uh, good morning or good afternoon, um, everyone on this call. Thank you for having us. Thank you for uh, listening to this presentation. Um, uh, I'm just, you know, very excited at the opportunity to uh, bring this project to life. I, as Rich said, I grew up on the South Side. Um, you know, this is. Uh, this has been a dream of mine for, for several years. Um, I, was, I was fortunate many years ago to get into the entertainment business, which afforded me a lot of great opportunities. And, uh, you know, very quickly, I'll just say, uh, you know, I wanted to do something to bring back something to Chicago and in particularly into my community to give back to this community that gave so much to forming me and my success in life. And, uh, you know, I just want the opportunity to pay it forward to so many others that are still in that community. Um, and I think that this project will be, you know, monumental in terms of being able to expand the film and TV business uh, and make Chicago the Hollywood of the Midwest. Uh, but more importantly, I think it'll be a tremendous opportunity for the residents uh, within the community to have a place that they can have some real ownership in, can have some gainful employment, uh, some career opportunities. And I think this project will instill a lot of hope, value and inspiration into the community and hopefully be a beacon of light to not only those in the community, but to, other, to drive other investment uh, 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 into the community um, and also be able to highlight some of the other businesses that already exist in the community, but also drive for other businesses and economic opportunities and growth uh, in and around the community. Um, I don't want to keep everybody, so I just want to say thank you um, and really looking forward to making this project a reality. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Lisa, back to you to wrap up. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the proposal submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposed business plan development would be appropriate um, for several reasons. I don't wanna go through all of them, but basically the project meets the purpose and relevant criteria set forth in chapter 1718 of the zoning ordinance and its adoption would not have any adverse effects, impact on the public's health, safety, um, safety or welfare specifically, um, as listed here below, as well as in the staff report. Um, the project meets the purpose and criteria uh, set in chapter 17, 130609, including that it complies with the standards and guidelines. Um, it's compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of use density and building scale. So based upon the for forthgoing, it is the recommendation of the zoning administrator that the application for the business plan development be approved and that the recommendation to the city council committee on zoning landmarks and building standards be passage recommended. Alderman Harrison, I believe is on the line as well to speak to her support on this project. A couple, couple of things. One is that I just, uh, thank you, Ms. Washington, to correct that it's uh, chapter 17, eight, not 17, 18. Oh, okay, uh, thank you, and, and I this, misspoke. This, and this is also the plan commission, not the city council committee on zoning uh, landmarks and building. So I just wanna correct those that for the record. Um, thank you. Um, this is one of those fantastic projects. I think uh, I'm not seeing hands from commissioners, um, but, I, but I suspect there's a lot of um, excitement um, about this project. And I'm gonna go ahead and go uh, ask the alderman to speak, alderwoman to speak. Um, and then, um, and then if there aren't any additional questions, I'm going to go to a motion. Um, so, uh, Alderwoman, welcome. Uh, love to hear your comments. Thank you very much. Um, you're absolutely right. The community um, is totally excited about this project. Um, we have been trying to 
develop the, these particular parcels for a quarter of a century. So let me just say this, we have been trying to develop these parcels for a quarter of a century. Uh, so we are happy uh, to, to, to see this project. Um, Mr. Dudley uh, presented to uh, the ward meeting, community was excited. Um, it's nice to see something different and new that gives our young people and our young adults uh, the opportunity uh, to have experience and learn in areas that are not traditional. Um, so we wholeheartedly support this plan. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Alderwoman. With no further questions, do I have a motion on the proposed business plan development submitted by Regal Mile Ventures, LLC, for the property generally located? Uh, Commissioner Tunney. So moved by Commissioner Tunney. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, seconded by? Commissioner Moore. Fantastic. Um, yes. Let me do a roll call vote. And by the way, the fact that we didn't have a lot of uh, questions or comments is not an indication, I think, of the excitement for this project. Um, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. You're hearing the enthusiasm and the yeses. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova, yes. Commissioner Cox. Enthusiastic, yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Grossman. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada. Yes. Commissioner Barkley is. Uh, he this was his first meeting, and uh, he had uh, previous uh, commitments, but uh, he'll know next time to um, he'll have an advance notice next time to clear his calendar. So we appreciate that he was here for the first first part of the meeting. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Villegas. Commissioner Way. Commissioner Way. Yes. Commissioner. Yes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner um, Burnett votes yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so that was a, a slew of enthusiastic yeses. Congratulations. The motion passes. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. And Miss Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to this this project um, this project uh, being built and all the great things that it's going to bring. Um, where am I here? Uh, so the next item on agenda is three: a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by Alam Industries LLC for the property generally located at 3006-3012 East 78th Street. The property is zoned RM 5.5 and is within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District. The applicant is proposing to construct a five-story residential building with 10 dwelling units and eight interior parking spaces and two outdoor parking spaces. This is in the seventh ward. Ms. Washington will again provide the context overview. Uh, she'll go through that quickly and the applicant will present their proposal. Good afternoon again, Lisa Washington for the record. Elon Place Condominiums um, or Elon Industries LLC is the applicant seeking to construct a four-story masonry building containing 10 dwelling units with eight interior parking spaces and two exterior. The property is currently vacant. Um, the dwelling units will be for sale condominium units. The applicant will reside in one of the condos as her primary resident. It is located within the boundaries of the lakefront protection um, boundaries. Um, she, she proposing to prevent to uh, invest over seven million dollars in this construction of the project with the creation of two hundred jobs in construction. Um, she hopes to start this summer and open up the project in twenty twenty two. This is also in the South Shore community area where the majority of the units. Um, within this area are multi-units. Um, here it's located right on the border of the Rainbow Beach Park. Uh, if you see my cursor, it's here. The development does not uh, include parkland at all. This is all privately owned property that she is proposing to build on. It is zoned RM 5.5. 
and she will be building under that current zoning. Well, now I'm going to turn it over to, well, let me do the context really quick. So here's another picture of the property um, shaded in red. This is looking north. South Shore Drive is just to the west of the property. And as I noted, to the east is the park. This is 78th Street to the south. Here's another look looking east towards the lake, the property shaded in red, and this is 78th Street to the east. Here's another uh, picture looking south where you can see 78th Street cul-de-sacs. Um, every, all the open land, open space you see to the east is actually um, the park space. And if you look up north, you will see the beach and the USX site. Another picture showing the property looking westward. This street along here is South Shore, no, I'm sorry, right here is South Shore Drive. And this is a pedestrian context looking at, um, from South Shore Drive, no, looking west on 78th Street. So the property here, see my cursor. Then I think uh, one more picture showing it looking west from the park. Another photo, another photo. And now we'll turn it over to Tyler Manick, who is the legal representation for this project. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the commission. For the record, Tyler Manick of Shane Banks, Kenny and Schwartz. I'm joined by Anita Richardson, who's the owner of the applicant and who intends to reside in one of the units that we're sharing with you today. And Ionis Davis, who is the project architect. As the slide indicates, this has been a long process um, and we thank the Department of Planning staff for their consideration and diligence in working with us to make this a project that you see here today. Over the past year, the department has given us positive feedback and suggestions to improve this project through at least six uh, Zoom meetings and numerous other communications. In addition, the development team has met individually with the surrounding uh, neighborhoods, the, the local community groups, uh, and the aldermen who've all uh, unanimously supported this project. Uh, recently, last month, this project was uh, before the Zoning Board of Appeals who also approved this project unanimously. If we can go to the next slide, Ms. Washington. So, so based upon the feedback uh, from the Department of Planning through the staff and communications we had with them over the past year, there's been numerous changes uh, to this project. Uh, these changes range from uh, window arrangement type design features on the front 78th Street facade, uh, mater uh, building materials uh, and landscaping, all of which are being incorporated into today's presentation. So if we could change to the next slide, Ms. Washington. Ionis, are you available to start speaking on the design? Yes. I'm here. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, we uh, appreciate the opportunity to come before me, Madam Chairman and Ms. Washington, and appreciate your input along with DPD, uh, as well as the client, of course. Uh, this uh, building is, was conceived as uh, kind of an oasis, if you will, um, on the uh, in, in the South Shore neighborhood, which is a lovely neighborhood, but certainly has its challenges. Uh, we oriented the building uh, as the site uh, to, to, to maximize the site, which runs basically lengthwise north and south. So we wanted to orient the building towards the lake, of course, and um, uh, high ceilings uh, with um, 12, to 12 foot floor to floor heights, um, large glass. Uh, so the, the building really is, is conceived from the inside out. I know as architects, we like to uh, focus on the exteriors, which, which is important for context. And contextually, we have matched uh, brick and, and, and uh, color palettes in, in the adjacent areas per DPD input. But uh, we have balconies, of course, facing the east. 
and um, um, as also as you know, African American architects, we look forward to any opportunity to have buildings that we can point to as a as a uh, pattern um, uh, of our uh, practice. So we're excited on all levels about this project, and. Um, you know, look forward to providing these spaces that will improve the human condition, not only for its tenants, but hopefully for the community as well. We could keep it rolling, that will help us on time. Who's next? Sure. Tyler, are you gonna to speak to these slides? No, Ionis is gonna keep going through the slides. Ionis, if you could get through these quickly. Okay, sure, we can move quickly. Uh, again, this just points to how we're uh, matching the context of surrounding buildings, uh, pulling off uh, not only color palette, but uh, patterns in the, in the brickwork uh, that uh, allude to uh, buildings in, in, in the area. You can move to the next slide. Uh, again, site-wise, contextually, uh, we do see this as kind of an oasis, although it is gated from the uh, um, at the property is gated. Once you do arrive on the property, you have uh, private garages and um, some some space on site for uh, a, a, a reflection in the a, a small courtyard space. But um, yeah, uh, uh, go to the next slide. Uh, uh, this first ground level shows the private garages and um, a small little uh, uh, um, courtyard space, which allows for light in um, uh, early form, performs more as a light well for bedroom spaces to uh, get the light in. You can move to the next slide. Uh, just a typical floor plate um, showing how um, these units are very spacious. Uh, three bedrooms and um, ample ample space with no double loaded corridors, so we're able to flood the spaces with light. Next slide. Uh, you could move all the way through these um, plans. They're all yeah. And then it's a roof plan. Uh, then the elevations uh, further just um, you know uh, tie in what you saw in the rendering. Uh, you could move through these. And certainly um, you could go on. We have, uh, uh, this is a section to the balconies, uh, showing the cantilever balconies. You can keep moving. Uh, brick patterns taken to, from the context to, uh, you know, sit this building in the context of the surrounding buildings. You could, you could go on. Uh, some other key site features with CDOT and uh, landscape um, input that has been um, added. Uh, proceed through these guys. And uh, certainly um, sustainable, uh, our sustainable policy and our points, even though it's all privately funded, we are still very aggressive with the sustainability. We could move, move through. Uh, certainly all these are all of our stormwater um, uh, um, approaches and strategies. And, and so again, thank you for your time. And to uh, conclude, uh, Ms. Richardson, who is a developer here, has held an MBE WB certification with Cook County since 2006. And it's the intent to include the city's MBE WB participation goals. Um, at this time, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Richardson would just like 30 seconds to show her pre appreciation for this opportunity. Ms. Richardson, are you available? Yes, I am. If, if you can do that quickly, we'd appreciate it. I'm here. <laughs> okay, okay, so thank you. Um, so, so that will pass it off to Ms. Washington. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. I actually have the wrong PowerPoint up because it doesn't have my recommendations on it, but um, the Department of Planning and Development has thoroughly reviewed this project. And based upon um, the uh, policy set forth in the Lakefront Protection Ordinance, um, we are asking for this body to recommend the passage of this lakefront, approval, lakefront Protection Approval for the building of this 
four story, 10 unit condo building. Um, thank you. Uh, is uh, Commissioner, I mean, excuse me, is Alderman Mitchell here to speak or do we have a letter from him? Um, I have confirmed um, via email his support for this project. Thank you. Do I have a motion on proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by Alarm Industries LLC for the property generally located at 3006 3012 East 78th Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? So moved. Moved by Commissioner Lyons, seconded by Commissioner Moore. Commissioner Moore, thank you, Commissioner Moore. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Grossman. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Commissioner Wagesbach. Yes. Great, thank you. Motion carries, congratulations. Madam Chair, Commissioner Novara wasn't called, I'm a yes. Okay, thank you, I thought I, so the last case I should have uh, you. Sorry, no um, thank you very case. much. Motion passed, um, congratulations. Um, um, it's a very nice um, project. And what we'd like to make sure that you do is uh, when we ask you for information on the WBEs and MBEs to fill out the reports. But, uh, con but congratulations, we look forward to this being built. Thank, thank you very much, much committee, yeah. thank you. Next item on the agenda is D4, a proposed amendment to plan development 1220, submitted by Arts and Motion, the property generally located at 7522 South Greenwood. The applicant seeks to add school as a permitted use to allow for a temporary school use at the subject property. This is in the eighth ward. Kim Morris will provide the context overview and the applicant will pre present the proposal. And Ms. Morris, she'll go through this quickly as well. Thank you. I will unmute myself. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Madam Chairman and members of the commission. For the record, again, my name is Kimberly Morris with the Department of Planning and Development. The proposal before you today is a proposed text amendment to Institutional Plan Development 1220, generally located at 7, uh, 7522 South Greenwood within the Greater Grand Crossing community area in the 8th Ward. The applicant, uh, Art in Motion, and their development team appear here today for the purposes of adding use uh, to the institutional plan development. Uh, this request is being submitted as a mandatory amendment due to the fact that the, proposed, the proposal includes a change in character development by broadening the allowed uses for PD 1220. Uh, the applicant, Art in Motion, is seeking to establish temporary operations within the existing two story uh, building located at. 7522 South Greenwood, while its permanent school site located at 7501 Southeast End is being expanded. During construction, Art in Motion will continue its operations at the school site for seventh and eighth graders only. However, to accommodate its ninth and eighth grade students, Art in Motion is seeking to establish temporary operations within the existing building at 7522 South Greenwood. The proposed text amendment would broaden the uses for PD-1220 to allow school as a permitted use. Uh, the temporary site previously operated as a daycare and is loaded, located again within the institutional plan development 1220 boundaries. Uh, no construction, new additions or changes to the property's access are planned. Uh, the, proposed, the purpose of the amendment is solely to allow for the temporary operation of a high school within an existing building. Uh, the subject site is in the Southeast Planning Region uh, in the Greater Grand Crossing Community Area um, in the, again, in the Eighth Ward under Alderman Harris. Uh, with a population of 30,000, the community is 95% uh, African American with a median income of $29,000. Um, the subject site itself is bound by Greenwood to the east, uh, 75th place to the south, Dobson Avenue to the west and 75th Street to the north. Um, and at this point, I would like to introduce Graham Brady, attorney of the applicant. Thank you very much, Ms. Morris. Uh, Chairwoman uh, Cordova, can you hear me? We sure can and welcome, Mr. Thank Grady. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Chairwoman. Uh, my name is Graham Grady. I'm a partner at the Taft Law Firm. And along with my colleague, Sylvia Micus, we're pleased to represent AIM Art in Motion Charter School for this plan development amendment application. Uh, in addition to the two of us, other members of our team available to answer questions are Aaron Lenoe, the CEO of Distinctive Schools, which is the parent to AIM, Kara May, who's the principal of Art in Motion Charter School, and Larry Kearns of Wheeler Kearns Architect, who's the architect of record. Um, as you can see, this three-story building at 7522 South Greenwood is uh, very attractive. As um, Ms. Morris mentioned, there was already set up for a daycare center. Uh, the school will be using it um, for the coming school year uh, for the ninth and 10th grades. Uh, we would like to thank um, Alderman Harris uh, for her leadership on the community review of this uh, project. I understand that Alderman, Alder person Harris's representative, Mr. Al Ryder, may be available on this call to uh, signal the Alderman, the Alder person's uh, support. If you can uh, go to the next slide, please, Ms. Morris. Um, as you can see, this uh, this area shaded in white is a PD 1220, which was established uh, to accommodate the um, New Life Covenant Church, which is in the southern portion of the PD. The arrow points to a small rectangle, which is the uh, brown uh, masonry building that you saw on the earlier slide. It's in that small area of the PD in which the um, AIM Charter School will operate. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is. Um, uh, as the orientation the other way, but in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the um, location of the school site. And next slide, please. Uh, this just shows the um, surrounding land uses. It's primarily a residential community. Um, we've only received one phone call from any neighbor of the neighbors, and that um, phone call indicated their support of this school. Next slide. Uh, this is a little bit uh, closer up, the white, uh, square in the middle uh, is the uh, building. Um, at, at the lower side across Greenwood, there is a, a very large parking lot, uh, which belongs to the church also. The times, uh, there's a perfect shared parking arrangement here uh, because when the uh, school is in session, the church is not. And when the church is in session, the school is not. So there's ample parking here. In addition, along um, the street, uh, just to the south, uh, there will be um, a pickup and drop off loading area. Uh, there are two small parks adjacent, the Dobson Park uh, to the west above it and Adams Park uh, to the south, you can see there. So the um, situation here works very well. Uh, there are no traffic issues, there are no parking issues, there are no land use conflicts. Uh, next slide, please. And again, this is um, a front view of the building. Uh, we will be adding one street tree uh, in order to be in compliance with the landscape uh, ordinance. Um, and um, with that, we are available to answer any questions that you may have. Um, again, we appreciate the opportunity to amend the plan development simply by adding school as a permitted use uh, in PD 1220. And with that, we're available to answer questions. Thanks, uh, Cameron, Ms. Morris. We do have a couple other slides. This is the west side of the building with Dobson Park. The next slide, please. Uh, this is um, from the, um, just the surrounding area. This is Adams Park right at the corner at uh, 75th Place and um, uh, Greenwood. And this is the um, uh, one of the entries to the school. Actually, the street tree we're planning is gonna be just outside the picture at the lower left where we'll be adding one additional uh, street tree. Um, uh, Chairwoman uh, Cordova, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, my team and I are available to answer any questions you have about this um, additive project uh, to the neighborhood. Thank you. Kim, can we finish up? CPD has concluded that this proposal is appropriate for this site and supports its approval of this text amendment uh, for the following reasons. Uh, when the proposal is compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of uses, density, and building scale, as there are no changes or exterior alterations to the existing structure on the site. Uh, the proposal is compatible with the surrounding zoning, uh, existing plan development, and the new 
use uh, is compatible with other zoning districts and plan development located nearby within the greater. We'd like to thank uh, Ms. Morris, uh, Mr. Noah Safranek, and um, other members of the Department of Planning and Development and the other city bureaus that have reviewed the project. We thank you, uh, members of the Planning Commission, for your favorable consideration. Thank you, Mr. Grady. Uh, Commissioner Tani. Just quickly, uh, Graham. Uh, maybe this is more for Commissioner Biagi if she's on the call. Would you go back to the, the uh, surface condition of, of uh, Greenwood? Yeah, um, uh, while you're going there, the um, Greenwood is actually in pretty good shape, but 75th place is the street that's um, pretty rough. Uh, uh, chair. Well, right there, right there. What is that street? Um, yeah, so that, that's 75th place. And uh, okay. we have we have spoken to uh, the alderman and, and um, the Department of Transportation about the possibility of having it resurface. Um, that has not been a condition of the project going forward, but we are aware of the rough uh, street surface there, Chairman Tunney. No, nothing gets by Chairman Tunney. Um, I was so thank you for what that. A, what a great catch, Commissioner. Well, that gets me to a point that maybe this is more for Biagi. You know, we're giving some relief on this project and it's a good project, but oftentimes we make the developer or somebody re redo the, the uh, property that's adjacent to the development. And that might, that's my question. I mean, I don't think yeah. the city should be necessarily paying for that if we're providing this type of benefit uh, and reuse. So that's just my- uh, I'm happy to respond to that. Aldermanic value. Aldermanic dollars uh, hat on this one. Right. So, uh, Chairman Tony, I appreciate that. And and while we certainly would favor the resurfacing of the street, AIM will only be in this building for nine months, uh, from September of 2021 through May of 2022. Uh, and it's a nonprofit charter school. There is no budget for things such as street resurfacing. We would beg the city's um, uh, forgiveness uh, to let this go forward. It's not like a okay. big downtown hotel development where there are millions well, of dollars in play. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know it was such a temporary use. I wasn't, I was on a couple of phone calls, but what no, is the- it, it, it wasn't, I don't, I'm not sure it was said that it was temporary or maybe it was, but I, I didn't catch that either. Right. Yeah. It, the, the reason that it's a temporary use is AIM currently has its charter school located at 7415 Southeast End. AIM is expanding to other portions of that building, but the construction will not be completed uh, by the start date, uh, which is just two months from now, actually about uh, six weeks from now. And therefore they need another space for the ninth and 10th grade to operate for the coming school year. And they've entered into a lease with the church to use a portion of this building on a temporary basis. Uh, and so that's why we need to amend this PD to allow school as a permitted use. But AIM will only be here for um, the coming school year. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Biagi, do you have any response to this and what it might take to get that little strip there uh, resurfaced? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. I think and part of the reason that uh, we didn't insist upon it because we ordinarily would um, is because of the temp temporary nature of the development. Um, there are certainly some options, um, whether it's, you know, working closely with the aldermen on if that's a priority for them, whether it's out of some of the menu funds or we have some capital funds. But, you know, I think um, this is a very, this is, these are a couple of uh, projects in a very large development. And so it probably stands to look at it holistically and sort of start to figure out, you know, what is the right um, cadence of the larger infrastructure improvements that it'll take. Um, but yeah, so that's something like uh, that we noted on the plan as well. And I think uh, future reviews um, with the planning department, I know the team is aware of this, that we would expect to revisit this um, with the next stages of development. Commissioner Biagi, thank you. We're available to communicate as needed. We always appreciate your help, guidance, and, and support. Uh, is Alderman Harris here to make a comment or is there a statement on file? Uh, uh, we, oh. Go ahead, Mr. Ryder. Thank you. Yes. Alvin Wright on behalf of Alderman Harris. Um, we are in support of the, of the temporary move while they expand their campus, excited about that. Uh, but she, but back to the research, the Alderman is considering using, which wouldn't be her first choice to use menu dollars to, to get that portion resurfaced. But uh, we're open, she's open to whatever way we can get that resurfaced. 
whether it's her menu or other uh, just some other options available with respect to funding for that <laughs> that's that that portion for sure okay, absolutely so, so then we would encourage your communication with your office then and and yes yes commissioner biagi um and then mr grady so fantastic uh, do the all right. So, do I have a motion on the proposed amendment to Plan Development 1220 submitted by Arts in Motion, AIM for the property generally located at 7522 South Greenwood, find that it meets the requirements for approval. Moved by Commissioner Shaw. Commissioner Shaw, seconded by Commissioner Moore. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Porter was a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Um, Commissioner Grossman's not here. I think she, and then Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Murphy? Yes. Nevada this time, I'm sorry. Commissioner Nevada? Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Searle? Yes. Commissioner Shaw, you're a proxy on D3. Just got your email, Commissioner. And then what about D4? Yes. Sorry, oh. I'm sending them in. Sometimes I'm not sure if you can hear me. So I just want to make sure you have me on record. Oh, great. We, we have you on record now for proxy in the affirmative for item D3 and a vote for yes on item D4. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Commissioner Wagespot? Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Garza. I'm a yes to. Sorry about that. That's okay. I, I thank you very this, much. Thank this you. Commissioner Villegas as well, please. Can you add me? Yes. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for your service to Chicago. Thank you, Mr. Grady. Next item on the agenda is D5, a proposed business plan development submitted by our Revival Chicago LLC for the property generally located at 3506-20 South Halstead Street. Great seeing all these projects on the south side. Uh, the applicant proposes to rezone the site from B3-3 Community Shopping District to C3-2 Commercial Manufacturing and Employment District, and then to a business plan development to develop a live entertainment venue with an 1800 person capacity and approximately 4,000 square foot restaurant and then approximately 5,000 square foot brewery on the subject property. This is in the 11th Ward, Emily Thrun will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. For the record, my name is Emily Thrun with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant appears here today because they are proposing to rezone the site to a planned development to renovate the buildings on the site to include a live entertainment venue, restaurant and brewery. The same project was approved by the Plan Commission in January 2020 and was ultimately approved by the Zoning Committee on March 16, 2020. Because of the applicant's purchase contracts with its land sellers, the applicant asked that the ordinance be held in committee. Then the pandemic hit, the ordinance, ordinance remained in committee, and per the terms of the zoning ordinance, was deemed, deni deemed denied due to the passage of time without city council action. So the applicant refiled the application earlier this year, and that is why the proposal is in front of the plan commission again. The subject site is located in the Bridgeport community area. The community area has a population of about 34,000 people with about 13,000 households. You know what, Ms. Thrun, um, I'm gonna, because of just, in light of what you just said, and of course having you know, read the material and so on, we know sure. this, we've already been through this, and this okay. is coming back to us again. So the so if we can just uh, and I and I think if people will look at the slides they can sure because uh, you your slides are all, as always are informative so I give you a chance to get through this a little bit more quickly. Thank all right, you. I'll keep it moving. Thank you. <laughs> the site consists of three parcels and it is bounded by South House Street to the east, a three-story building to the north, a public alley to the west, and a three-story building to the south. One parcel is improved with a vacant theater known as the Vimova Theater. The theater property also includes a vacant square foot lot to the south of the theater building. The site also contains a two-story commercial property fronting Halstead. Finally, the site contains, contains a T-shaped property with a two-story building that has historically provided a means of access to the commercial and theater property. Additionally, while not within the planned development boundaries, the applicant is proposing to provide 50 automobile parking 
spaces across the street on Halsted to serve the site. The site is located, located about a three-fourth of a mile west of the CTA Sox 35th Street Red Line stop. It is also located near the CTA's number eight and 35 bus stops. Is there, the anything, site, is there anything different that, the, that, this, that this application is providing us that... that uh, no. Should I just keep moving? <laughs> so just give okay. us some, maybe give us summary statements as to sure to jog our memory. But commissioners, we've we've seen this before, and as Ms. Thrun uh, remind us, it's because of the COVID that that it expired and it's coming back to us. But your point, Ms. Thrun, is that there's really nothing different here. It's just that we're just coming back for the same thing to approve. Correct. That is correct. So um, this is a rendering that you previously saw at Plan Commission. Um, this is just some context slides of the current property as it exists today. And then um, I just want to turn it quickly over to the applicant who has a, just a few, few words about the proposal. Hi, my name is Tyler Nevis. I'm the developer of the project and the applicant. I'm joined by uh, Andrew Scott and O'Reilly from O'Reilly Office, the architect. Um, to echo everything said before, not a lot has changed except for I've since moved to Bridgeport uh, along with my family. Um, we continue to be unbelievably excited about this project and we look forward to, to working uh, with you all as well as Chicago to make this amazing. And were, were you the original, I mean, you lived in this area before, right? When you grew up in this area? Yes, I've, I've, I've lived in Chicago before. I've since hey. moved back from Brooklyn to Bridgeport. I live about a mile and a half away from the venue and uh, plan on being here for a long time. Yeah, yeah, no, we remember the excitement on this one. Uh, do, is, did Alderman Thompson, uh, did he make a statement or do we have a letter on file? I mean, is he here with a letter on file? I do have a letter on file from him in support. And, and Chairwoman, I, uh, Alderman Thompson apologized. He was trying to get here in time for this item, but uh, he just texted me. He's unable to get here right away. So okay. he did want us to voice his support for the project. Well, and we remember his enthusiasm also from the last time. So uh, again, uh, you know, moving right along here is not an indication of the, of the enthusiasm that, that we have for this project. Um, and, and I think it's going to be really exciting for the folks in, in Bridgeport. Whenever I drive through there, I think, oh, it's coming, it's coming. So uh, do I have a motion then on the proposed business plan development submitted by our Revival Chicago LLC for the property generally located at 3506-20 South Halstead Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? So moved by moved Linda Thurl. And seconded by... Commissioner Cox, seconded by Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yeah. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Commissioner Gaza. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Nevada. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Cyril. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Commissioner Tunney. Commissioner Villegas. Commissioner yes. Wages. Yes. Commissioner Wagespot. All right, motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank We're excited. Very much. And Commissioner Shaw is a yes too. Okay, got it. Next item, uh, next item on the agenda is D6 a proposed residential business plan development submitted by 1201 West Fulton Partners, LLC, for the property generally located at 1215 West Fulton Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from M2-3 Light Industry District to DX-7 Downtown Mixed Use District, and then to a residential business plan development. The applicant proposes to construct a 34 story, 414 foot nine inch tall building with a ground floor commercial space and residential use above. The project will contain 80 accessory vehicular parking spaces and 112 bicycle parking spaces. A 4.5 floor area ratio bonus will be taken and the overall FAR of the plan development will be 11.5. This is in the 27th ward. Joshua Son will present the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Go ahead, Mr. Son. Good afternoon. Uh, can I just check to make sure you all can see the screen and can hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Fantastic. Uh, for the record, my name is Joshua Sun <clears throat> with the Department of Planning and Development. This proposed development is generally located at 1215 West Fulton Market and is located within the near west side community area within the 27th Ward. Uh, 
The applicant 1201 West Fulton Partners LLC and their development team appear here today for the purposes of establishing a residential business plan development at the subject site. The request is being submitted as a mandatory plan development application pursuant. I appreciate that you're moving quickly, uh, but just be mindful that Barb, uh, our court reporter, also yes. needs to today. All right, sorry. Um, the request is being submitted as a mandatory plan development application pursuant to section 17-8-512 and 17-8-513 due to the fact that the proposed building will exceed 155 feet in height, contain more than 200 dwelling units, and that the proposal will utilize the neighborhood opportunity fund bonus to increase the maximum allowable FAR of the development from a base FAR of 7 to an FAR of 11.5. The subject site is located in the near west side community area where the total population change increased by 35% between 2000 and 2018. This is in stark contrast to a decrease in population of the entire city by 6% in that same time period. The proposed project uh, is located at the southwest corner at the intersection of West Fulton Market and North Racine Avenue in the West Loop. You can see here. The proposed PD noted by the star located here, is adjacent to the historic Fulton Randolph Market Chicago Landmark District, along with several other amenities. The existing site is currently improved with a single story building that serves as an event space, uh, as you can see in the upper right hand corner, and a two story small scale industrial building in the lower right hand corner. The site outlined in pink is currently zoned M2-3 and is proposed to be rezoned to an underlying DX-7 zoning district prior to establishing a residential business plan development on the subject site. The site is currently surrounded by a mix of manufacturing, business, and commercial land uses. The applicant has designed the project to be compliant with the West Loop design guidelines with the main goal of addressing the character of the West Loop with context-sensitive context design to complement the street block face along with providing open space. Uh, the project further promotes mixed uses and mixed incomes. With that said, I will turn it over to Miss Katie Jenke Dale with the applicant team to discuss the project timeline and subsequent slides. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Mr. Hassan, and good afternoon, uh, members of the commission and chairwoman. For the record, my name is Katie Jenke Dale from the law firm of DLA Piper, along with my colleague, Rich Clowder. I represent, the, or we represent the applicant for this matter. You could advance to the next slide, please. We started this process with the community groups in January of this year, when we met with the various community uh, organizations shown on the screen. We had a community-wide meeting in May of 2021 and after that, we had a follow-up meeting with neighbors across the street to address concerns regarding construction and um, overall utility and facility concerns. We also worked very closely with the DPD design team and made changes to the project based on feedback from that design team. I'm joined today by representatives from the applicant, Fulton Street Companies, Morris Ajme, the design architect, GREC, the project architect, site design, the landscape architect, as well as KLOA, the uh, traffic engineer. With that, and if we advance to the next slide, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Morris Ajmi to go through the design. Morris? Hello. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Morris Ajmi. I'm here with Lucas Posada, who is going to help with the presentation. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to the Planning Commission. I'd also like to thank the Butler Adams, the kind gentleman who spoke earlier. Thank you, Katie. Um, we're really excited about working in Chicago with its rich history of art and architectural legacy. Um, and I believe that our design uh, is, uh, shares the core values with the West Loop design guidelines. Um, and that's why we're really excited to be working in the city and also in the neighborhood. Um, but before I turn it over to Lucas, I just wanna thank uh, everybody that worked on the project, Alderman Burnett, uh, the various community groups, um, and Josh and Noah uh, at TPD. Uh, thank you very much. Lucas is going to take us through the project. Hello, thank you. And just, you can hear us and see us, right? Yep. Yes, yes. You can Great. Hear. Thank you. Okay. My name is Lucas Posada. I'm with Morris Adam Architects. And uh, I'm going to take you through this relatively quickly, but we've got our team that Katie described on board to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, this slide shows the West Loop design guidelines. 
and how our proposed massing and design are in conformance with the uh, West Loop design guidelines, uh, specifically in maintaining uh, the scale of the adjacent historic buildings in the adjacent historic district and um, um, maintaining the street wall along Fulton Market and Racine. Next slide, please. This is a ground level view that uh, shows in more detail how we are conforming uh, some more of the design guidelines, specifically design excellence, preserving and enhancing the street walls, uh, design of the building base, locating uh, the parking below grade, and um, uh, some of the architectural components, uh, such as mark uh, canopies that mark entrances, et cetera. Next slide, please. This is a slide that describes the detail of the lower portion of the building that we refer to as the pavilion or the podium or the low rise portion. Uh, the, uh, we took a look at the historic, uh, historic buildings directly across Racine, which are in the historic district. And even though we're not inside the historic district, it's still important for us to be sympathetic to that existing context across the street. So uh, the design of this references that existing context uh, without being literal. Next slide, please. This is a ground floor plan of the uh, project that shows a generous public plaza and covered outdoor space that's flanked by residential and retail program. And this quantity of uh, publicly accessible open space is achieved by locating the parking and services below grade. And uh, all that is accessed via the public alley, hidden from public view. And we just wanna note that there are no new curb cuts proposed in this project. Next slide, please. This is a basement level view of the project showing bike parking, mechanical and service areas and 80 new parking stalls. Next slide, please. Another ground floor plan showing that most of, the, uh, most of this level is dedicated to active uses with residential entrances occurring on the north side and off the plaza, retail entrances off Fulton Market and the plaza, and then other retail entrances occurring off Racine Avenue and the publicly accessible plaza. Loading and parking access are off the uh, publicly accessible alley. Next slide, please. This is a typical podium level that shows 22 units. So this occurs for levels uh, one through five of the project. Uh, there's a mix of small budget friendly studio and one bedrooms, larger family size units, um, and uh, the level changes as, as we go up the building. Next slide, please. This is the amenity uh, level plan at level six, which has generous roof terraces that are accessible by the building occupants. Um, so that'll be a combination of indoor amenity spaces and outdoor amenity spaces. Next slide, please. The tower has two uh, typical residential tiers. Tier one on the bottom of the page has 13 units per floor and tier two has 12 units per floor. So that tier one occurs in the lower portion of the tower and tier two occurs in the higher portion of the tower. Next slide, please. This is the top floor of the residential tower, which includes four large units and uh, ample outdoor space dedicated to these units. And as you can see from the typical floor plans on the previous pages, and then this upper floor plan, integration of uh, generous outdoor space is something that's very important to our design concept. And we um, came to that point in the design uh, with a lot of DPD and community feedback, which we'll describe in more detail later. Next slide, please. This shows the east and north elevations, which are the primary street elevations against along Racine Avenue to the left, which is the east elevation, and Fulton Market to the right, which is the north elevation. So this gives some more detail about the materials that are proposed at the base of the building and the upper portions of the building. Next slide, please. Uh, the west and south elevations are shown on this screen. The west elevation um, is abuts the property line and the uh, south elevation abuts the alley. Next slide, please. This is a detailed look at a typical tower facade bay that shows the layers and depth of the facade and the refined detailing and shadow lines that are achieved 
um, through the design. Uh, this is meant to be a combination of glass and metal, uh, two different colors of metal and then glass. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an existing building uh, in Washington, D.C. that was designed by our office, and it has a very similar uh, facade articulation, even though the massing is quite different, and it just gives you a sense for the shadow and the depth and the quality of the design and detailing that we anticipate for this project. Next slide, please. This is a detailed look at the typical podium facade, so the lower portion of the building. This shows the depth of the brick facade. Again, this references the scale and articulation of the historic brick facades of the district while having a feel of something more contemporary. Next slide, please. This is an aerial 3D view looking northeast, showing our building within context of future buildings in the district. Next slide. So this is how it all comes together in that street level view again. The proposed design, uh, this is a rendering from the corner of Racine Avenue and Fulton Market within Southwest. And there's a few design details that we'd like to highlight. Next slide, please. This shows the evolution of the design through um, various stakeholder uh, meetings and input and feedback, which we ultimately think that process always leads to a better design. Um, the design on the left-hand side was the initial uh, proposal from January. and. Uh, through the design process, you see in the middle of the screen that we integrated balconies along the east facade. Uh, we also refined the, uh, the brick uh, podium, the lower portion, and, uh, and the window articulation. Um, and then ultimately the design, which is before you now for consideration is on the right-hand side, which has uh, balconies more distributed on all sides of the tower um, and uh, and I, yeah, that's, that's the primary change between the April and May designs. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a zoomed in view of the tower facade. So again, it gives you a sense for the depth and the articulation and the detailing um, and the care for those uh, proportions that we anticipate in the project. Next slide. And this is a zoomed in view of the ground plan and pavilion showing the activated streetscape and plaza and also the refined detailing of the brick. One thing that we heard over and over was the importance of open space for the community. And so uh, having a really open and accept publicly accessible uh, ground plane was something that has been key to this project and has become a real part of the identity of this uh, architecture. Next slide. Uh, this view highlights that plaza and how it draws in pedestrians from Racine and from Fulton Market. The idea is that this can become a community asset with the rotating art program. It can be also used for events such as farmer's markets or other things like that. Next slide, please. This is a view inside the plaza looking out towards Racine Ave. This shows the relationship between the plaza and the building and highlights the generous amount of open space and the active uses that are located along that plaza. Next slide. This is a streetscape uh, plan. So similar to the elevations we showed before, but more about the adjacent uh, architecture and the scale of the streets. Next slide. Uh, this is the streetscape along Racine Avenue. Next slide. These are some concept images, which we started with at the early phases of, of the design to talk about the inspiration that we were looking at for the materiality, the massing and uh, the architectural details. Um, important here are some ideas about the ground plane and the active uses, as well as the uh, integration of the materials that are um, not just uh, pulling inspiration from the district itself, but also from the city at large in terms of that uh, beautiful uh, um, utilitarian architecture that we see in some of the bridges and things like, of that nature uh, within the city as a whole. Next slide. The material palette is anticipated to be a combination of uh, brick and dark metal. Um, this is something that we've used on other projects uh, in our portfolio, which you see on the screen. And we feel like that's very complementary and sympathetic to the existing um, material palette within the district and within the city. Next slide, please. Uh, these slides are part of our submission that describe the way that we uh, conform to the Chicago zoning ordinance. And uh, there's a, a good amount of detail in here, which we won't go into, but we're happy to answer any questions um, that you may have about the urban design uh, and the zoning code compliance. Next slide, please. Similarly, uh, we 
did extensive uh, development of transportation, traffic, pedestrian flow, um, and streetscape guidelines. And there's a good amount of detail on the next couple of slides about that, which we have a team here to answer any questions that you may have about that. Uh, we're working with our landscape architect partners who are here on the call to answer your questions to create a uh, landscaped and well thought out public space that integrates hardscape and softscape and that have trees that are going to be able to withstand the summers, the winters, and the shade conditions of the plaza. And also to the uh, open space requirements and um, stormwater requirements of the site have been considered and are, uh, there's more detail here for your uh, from information purposes. Our sustainability strategy um, in, is a total of 100 points. Um, we're excited about some of our transportation approaches and uh, putting parking below grade, which will allow us to have the, the open space. Um, and there's some more details here that can be discussed if necessary. Next slide. Oh, and this is the stormwater management uh, compliance, which we described before. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Katie uh, so that you can uh, describe the school impact study. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. And for the record, Katie Jinky Dale from DLA Piper. We uh, commissioned a school impact study at the request of DPD that showed that there was more than adequate capacity in area schools to uh, generate or to um, to absorb the number of children that we anticipate. What's not shown on the screen is also that study um, showed that there would be a net positive benefit to CPS of approximately $20 million over 20 years, once you take into account the additional taxes generated by this new development um, and netted out those anticipated students. Next slide. The, uh, the project falls within the Near North pilot and has committed to providing those 20% or the 20% requirement all on site. Also we're north of Lake within the FMID. So we've also baked language into the PD that has the developer working with DPD to try to accommodate an additional 10% for a total of 30% of units uh, within the development. Those units will be um, uh, proportionate in size to the market rate units provided on site. Next slide. Um, this project uh, represents a neighborhood opportunity bonus payment of over $4 million, which will be distributed in the 80%, 10%, 10% uh, per the code. It has a project budget of approximately $160 million and it will create approximately 300 temporary construction jobs. And the developer is committed to meeting um, the mayoral executive goal uh, thresholds for the M and WB, as well as working with the alderman's office on local hiring. With that, um, you know, I'd just like to thank DPD as well as the alderman and the community for their work with us on this project that we're all very excited about. We're all here for any questions. And with that, I'll turn it back over to DPD to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the material submitted by the applicant. And we've concluded that the proposed development would be appropriate for the following reasons. The proposal is in general conformance with the Fulton Market Innovation District plan update and the West Loop design guidelines. It Joshua, how about we just read what's up there? That's and fine. If, okay, I'm gonna... And if we can we, we'll reference your staff report, which has um, seven reasons there why you've listed uh, recommendations for approval. Uh, saying, first of all, it's in general conformance with the Fulton Market Innovation District Plan. It's been designed to be in compliant with the West Loop design guidelines. Uh, de development is economically beneficial uh, and is compatible with the character of the existing neighborhood. Sides and, sides and areas of building are visible to the public. The uh, massing, building op orientation and massing is evidenced by the primary pedestrian entrances. Um, our focal element of the building and urban design um, uh, uh, is, is as er desirable urban features and parks, open space and landscaping are appropriate for the site. Provide adequate, inviting, usable and accessible parks, open space and recreation areas for workers, visitors and residences. Um, thank you, Mr. Sun. Um, uh, Mr. Cox, I'm mean, a commissioner. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, I think, thank you. I, I know we are um, powering through these uh, applicants, um, but I do think that every once in a while it's worth stopping 
uh, and uh, just noting uh, some something that I think uh, are positive lessons that I hope we see more of. Um, I just want to thank the development team and the architect for working so closely with uh, DPD and CDOT to uh, give us a new way of having buildings um, come to the ground uh, in a district which is starved for public space. Uh, so to dedicate this much space to the public realm um, is uh, a really wonderful precedent. Uh, we will be showing it to other developers uh, as a way to talk about how we increase the amount of public space. Uh, and I just think that uh, everything from the, the depth of the facade, the sensitivity to ma the materiality, and this is outside of the district. So uh, just a wonderful um, expression. And uh, again, congratulations for giving us a precedent that we can use again and again and again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Agreed. you. Agree. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Searle. Um, I wanted to make sure we all understand the, the, the roof um, space that's available um, and how we get there. So um, I understand the pool level is at the top of the fifth floor, right? And then the rest of the five-story building is part of the public, or at least private open space for the residents. Is that correct? That's, that, that's correct, yeah. So, so okay. the, um, everything is accessed through the stair and elevator court in the tower. So okay. the, the sixth floor, the top of the fifth floor. So the sixth floor is publicly, or not publicly accessible. It's accessible by the building tenants. And then they'll be able to go out to the roof deck from there. Okay. So the entire ground plane is publicly accessible and then this space will be dedicated for the residents, both indoor and outdoor space. All right, great. So that adds another bit of green space, even though it's it's kind of more resident oriented, but still it's kind of nice to have that lower level open and then the upper space as well. Exactly, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Alderman Burnett, would you like to speak? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, as the councilman mentioned, uh, they did meet with the three community organizations in, in that area, West Loop Gate, West Central Association. And now uh, we did have a community meeting that was hosted by uh, the West Loop Gate. Um, didn't have any opposition. Uh, the community appreciate the open space. Uh, we appreciate the efforts of getting to the 30% affordable housing. I think this would be great. Uh, we're working with the development team to make sure that the contractors have a joint venture with a minority contractor and they committed to hiring people from the community. Um, this will um, uh, en enhance this TIF that's over there. Um, it'll bring more affordable housing to the, to the community. I think this is a great uh, development. Uh, appreciate them working with planning to come up with this unique design and offering all this open space. We think it's beautiful. Um, I support it, the community support it, and we ask for this committee support. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Reyes. Just very briefly, I, I want to echo what Commissioner Cox mentioned and Commissioner Burnett in terms of this is a model project for the design and for the commitment to affordable housing, as all the units are being provided on site, this can be done. And a significant number of the units are at 60% AMI. So this makes me very happy. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, Commissioner Reyes. Commissioner Nevada. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add on, on the affordable housing note, this is an example of We've talked about this a couple times when, when when you heard earlier, I think it was in February, about our commitment in the Fulton Market Innovation District to try to get to 30% affordability in this area. Here's an example where, again, the developer is saying <clears throat> that they commit with, to work with us to try to get to that goal, meaning the city will would be picking up that additional 10% to get us to 30. Um, and if for some reason we cannot get to that, um, then they will put all of their units in the building. So just to reinforce what Commissioner Reyes was saying, that um, that, that is what 
the conclusion that we've come here. Well, and to, to Commissioner Reyes's point, it can be done. So lots of really nice features um, with this development. So we, we thank you. Do I have a motion on the proposed residential business plan development submitted by 1201 West Fulton Partners LLC for the property generally located at 1215 West Fulton Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. Moved so by moved. Commissioner Shaw. Oh, uh, seconded by Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Um, Roll call vote. Commissioner Biagi. Commissioner yes. Brumfeld, Sorry. You. I got it. Commissioner Brumfeld? Yes. Commissioner Burnett is a recusal. Commissioner Fuller is a yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. We did have a conversation. Oh, hold on. Commissioner Flores, Commissioner Garza? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Moore Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Nevada. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner is a yes. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Commissioner Villegas. Yes. Commissioner Wegespot. Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. much. Next item on the agenda is D7, a proposed business plan development submitted by 917 West Fulton Partners, LLC, for the property generally located at 917 West Fulton Market Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from C1-1 and C1-2, which is neighborhood commercial district, to DX-5, downtown mixed use district, and then to a business plan development. The applicant proposes to construct an 11 story, 130, excuse me, 153 feet, four inch tall building with ground floor commercial space and office use above and renovate an existing six story, 87 foot tall building to accommodate ground floor commercial or office space with office space above. The entire project will contain 111 accessory vehicular parking spaces and 73 bicycle parking spaces. A 3.1 floor area ratio bonus will be taken and the overall FAR of the plan development will be 8.1. This also is, the tw is in the 27th ward. Joshua Son, and we think your video, your audio now is fixed, will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Thank you. Um, again, good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, my name is Joshua Sun with the Department of Planning and Development. This proposed development is generally located at 917, <coughs> excuse me, West Fulton Market, and is located within the near west side community area within the 27th Ward. The applicant, Fulton Street Companies, and their development team appear here today for the purposes of establishing a business plan development at the subject site. Uh, the request is being submitted as a mandatory plan development application pursuant to section 17-8-512 due to the fact that the proposed building will exceed 150 feet in height in the proposed underlying DX-5 downtown mixed use district and the proposal will utilize the neighborhood opportunity fund bonus to increase the maximum allowable FAR of the development from a base FAR of 5 to an FAR of 8.1. The subject site is located in the near west side community area where less than half of the population, approximately 42.5%, is aged 20 to 34. The proposed project is located on the block bounded on the north by West Fulton Market Street, to the west by North Sangamon Street, to the east by North Peoria Street, and to the south by West Lake Street. New construction is proposed for the western half of the block, right here, as you can see with my cursor. Uh, abutting North Sangamon Street, and renovations are proposed for the existing building at the corner of West Lake and North Peoria Street, the cursor is. Uh, the northeastern portion of the block is not part of the proposed development. Uh, this provides an idea of the project site, noted by the star, in relation to the Morgan Street CTA stop, the landmark district, and other amenities. The site highlighted in burnt orange is currently zoned C1-1 and C1-2 and will be unified under a DX-5 zoning district prior to establishing a business plan development. The site is located approximately 450 feet away from the Morgan Street station and is located near three bus lines, the 65 along Grand Street, the eight on Halstead, 
and the 20 along Chicago. The site is currently surrounded by previously industrial buildings that have been redeveloped or are currently being redeveloped. Given its location within the historic district, the historic Fulton Randolph Market Landmark District, many of the adjacent buildings have been converted from industrial uses and renovated to accommodate today's uses, such as commercial, retail and restaurant uses, and office uses, as evidenced by these photographs. While the subject site is located within the landmark district and required and is required to meet specific design guidelines, buildings across this section of Peoria are and therefore not required to meet the same requirements. The examples of this uh, upper left-hand corner image. Uh, with that said, I will turn it over to Mr. Chris Leach with the applicant team to discuss the project timeline and subsequent slides. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, this is Chris Leach. Can you hear me, uh, Chairwoman? We can hear you, but uh, but we could use a little bit of volume on you. On, on you. All right. Thank you very much. That's Is better. That better. A little better, yeah. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Cordova and Plan Commissioners. My name is Chris Leach. I'm pleased to represent the applicant 917 West Fulton Partners LLC this afternoon, and we want to thank you for your time for letting us present to you. Uh, this project has been vetted extensively with Alderman Burnett and with the community. In addition to the community meetings uh, hosted by Alderman Burnett and by the Wilco Community Organization, we have also had two other meetings with the West Central Association, the neighbors of West Loop, and also with the West Loop Community Organization. And, it, and finally, this project has also received unanimous approval of, from the Permit Review Committee of the Commission on Land uh, Chicago Landmarks on July 1st 2020, earlier this month, since it is located within the Fulton Market Randolph District. With me today, I have also Alex Najum and Ross Bible um, on behalf of the uh, applicant, and also our architectural team consists of Lucas Basada, Yuli Castillo, and Mike Groin, and our um, traffic engineer, Kelly Conlon. With that, I'll turn it over to Lucas Posada to go to take you through the architectural presentation of the pr uh, proposed development. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Hello again. Um, again, for the record, I'm Lucas Posada with Morris Adjuring Architects. Um, slightly different team here, different project, different location. Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll see how uh, with different contexts and a different type of project, we end up with something that is equally as contextual, even though it's a very different interpretation. Um, we're joined here by a, a great team to answer whatever questions you may have. Um, and I'd like to just start by showing some of the project history um, that you can see on this slide. Uh, we've been uh, going through this, this process for a while now. And again, similar input from uh, community groups, stakeholders, uh, Alderman Burnett, um, and DPD and landmark staff that I think has uh, landed us with the project at the bottom right hand of your screen, uh, which we are very, very excited about. And as you heard from uh, Chris, received unanimous landmarks uh, approval and recommendation. Um, so again, thanks to Alderman Burnett and to all the community groups, to Noah, Larry, uh, Josh, for uh, your support and uh, your instrumental role in this process. Next slide, please. Uh, the project closely adheres to the West Loop design guidelines and the Fulton Randolph uh, Market Historic District design guidelines because it's inside the historic district. Next slide, please. Uh, we have paid close attention to the specific West Loop design guidelines, such as preserving and enhancing the street walls, as well as other design excellence guidelines, such as integrating on-site historic buildings in a complementary manner and respecting the urban authenticity of the historic buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, our guidelines have followed, um, other guidelines we have followed include lining the ground floor of backward uses, having readily identifiable entrances, providing a ground floor scale that's consistent with adjacent buildings, and stepping the base to be compatible in height with adjacent historic structures. Next slide, please. Uh, because we are in the Fulton Randolph Market Historic District, we looked very closely at neighboring listed buildings inside the district for design cues. Um, and we have interpreted that through massing, materials, facade details, such as the stepped facades, which are commonly found in the district. 
And we've tried to do this in a way that's referential, but not literal. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a site plan uh, that describes the, the project in whole. Um, it, this shows how the building aligns and continues the street wall of adjacent buildings. There are several outdoor terraces created as the building steps up and sets back. Um, this is a commercial office building. It's, and so uh, that would create outdoor space for the building uh, occupants. And you'll see as we get into the next slide that there's a ground floor publicly accessible uh, connection that connects from Lake Street at the south all the way to uh, West Fulton Street at the north, which is publicly accessible and anticipated to be lined with active retail uses that could activate that, that ground floor space. Um, loading, receiving, and service areas are to the west of the site along Sagamon Street. And um, that allows the rest of the uh, ground floor to be active uses. Uh, parking and services are anticipated to be below grade where there are 80 new parking stalls and 31 existing parking stalls under the 900 West Lake uh, historic structure at the southeast corner of the site. So you'll see as we go up the building that the, um, the new construction and the existing building can occur, uh, integrate as one uh, through a series of walkways. Uh, part of the intervention, which you'll see in some later slides in, in greater detail, is this atrium that occurs at the south end of the site, uh, which creates some space on the inside, even though the buildings are seemingly connected from the exterior. Um, it creates space between the new and uh, existing structure, and there's just a slight intervention with uh, a series of bridges. And then you see as we climb up the building, a series of outdoor step terraces and the building receding back. So those setbacks uh, reduce the perceived bulk of the building and do that in a way that's uh, sensitive to the existing historic structure in the district. Uh, this is the south elevation along West Lake Street. Um, a special note are how the base level, which is rendered in brick, the upper levels are rendered in metal, and the uh, structure and articulation gets lighter as you go up the building. And then at the base of the building, we're doing that in masonry, which is uh, sensitive and sympathetic to the existing historic structure and those base elements align with the historic uh, 910 West Lake Street building at uh, the right uh, side of your screen. Uh, this is the Sagamon Street elevation, which shows how the building steps down uh, along the north side or the left side of your screen to address the lower scale historic buildings uh, on that corner. And mid block, you have an articulated uh, building entrance, which uh, helps identify the entrance and helps call that out. Next slide, please. This is the, uh, the north elevation along West Fulton Market. Again, the main entrance is articulated. Uh, ground floor is uh, defined and detailed with uh, uh, retail storefronts, glass and metal canopies. Um, and the stepping is deferential to the uh, existing historic uh, structures in the district and on that corner. This is a building section through the south end of the site. So through that atrium showing the new construction on the right and the existing building on the left and how the bridges allow us to have minimal intervention on the historic structure. And then a skylight brings in light and creates an atrium atmosphere um, and an interesting active space. So this is a long section uh, through, through that, which shows the uh, publicly accessible connection all the way from Lake Street on the left to Fulton Market on the right. And in the area where the, um, the new construction is adjacent to the historic structure, the atrium creates space and creates a series of uh, uh, very sensitive interventions to the existing historic structure. Next slide. Uh, the next couple slides are a series of streetscape elevations that again, give you the context for the uh, district as a whole um, and how the building sits into that context. And then uh, projects that are either approved or proposed or under construction are shown um, and color coded there for your reference. Next slide. Uh, this is an aerial view that shows the building in context, again, with the uh, existing context and then with the projects that are either proposed, completed, recently completed, um, under construction, approved, or, or currently proposed. So this is a view that's been very important for us. It's that iconic uh, moment and that um, point in the project that we feel is really the identity and the personality and, and that important corner. That's the corner of Fulton Market and Sagamon. Uh, the building steps down and creates a series of outdoor recessed terraces. 
Uh, the scale of the four floors at this corner, we think is uh, in scale and respectful to the existing historic fabric and contextual fabric in the district, um, while also creating outdoor space for the tenants. And uh, here from this point of view, you really don't actually see the 11th floor of the uh, office building uh, because of the deep setbacks that we have that allow the massing to be, uh, the perceived massing is much lower and respectful to the existing historic uh, fabric. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows from the northeast corner, the intersection of Fulton and Peoria. Again, it shows the richness of the facade and how we continue the articulation and the detailing even along the party uh, lines. And then here you can see the penthouse at the 11th floor. Next slide, please. This is a southwest view from the intersection of Lake and Sagamon. Here we see how the base floor is perfectly aligned with the historic building at 900 Lake. The uh, masonry and metal lower portion and the uh, metal and glass upper portion. Next slide, please. Uh, the following are a series of zoomed in views of the facade details, starting here with the ground floor storefront. Um, these would be your typical retail entrances, which you can see a plan view, an elevation view, a reference image of the types of uh, deep canopies that we have that are um, uh, typical of this district and, um, and some more details here in the axon view. Next slide, please. This is a detail of that typical building entrance that would lead you to the ground floor passage to the atrium. And we've um, emphasized that with metal surround, a different shape to give that a, a visible and iconic moment um, for the place where most building users are gonna be coming in and out of the building. Next slide, please. This is a enlarged bay view of the typical lower portion. So the brick masonry uh, portion floors one through six, um, which shows the depth of the facade, the brick piers, the way that they're articulated with a combination of brick and metal um, as you climb up the building. This is the typical upper portion, which is metal and glass and has similar rhythm, similar articulation, but the building structure gets a little bit lighter as you climb up the building until you get to the eventual 11th floor penthouse, which is uh, a much more uh, simplified articulation. Um, the next couple slides get into some more details about some of the um, nuts and bolts. Uh, this is about the transportation, traffic, and parking. Uh, again, the uh, parking and uh, loading access are on the west side of uh, Sagamon, and then parking and um, parking is below grade, allowing us to uh, allow for active uses on, on the ground floor. Uh, we worked with the traffic consultant who's here are, uh, to answer any questions that you may have. Um, but all of the recommendations from the traffic studies, traffic impact studies have been integrated into the latest site plan. Um, these are some more details again about the urban design guidelines and the zoning code compliance and the way in which our design addresses some of that. This slide speaks to the setbacks, uh, which we are uh, exceeding the required setbacks. Um, so we're setting back more than what is required. Um, and on the right hand side, it shows some of the different steps and how those steps on that northwest corner uh, relate to some of the existing heights of the, of the uh, immediate context. Uh, this is a slide about the, the atrium and that connection uh, and the way that you can see the historic structure on the right hand side and the way that the bridges would allow for a minimal intervention um, on, uh, at the historic structure. This slide is about the material palette, which uh, we're really excited about. We think it's really uh, really nice palette on the top of your screen, which is a combination of proposed brick cladding for levels one through six, uh, metal cladding in a bronze sort of tone for levels uh, five through 11, and how uh, that works together. And then on the bottom of your screen are images from the district, um, which show how this palette will really kind of blend in with some of that character uh, and some of those buildings that are there and contribute to that richness of the, of the district. Next slide, please. We might have gone. Oh, yeah, we're here. Uh, so the materiality uh, meets the requirements of the zoning code, uh, specifically as it relates to treating all of the visible and public facades with uh, high quality materials and finishes. Uh, this slide is about our uh, sustainable uh, development policy and strategy. 
uh, which is to meet lead silver and well certification. Uh, we think especially as it relates to uh, a post-COVID world, the integration of um, uh, very high quality uh, air filtration and air quality standards, which is what the well certification is all about, as well as the ample open space that allows office users to get natural air and natural uh, daylight and have access to open space, we think is, is really important. So we're excited about those strategies. Next slide. Um, this slide is about the, the stormwater management policy, uh, which we need. Uh, we need the requirements and uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have about that. Um, and with that, Chris, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to talk about the economic and community benefits. And again, thank you all for your time. Thank you very much, Lucas. Um, this, uh, this project is a $250 million investment in the West Loop and will we'll generate uh, approximately 250 to 300 uh, construction jobs and will uh, bring or retain approximately 1,500 to 2,000 office and retail jobs. It also will make a contribution to the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund in a little over uh, four point, in, in excess of $4.5 million. And most importantly, in my opinion anyway, is the rehabilitation and reuse of the contributing landmark building in this uh, historic district. I'll turn it back over to Joshua to let him wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant, and we have concluded that the proposed development would be appropriate for the following reasons. The proposal is in general conformance with the Fulton Randolph Market District design guidelines. It gives priority to the adaptive reuse of an historic building. It promotes economically beneficial development patterns that are compatible with the character of the existing neighborhood. All sides and areas of the buildings that are visible to the public are to be treated with materials, finishes, and architectural details that are of, higher, that are, that are of high quality. Uh, it provides a building orientation and massing that promotes pedestrian programming and reinforces desirable urban features found within the surrounding area. Lastly, copies of this application have been circulated to other city departments and agencies and no comments have been received which have not been addressed. Please refer to my staff report for the for further details regarding this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the zoning administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that this application be to establish a business plan development be approved and forwarded to the city council committee on zoning, landmarks and building standards as such. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sunk. Alderman Burnett. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is a unique building. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Commissioner Cox for uh, meeting with this developer and helping him to get it off the ground. Uh, the developer came to us and said he had an end user that wanted to come over there and uh, he needed to get this building going and uh, Commissioner Cox worked with him. Uh, he worked with the uh, planning department on the design. Uh, he worked with all of the community organizations. Coincidentally, uh, our first community meeting, uh, the community did not, uh, they didn't like the design as it was. The developer went that back to the table and he satisfied uh, some of the community's concerns at the same time, uh, stand in line with the expectations of planning. Uh, so I thank the developer for uh, his patience and uh, his tenacity. Uh, also a uh, developer also uh, commit to working with the community as far as uh, minority participation and, and contracting and also with jobs. Um, so with that, I support it, my community support it, I ask that this committee, this body supports it also. Thank you. Great, and uh, Mr. Leach, I, I'm inclined to agree with you on how important it is that the historic building is being saved and, and really nicely integrated into the design of the newer building. So um, the two projects really reflect a, some really interesting, exciting um, design and um, and has been pointed out, it's very compatible with the character of the, of the neighborhood. So with that, can I get a motion please on the proposed business plan development submitted by 917 West Fulton Partners LLC for the property generally located at 917 West Fulton Market Street, finding that meets the requirements for approval. 
Moved by Commissioner Shaw. Moved by Commissioner Shaw, seconded by? Uh, seconded by Commissioner Cox. Thank you, Commissioners. Commissioner Biagi. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner uh, Burnett is recusing himself. Commissioner Forza was a yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner uh, Garza? Yes, yes. Commissioner Lyons, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner, uh, thank Commissioner Novada? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Commissioner Viegas. Yes. And Commissioner Vegas Buck. Yes. Great. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. 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 Uh, it's a yes, but I do want to say I think um, Butler Adams' points about um, reviewing the design guidelines are in order. Um, I think, you know, we kind of have to mix or mesh the, you know, historic guidelines with the guidelines of construction in the 21st century. And I feel like this building looked better back in February of 2020. <laughs> than in my view looks today. So I know I'm probably not the in the majority here, but I just think, um, you know, guidelines can make things um, water down, so to speak. So I would, I would pref really like to see those guidelines reviewed again. Commissioner Searle, I'm glad you remember that because I caught that, that comment too from Mr. Adams. Um, I'm wondering uh, whether or not, um, you might have a follow-up conversation with Commissioner Cox and Alderman Burnett or and Alderman slash Commissioner Burnett um, on that to, to, uh, to see what, uh, to, 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 to launch that conversation. What was the year that that was initially passed, those guidelines? 2017. Okay, so we, we may be due for that. Commissioner Cox, were you gonna make a comment? Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think, that's, uh, I think that's a very, very relevant comment when those guidelines were commissioned, uh, I think there was a, a do no harm uh, attitude uh, about the creation of the Fulton Market District. And so you see, I think we could take all of the buildings that have been done since those guidelines have been adopted and we can get a scan of whether they have actually created a climate of innovation or they have created a climate uh, that makes sure nothing bad happens. And I have a feeling that we will probably find that they have been successful in making sure uh, nothing bad happens, but they have not necessarily been a tool for innovation. So if we are at a place now where we are ready, uh, the market is mature enough uh, to take some risk uh, and turn the Fulton market, not just into a, a real estate juggernaut, but as a true zone of design innovation, then I, we, we, the planning department gladly accepts that assignment. Uh, perhaps with the new committee on design, we could get some assistance in that, but I, I, we hear you loud and clear. I wasn't here when the guidelines were adopted, but I think um, you know, Commissioner Searle's point is extremely well taken. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Flotis, were you gonna uh, register a vote? Uh, hold on, Commissioner can, uh, Alderman Burnett. Uh, oh, hey, Alderman. Uh, so, and I appreciate that too, uh, but we just got to keep in mind, you know, the uh, Fulton Market Design Guidelines um, was put together with the community input. Uh, so a lot of people from the community uh, had some input in those guidelines, uh, went through an exercise. And I would anticipate if we were to um, enhance the guidelines or change the guidelines, we would have to go back to that again. Um, so just keep that in mind um, because uh, people's expectations are already set. Very important. And not just go back to them at the end of that process, but to involve them through the process. Yeah, um, they, they, they gave a lot of input into the guidelines. Yeah. 
Fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Uh, Commissioner Flores, were you just going to register your vote or are you going to make a comment? We're not able to hear you. You're off mute, but for some reason we can't hear you. Um, something, something, no, you're, you're, you were off mute. Something with your microphone is enabling us to hear you. No, sorry. Sucks. Commissioner Flores, your microphone, you might have selected the wrong microphone. Um, can you, uh, can you email her and work with her on getting her microphone fixed so she can speak? That might be why she hasn't been voting too. She might be think, thinking she's voting and we haven't heard her. Yes. Commissioner Flores, if you want to also leave the meeting and join back in again, that sometimes resolves the issue. Thank you very much. All right, so on to the next one then. Next item on the agenda is DA to proposed amendment to residential business plan development number 896, submitted by LR Abla LLC for the property generally located at 1002 South Racine Avenue, 1257 West Roosevelt Road, 1357 West Roosevelt Road, and 1322 West Taylor Street. The applicant proposed to change the zoning designation from residential business plan development number 896 to residential business plan development number 896 as amended. The applicant proposes the construction of a new six story building containing 67 residential units, ground floor commercial uses, and a minimum of 33 parking spaces located at 1002 South Racine. A new six story building containing 70 residential units and a minimum of 40 parking spaces located at 1257 West Roosevelt a new six-story building containing 70 residential units and a minimum of 40 parking spaces located at 1357 West Roosevelt and the rehabilitation of building located at 1322 West Taylor into 15 residential units and the National Public Housing Museum along with the surface parking lot containing a minimum of 37 parking spaces. This is in both the 28th and the 25th wards. Ernest Bellamy will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Mr. Bellamy. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman Cardova and members of the commission. For the record, my name is Ernest Bellamy with the Department of Planning and Development. This application covers developments across various sites, uh, 1002 South Racine, 1257 and 1357 West Roosevelt Road, and 925 South Atta Street. The subject site is located within the 25th and 28th wards, uh, the near west side community area and the Roosevelt Racing uh, TIF district. Also on today's meeting are the applicant team, their architects, as well as the executive director of the National Public Housing Museum, Dr. Lisa Lee. As part of the amendment uh, for this phase of work, the applicant is proposing the following, a new six-story uh, building containing 67 residential units uh, with ground floor commercial uses and a minimum of 33 parking spaces at 1002 South Racine, two new six-story buildings containing 70 units of, of residential apiece with a minimum of 40 parking spaces at 1257 and 1357 West Roosevelt Road, and the rehabilitation of the building located at uh, 925 South Atta and 215 units of uh, residential and the National Public Housing Museum, uh, along with a surface parking lot uh, containing a minimum of 37 parking spaces. Located on the near west side, located on the near west side in the near west side community area, uh, as a snapshot of the area, uh, the near west side demographics break down as follows, 41% uh, white, 28% black, 19% Asian, and 9% Hispanic and Latino, or Latino. Uh, current median income uh, is around $91,125, uh, whereas 25% uh, of the household incomes in the neighborhood are under $25,000. Uh, dollars and 26% of the household incomes in the neighborhood are over $150,000. Additionally, 83% of the neighborhood has one car or less. 
The PD is formerly the site of CHA's Abla Homes and redeveloped as Roosevelt Square beginning in 2004. The northern portion of Roosevelt Square is located in Chicago's Little Italy neighborhood. The planning context for the development has been informed by the plan for transformation uh, moving, moving to work uh, by the CHA and HUD uh, back in 2000, as well as the, the Greater Roosevelt Square planning for the future uh, by CHA in 2016. The immediate redevelopment sites as part of this phase are shown in red here. The subject areas are surrounded by uh, low and moderate density residential uses and encompasses portions of the Little Italy neighborhood. The IMD is located just west of the immediate boundary of the PD and UIC is located just to the east of the PD boundary. Additionally, the PD is adjacent to the West Loop community area to the north and the Pilsen community area to the south. Transit access to the immediate development sites are as follows, 1257 West Roosevelt and 1357 West Roosevelt uh, road sites are serviced by uh, the CTA bus route number 12. Uh, the uh, 1002 South Racine site is served by uh, CTA bus routes number 60 and 157. And the 925 South Atta site is served by CTA bus route 157. Uh, both these sites reside uh, both the sites of uh, 1002 South Racine and, and 925 South Atta uh, reside just outside the Taylor Street uh, pedestrian street designations. However, through the process of through the process of uh, this amendment, the applicant has been working with uh, Alderman Irvin and his office to achieve a Peace Street ordin ordinance for the current gap of coverage along the corridor. The ordinance is research drafted and moving through the legislative process parallel to the plan development. The following are some aerial views of the surrounding sites. Here you can see six and three story surrounding context of 1257 and 1357 West Roosevelt Road sites. Next along the Taylor Street corridor is the surrounding three and four story mixed use context of 1002 South Racine. And lastly, further down the Taylor Street corridor, we can see the surrounding three, five, and seven story context of uh, around the 925 South Addis Street site uh, at the last remaining building of the Jane Adams homes. In order to allow the, for the full development of the Jane Adams homes building, the PD amendment also covers a change in the sub area uh, boundaries and bulk table for sub area D. From here, I'll hand, it, hand over the presentation to Michael Kaplan of Related Midwest to continue the presentation. Thank you, Ernest, and uh, thank you, commissioners. My name is Michael Kaplan with Related Midwest. I'm joined by Don Bernacki and Kurt ba Bailey, Executive Vice President and President of Related Midwest, as well as our consultants who are available for questions. That includes Rich Clowder and Katie Janky Dale with DLA Piper, Gabi Jakevich with DesignBridge, Renald Mitchell with Moody Nolan, Pete Landon with Landon Bone Baker, Alan Truthart with Harley Ellis Devereaux, and Lisa Lee with the National Public Housing Museum. <clears throat> so although the timeline before you starts in March of this year, I just want to point out that work on this phase goes back at least six years, starting with uh, the master framework plan that Ernest mentioned. Uh, which included several large and small format stakeholder meetings to align the community's wants and needs with those of the CHA, who of course is the landowner here. Specifically, the plan suggested building on highly visible vacant lots between existing buildings to help the neighborhood feel more complete and provide a sense of forward momentum for the community. This of course started with the Taylor Street Library project and is continuing here with three new mid-rise buildings and the completion of the National Public Housing Museum. The partnership of the CHA, Department of Housing, and both aldermen has been tremendous here. And um, with three community meetings, we were able to take in a lot of valuable input that has led to what we believe will be a very impactful project to the community at large. Next slide, please. 
Again, you can see the boundaries of PD 896, which was set up for the redevelopment of the Abla homes. Next slide. And in the spirit of the master framework plan, all four new buildings are located on infill sites on Taylor Street and Roosevelt Road. Um, so to start, let's go to the two on Roosevelt Road. Uh, you can go to the next slide. These are designed by DesignBridge, an emerging MBE architect that we've worked with for many years. Uh, these are 60 sister apartment um, buildings with 70 units each. Next slide. The ground floor is programmed with uh, entrances on the northwest corner of each and social and fitness areas that extend across the front of the building to activate the street. There's both indoor and outdoor parking, totaling 40 spaces, uh, which is a ratio that's consistent with actual utilization across Roosevelt Square. Next slide. Shown here is the 1257 West Roosevelt Building. Uh, the intent is to deliver a modern but timeless aesthetic uh, with a pattern in the facade that breaks up the length of the building as recommended by the Department of Planning. Next slide. Here's a view looking northeast. Uh, and again, you can, I think you can skip next two slides. And shown here is the 1357 West Roosevelt building. Again, the intent was to build sister buildings rather than identical twins. So the program and palette is the same, uh, but the expression is varied. Each building will include 29 units for CHA families, 20 for low to moderate income families, uh, and the remaining 21 in each will be unrestricted market rate units. Next slide. Again, the, uh, the northeast uh, view of the building. Next slide. And this gives a sense of um, the, the activation of the street. Again, there's uh, fitness uh, and some maintenance and office space on either end. And then in the middle where the parking is, I think the architect uh, really put forth a strong effort to create interest um, so that it's not just a blank wall of parking. Next slide. Um, the third building is located at the corner of Taylor and Racine. Next slide. And this is a mixed use building with 67 apartments and about 10,000 square feet of retail along with 33 parking spaces. Next slide. The building is designed by a team of Moody Nolan and Landon Bone Baker and seeks to tie into the neighborhood context uh, with a three with a three story brick component along Racine that wraps the corner and then extends along Taylor Street as retail. Using the library as a model, the mid rise section is set back off the street uh, and, and although hard to see here, um, it actually runs at a slight angle away from the street as you move west. Next slide. Here's, here's another angle, next slide. Uh, and this shows the retail from a pedestrian level. Um, we're excited to share that we have a lease signed with a lo local grocer. Um, the store will include fresh meat and produce, a deli, coffee bar and bakery, full line of vegan products, uh, fresh baked bread, as well as gluten-free, organic and conventional groceries. Next slide. Uh, and this is the fourth building uh, moving, moving down west on Taylor Street. Uh, and this building being a partnership with the National Public Housing Museum. Uh, we'll be restoring the exterior as part of this phase and bringing 15 units in the north half of the building. Um, and then handing the south half back to the museum to complete their interior build out and open to the community. Here's the site plan showing the split of the two uses. The museum entry will be off Ada Street and the residential entries will be in their original locations on the north side of the building. Next slide. So restoration of this building will, uh, we think significantly improve the look and feel of Taylor Street. Uh, we commend the museum team uh, and Land and Bone Baker for their truly exceptional plan to repurpose what is the lone remaining structure from the original Jane, Adam, Jane Adams homes. And then the 15 units uh, designed by Harley Ellis Devereaux will tie in with the Roosevelt Square project and uh, homes will be split equally between CHA families, workforce and market rate families. 
can go to the next slide. Uh, perhaps tough to read, but uh, this slide shows that all buildings will achieve the thresholds set in the Chicago Sustainable Development Policy. And as shown on the following slide, uh, will serve all members of the community regardless of income. So including the library building, which we consider the first part of this phase, the overall phase three unit mix sets aside 40% of all units for CHA families, 25% of units for moderate income families between 60 and 80% AMI, and the remaining 35% for market rate families. Go to the next slide. In total, this is about a $100 million investment in the community. It will lead to new homes uh, for all residents, uh, or for residents of all backgrounds. Um, and as part of the project, we'll also be undertaking a significant rehab of 184 existing affordable housing units um, that we developed as part of the first phase. And the neighborhood market, uh, of course, will be an amenity to the entire community, providing access to healthy food options while creating an estimated 10 full and part-time jobs. And then lastly, before turning it over, I wanted to touch on equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is something that we uh, take very seriously at Related. Um, you go to the next slide. We have self-imposed goals to increase participation of minorities uh, on, on virtually everything we build and expect to achieve uh, really unprecedented levels of inclusion on this project, uh, hopefully setting a new standard for the industry. Next slide. The project architecture and engineering team is nearly 75% minority or women owned with minority led design firms for all three mid-rise buildings. Next slide. And the GC for the mid-rise buildings is B3 Group, which is a 100% minority owned joint venture composed of three MBE firms, BOA Construction, Brown and Moman, and Blackwood Group uh, with support um, from MIKK construction on the rehab of the existing buildings. Work at the National Public Housing Museum will be led by GMA Construction, an MB, MBE firm uh, led by Cornelius Griggs, who actually grew up in Chicago's public housing system. Next slide. Uh, and I think that concludes my portion, so I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Ernest. Um, Thank you, Michael. So uh, in conclusion, the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the material submitted by the applicant, and we have concluded that the proposed development would be appropriate for the following. The proposed plan develop, development encourages unified planning and development. Uh, it promotes uh, economically beneficial development patterns that are compatible with the character of existing neighborhoods. It promotes uh, transit, pedestrian, and bicycle use, ensures accessibility for persons with disabilities, and minimizes conflicts uh, with existing traffic patterns. The buildings promote active street frontage, frontages uh, with proposed uh, building edges up to the street frontage, providing large transparent storefront windows. And it provides adequate uh, bicycle and vehicle parking while minimizing the adverse visual impact of any off-street parking areas. Both Alderman Irvin and Alderman Sicho Lopez are supportive of this project and have provided support letters. Uh, please uh, refer to uh, uh, my staff report for any uh, further details regarding this project and the plans identified here today. Thank you. Uh, Alderman, uh, thank you. Alderman um, Irwin, you're, you're, I see Irvin, I see that you're here. Um, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say about this project. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, again, this uh, is the continuation of development at Roosevelt Square. Um, just a couple of years ago, we finished the uh, first uh, uh, series of buildings that haven't been done in probably the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, that culminated with the new library and additional uh, affordable housing uh, for former CHA residents. And uh, basically it was a kickstart back to the Roosevelt Square project. This, uh, these three buildings plus the rehab of the additional uh, units, I'm sorry, four buildings plus the rehab of the additional units 
uh, is another step in that direction of, of working to return a residence back to those properties as well as provide affordable and market rate uh, residential housing. I want to just uh, thank the uh, developers uh, and related uh, for uh, listening to the concerns of the community and working with the uh, for sale component of this, is, which was something that uh, was very uh, near and dear to the community, as well as the, uh, the team that has been put together uh, to be general contractors. I think this is probably the first time we've seen such a, a group uh, at this level for this type of a dollar amount. Uh, in our city and as Dave stated, uh, hopefully uh, becomes the blueprint of how to move this uh, type of uh, work forward for uh, MBE contractors. And in this case, we have pretty much uh, an African-American uh, lead contractor uh, on the west side of Chicago, one of which uh, was in uh, was former CHA resident. So all of these pieces together, this is a great story. Uh, we think that this is a way we can develop in the future and we look forward uh, to the to the favorable recommendation of, from the plan commission. Thank you. Uh, anyone have any questions? I'm, I'm uh, available for questions. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Commissioner Nevada. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I just also wanted to throw in my uh, enthusiasm for this development. Uh, it is one that the Department of Housing is supporting with low income housing tax credits, but. Um, more than that, I think I'm, I'm also just very excited about being able to see the story, the history of public housing really solidified in this museum and the fact that we were able to work with Related and the Chicago Housing Authority uh, to bring housing back to that one original remaining building of the Avalon complex is just really, really exciting. And so my thanks uh, to the National Public Housing Museum too, which has just been uh, in there for the long haul, getting uh, this museum off the ground. And, and so we're really excited to be able to bring housing back to that original site, to that original building, as well as these um, the other new buildings that you heard about just now. So um, Related's done a great job, as the alderman said, um, the, this level of MBE contracting is exactly uh, the standard. And in our new round uh, that we just put out for tax credits, we noted that this is the kind of thing we're looking for. So we appreciate them being out ahead of even the round we're just doing um, with this kind of example. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lyons, followed by Commissioner Brownfield. Uh, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to the team um, for your presentation. Um, I echo what um, uh, Commissioner Navarra said, and um, I also just wanted to highlight, I really appreciate um, the slide about the economic and community benefits, um, sort of outlining the different partners and programs. Um, I know we don't have enough time to probably go into everything that you're doing, but I just was particularly excited to see higher 360s participation. Um, no surprise there, but um, I know doing great work there. And um, so thank you for including that in your presentation as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Brumfeld. I'll, I'll keep my comments brief. I just um, just want to say I'm just excited to see the next phase of development uh, happening at Roosevelt Square. Uh, we all know how uh, challenging uh, a number of the mixed income housing projects have uh, have been in terms of just advancing. So it's just great to see this uh, next phase coming online. Uh, congratulations to Midwest, uh, related Midwest uh, National Public Housing Museum, of course, uh, the excellent design team of Moody Nolan and Landon Bone Baker. I'm just really uh, thankful to see this next uh, piece advance and finally uh, moving ahead with the one remaining building that is uh, uh, going to be the uh, Public Housing Museum. So just thank you and congratulations. Fantastic, thank you. Commissioner Reyes. Sorry, I'm trying. I'm, I was trying to unmute myself. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, just briefly, uh, again, uh, a green team, I mean, a great team of uh, a developer, uh, excited to see the diversity, in particular, excited to see Blackwood as being part of the general contractor team. Uh, again, it can be done. Um, and I will only request that since this is my kind of neighborhood, I walk by these uh, properties on a daily basis. I, I enjoy the beauty of the SOS Village, brand new building every single morning. Um, so I just wanna ask if there is uh, an, uh, uh, 
proactive effort to reach out to the Latino community that is right on the other side of the viaduct, because these are amazing housing opportunities at the level of CHA public housing and at the level of affordable and why not market rates. So that will be my only request. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Cox. Well, while we're waiting for Commissioner Cox, let me... Um... Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> I was on mute, my apologies. Well, go ahead. Um, uh, no, I was just going to um, uh, continue the, the, the theme of, um, of commending the development team, uh, the architects, the contractors. Uh, th this is really what development uh, should look like. Uh, just quality across the board, uh, taking some risk uh, in terms of uh, the composition of the team uh, and producing something that I think is gonna be pretty singular. Uh, this will be the first uh, national um, museum of public housing uh, in the country. Uh, and that, that uh, Commissioner Navarra, um, you know, and I fought to actually get housing on the site. Uh, I mean, my first months here, it's great to see that happen. So I just wanna commend uh, Related Midwest uh, for setting a model. Uh, it's not every day where the best looking architecture uh, that comes before the commission is actually uh, affordable housing. <laughs> so uh, I wanna make sure that people understand uh, that this is the, the kind of uh, aspiration that we can have for truly uh, integrated um, housing uh, on the south side. So thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner. I'd like to echo all the great things I've said. I'm a huge fan of the National Public Housing Museum. Um, they've really had a sustain, sustained effort and uh, it's really exciting to see that come to, uh, to, uh, to some fruition. So uh, be on the lookout for programming for, from the National Public Housing Museum. Um, did any did anyone here? I know that I don't see that Alderman Sigcho Lopez is here, but is anyone here from his office? I heard it mentioned that we have a letter from him, um, but I don't think we have any from his office. With that, can I get a motion on a proposed amendment to residential business plan development number 896, submitted by LR Abla LLC for the property generally located at 1002 South Racine Avenue? 1257 West Roosevelt Road, 1357 West Roosevelt Road and 1322 West Taylor Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. So moved. Garrison, second by Garrison. Uh, on the first, I was, was Novara. Okay, oh, fantastic. All right, thank you, Commissioner. All right, with that, uh, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Okay. Um, Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Um, Commissioner uh, Grossman. Oh, sorry, she's gone. Like the Lions. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Commissioner Nevada. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Commissioner Villegas? Yes. And Commissioner Wagas, what? All right, very good, thank you. Um, motion passes and congratulations. Everyone. Uh, um, yeah. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. We're, we're, we're excited. Um, Commissioner Flores, now that we have your audio, did, was there something you wanted to say? Just <clears throat> briefly, I just wanted to echo uh, the comments on the uh, revisions to the uh, guidelines for the for the previous uh, two projects. I know that there's going to be a, a, a bigger effort to include the community and uh, probably other committees, but I think it's an important thing to just go back to them and, and maybe um, look for some updates that are necessary. So I just I just wanted to echo that. Great, thank you so much. So just noted that we have Commissioner Searle, Commissioner Flores uh, in particular from the Plan Commission, um, as well as Alderman Burnett who are gonna pay particular interest to looking at these guidelines um, so beyond what might happen in the design review committee. So I don't know if we wanna do a subcommittee or something, but we wanna make sure those three commissioners have some involvement. 
and as Commissioner Alderman, uh, Commissioner Burnett has said in his Alderman role is to make sure that the community in that area has an, is an active participant as that develops, as those changes develop. Right. Reminder that item D9 was deferred. Next item on the agenda is D10, a proposed amendment to the Institutional Plan Development Number 527, submitted by Illuminarium Chicago LLC for the property generally located at 600 Grand Avenue. The applicant proposes to amend Institutional Plan Development Number 527 to allow for commercial uses within the Crystal Garden space at Navy Pier. No changes to the exterior of the building will be made. This is in the 42nd Ward. Emily Thrun will provide the context overview and the applicant will present the proposal. And I'd like also like to note for the record that Commissioner um, Spazzato has joined us. Um, go ahead, uh, Ms. Thrun. Thank you. For the record, my name is Emily Thrun with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant appears here today because they are proposing to amend Institutional Plan Development 527 to allow for commercial uses within the Crystal Garden space at Navy Pier. No changes to the exterior of the building will be made. The subject site is located in the near north side community area. This slide includes some census data about the community area. The project is located on Navy Pier, a major tourist destination in the city. In 2019, the pier had a total of 8.8 .8 million total guests. The location of the subject site for this amendment is in the Crystal Garden space, which is just east of the Family Pavilion and the Chicago Children's Museum. The site is served by numerous CTA bus routes. The site is zoned PD 527 and is within Tract A of the Navy Pier sub area. Surrounding zoning districts include DX-12. This is a closer aerial view of the Crystal Garden space. The proposed project includes the construction of an immersive theater space that would be constructed within the interior of the Crystal Garden space. No changes to the exterior of the pier will be made. The next two slides include images of the existing pedestrian context on the site and the same pedestrian level view of the proposed project. This is a rendered view of the interior, interior volume within the family pavilion, from within the, the family pavilion. And this is a view of the proposed interior volume within the Crystal Gardens looking Northeast. The project is subject to the Centr Chicago Central Area Action Plan that was approved by the Chicago Plan Commission in 2003 and the Central Area Action Plan that was approved by the Chicago Plan Commission in 2009. The document's goals include directing growth to the central area and enhancing the waterfront for residents, workers, and visitors. Now I will turn the presentation over to Mr. Jack George, the applicant's attorney who will further explain the details of the proposal. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and members of the commission. My name is uh, Jack George. I'm an attorney and I'm accompanied by my partner, Kate Duncan. Uh, and uh, we have with us uh, uh, as part of our team this afternoon, Mr. Alan Greenberg, from uh, Illuminarium, and also Mr. Uh, Dan Mitchell from Navy Pier, and also Mr. Nels Golddigger, who is uh, the architect on the project. Uh, as uh, Emily has said, uh, there are no changes to the proposed exterior of Navy Pier. All work is being done just to the interior of Crystal Garden. Uh, what we're seeking to do is the old PD had specific language about Crystal Garden, so we're just changing the PD language to allow this type of entertainment venue. Next slide, please. These next few slides are just slides of improvements that have been made to Navy Pier over the last few years. One shows the Chicago Dock Periscope, which was cost of a $42.25 million investment. The next slide, please. The food expansion in Pier Park, which is also another $45.5 million that was done. The next slide, please. And lastly, the Polk Brothers Fountain and Plaza. Uh, this slide and the next slide both talk about the Polk Brothers uh, contributions. One is 19.5 and the other was 21.5 of improvements that have been made. I would like now to turn this over to Mr. Alan Greenberg from Illuminarium, who will go through and explain this type of new entertainment uh, venue that they're talking about here with their project. And then after that, we'll have the architect go through and explain how the interior is being designed. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. 
And can, if we could keep this section um, relatively short, this would be helpful. That way we can get to the design elements on which we make a, a decision. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chairman. Um, Alan, can you go forward? Yes. Uh, am I on? Yes, you are. You are. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, you know, it's hard for a Southerner to go fast, but I'm going to do my best. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank the uh, Department of Planning and Development and uh, Alderman Riley for spending time with us uh, in advance of, uh, of this presentation today. Um, I'd just like to speak very briefly of what we hope to bring to your great city. Uh, we just opened the world's first Illuminarium in Atlanta a few weeks ago. We plan to open in uh, Las Vegas in December of this year in Miami after that. And we hope that Chicago will be the fourth Illuminarium. Um, we hope to turn um, the, the uh, Crystal Gardens uh, into one of the most important edutainment alternatives in uh, Chicago, something that will be wonderful for the citizens of Chicago as well as tourists coming uh, to your great city. When you walk into an Illuminarium, uh, it's a place that can take you any place. And we have spectacles um, that we present uh, to our customers. This is our Illuminarium in Atlanta that just opened. Um, and um, I'm gonna give you an example of our first spectacle. If you walk into the Illuminarium in Atlanta today, you will go to uh, the wild safari spectacle. You will feel like you have just come to Africa on safari. We take you all over Africa. You really feel like you are there. You see the animals uh, as they are filmed, uh, just as if you were on the savanna at full scale. You hear them through the most sophisticated sound system in the world. You feel them in your bones through the haptic system that's built into our floors. You smell the airs of Africa through our sense systems and you actually can affect this immersive experience through our LIDAR technology. When you walk down the path, you will actually kick up dust. When you step on a puddle, you will uh, actually, uh, ripples will come away from that. So you're really a part of the experience and it just takes your breath away. Our second spectacle that would be coming um, is called Spacewalk, where you walk on the surface of the moon, and actually leave footprints on the surface of the moon. You go to Mars, you're surrounded by the rings of Saturn, the storms of Jupiter, and so forth. Um, what we're proud of at Illuminarium is that we democratize extraordinary experiences. We give people an opportunity to do things that they could only dream about doing. The other day we had the Boys and Girls Club of Atlanta at Illuminarium. Uh, these are children who may never have an opportunity to go on safari. And we, and we educate them, we inspire them, um, we transform them and give them a window into worlds that they can only in some cases dream about. So that's really what we do. Uh, uh, our technology allows us to flip a switch and change our content almost instantly. We also can change it from day to night. In the evening, we can turn the Illuminarium into a wonderful evening experience for adults, as well as to event venues. So if you want to have a wedding in Paris in Chicago, we can do that. Uh, it's a wonderful place for, for celebrations. Um, but this will be, uh, we're uh, you know excited about the potential. I just want to briefly mention the people behind the Illuminarium because I think this is important. In addition to yours truly, and this is um, my fifth company, I've been uh, building schools around the world most recently. Um, we have as our um, content partner, uh, Radical Media, uh, one of the great production companies in the world. Uh, if you watched Hamilton Stream on Disney Plus, you saw um, Radical Media at work. They just won the best of show at Sundance for Summer of Soul and so forth. And then our design partners, the Rockwell Group, who put their uh, fingerprints uh, all over Chicago over the years. Um, uh, David Rockwell is one of the great architects in the world. And then finally, our design, our operations partner is Legends, who operate 150 venues around the world, um, including One World Observatory in New York City, the Shard in London, Wimbledon, um, every Live Nation venue in the United States, and so forth. So you have a lot of expertise in content design and operations. 
I'll turn this over uh, to, to Niels, um, our architect, uh, and uh, I'll be standing by to answer any questions you all may have. But I just want to close by saying what an honor it will be for us to bring a luminarium uh, to your wonderful city. Else, can you get on and yes. through the design? Thank you. I think I just turned myself on. I don't, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So I might ask to back up uh, three slides, please. I will go fast, I promise. Yeah, right there. Thank you. Um, so first, I'm going to show you quickly what a typical luminarium is. And then next, I would move into how we plan to uh, implement that in this very unique building and site. And uh, as Alan mentioned, we've done a lot of projects over the years in Chicago. It's very close to David's uh, heart as well. A couple of recent ones are Virgin Hotels, RPM uh, Seafood Restaurant, Tao Restaurant, and many, many others. But as to Chicago holds a special place for our office. So we're glad to do another project. So on the top left, um, getting into a typical aluminarium, this is the ticketing and lobbying, lobby space which also has a dedicated queuing area since this is a timed or pulse ticketing event, which is the way the operations manages the flow of people and a uh, congregation of people as well. On the top right is our cafe, which is adjacent to the lobby and the ticketing. So that gives people a place to wait if they come early before their showtime or somebody a, a chance to meet or take a break after the experience. On the bottom left is a rendering of our retail shop, which is a little bit of akin to maybe a museum retail experience. Uh, after you've seen the experience, you have those products from the show or the spectacle that you can uh, peruse and maybe take some things home, including some educational merchandise as well. And then last on this page, bottom right, is the exterior of Atlanta, and it shows the exterior facade of the lobby, the cafe, and a snippet of our patio or a terrace on the bottom right there. Next slide, please. So I think Alan touched on this, but I'll say the architectural portion of it. It's 22 foot tall projection walls with fully stitched imagery, a slightly raised floor so we can embed our technology into the space. And this is the room that transforms from spectacle to spectacle or for an event. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, the first chapter. There's two of these rooms. I'll show you in the plan next. But this plan shows that um, with acoustic isolation within these two rooms and also light control, we're able to transform them into a different space. But it's something you move through yourself without equipment or hardware. Um, next slide, please. So here I probably have maybe the most to say or introduce the two together, which is um, this is a boundary of the crystal garden attached to the, the family pavilion. It's an existing footprint. And the blue rooms are the chapter spaces that have the, the show areas in them where the spectacles happen. And there's a particular sequence. So at the south is our lobby and ticketing area in the yellow. Um, and you, there's a dedicated queuing space for about 74 people as they pulse in through the show, through the experience. And then as they flow through, um, and there's no end time per se, they flow back out, in this case, to the north, which is where our retail is, which we enlarged and gave lots of extra circulation space, which I'll touch on why in a minute. In the green, we have a cafe, which I showed the typical of. That's essentially anchored because there's an exist existing kitchen to the bottom left. And then we're uh, proposing utilizing a portion of the South Terrace for some outdoor, even though the season's short, um, outdoor cafe. And the main challenge for us or trick is these four red dots. I don't know if my cursor is appearing. But those four red dots where the red X is are the existing main columns for the whole space. So what we always look for in a space is tall ceilings and not many columns. So this is a pretty magical opportunity to do that. Just happens to be a, a unique space because there's no backside. 
So we're visible from all four sides. So we want to make sure we look good and there's no backside. Um, and then the beige area to the right, to the east, is actually the support space, some offices and where the uh, server rooms and things are that run the technology in the chapter spaces. So we can go to the next slide. So here, same floor plan, but diagrammed a different way. Um, and the idea here is the beige areas are ticketed or support spaces. And the yellow areas are areas that are, I'll call them shared that allow for circulation through East and West for Navy Pier guests and also Luminarium visitors. Um, so I kind of say it's similar to a department store, an anchor store in a shopping center in a way that you can pass through it without having to come there only, or it's not a dead end in any way. And the blue dotted lines show the primary circulation pass um, both directions from any side. And this plan, I didn't mention it before, but on the top left is the IMAX theater that exists. Bottom left in the gray is the children's museum. And in the white on the ground floor, slightly below us is the retail concourse of the family pavilion. Next slide, please. Um, this is a section, I have three of these, but I'm just gonna probably talk to this one the most. This is cut through looking east. This is cut through north and south. So on the right-hand side, which is the south, this is our ticketing lobby and cafe in the foreground. The main volume that contains those chapter spaces is in the middle and the retail is on the north on the left. Next slide, please. This is a bit of a hybrid section elevation looking from the, um, looking north from the lobby area uh, with the theaters in the background and the cafe on the left. Next slide. This is a reverse view looking south of the retail space in that shed that's on the sides of the main Crystal Garden uh, Pavilion building. Next slide. So a couple of things to say about this view that was shown before. Um, we raised the vantage point a little bit higher. Some of the building is actually covered with the glasses has frit and film on it, but we removed that just for this presentation so we could show a little bit more clear how these objects, because our project is essentially an, an exhibit that would sit on the floor in the existing building, not touching the existing building. Um, but this gives you an idea. This is the north side with the retail. And then last but not least is the east. This is much, much higher. Um, and gives you an idea of the skyline in the background of Chicago. This is more from the gondola. So I have two slides. This center image I'd like to just talk about to give you an idea of scale. This is an elevation on the left and a section on the right in the middle caption. And that gives you an idea of the scale of a person in the chapter space on the raised floor. And then there's a white outfill space that has our technology and speakers and things in it. And then that large area with the color on it and the lighting top and bottom would be a person in the circulation space. And that's how we'd illuminate the building because the Luminarium is not a single color type of brand. It's more a multicolor um, experience. So we're using gradients and RGBW programmable lighting to, um, to demonstrate that in the design. On the right is the caption of the ticketing proscenium um, on the left is the retail point of sale and fixtures. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, bottom right is the cafe, just the food and beverage counter, uh, loose furniture, black theatrical trusses and decorative light fixtures that are studio or theater in nature. And on the left is some of the elements for the, the terrace or the patio, which would be Tivoli lighting, the loose furniture and such. Um, last visual image is the fourth rendering, which we saw before, which is an annotated plan showing what that would look like from the retail concourse from the family pavilion looking up and showing the large volume and the floor elements in the foreground, which uh, are um, very calm in this plan, but they're standing there behind the, the guardrails and things just inside the building within the space frame. 
And then the last slide for me that our partners, Perkins and Wills, our local architect of record firm collaborating with us is the renovation requirements. We can see without just the very beginnings of the project that we can meet the 25 point requirement or better when we get into the project based on um, transit that's available and also water usage, usage with reduced um, water consumption plumbing fixtures. And if there's any questions, I'm available. I'll turn it back over to Jack. Thanks, Niles. Uh, lastly, the points that I would just like to make with this slide is it, it does indicate uh, the amount of investment, which is $30 million, and then every year will be 15 to 20 million every year to uh, for the new spectacle content. We'll be creating 400 plus jobs. There'll be 60 permanent and full-time jobs. And then also we have the goals as all planned developments do for 26, six and 50%. So with the MBE and city residents. So uh, this is a, a project that we're very proud of. I'd like to give special thanks to Emily Thrun from DPD who has spent so much time working with us on this. And with that, I would turn it back to Emily and, and thanks again uh, to all the commission members and you, Madam Chairwoman, for giving us the opportunity of presenting our case today. Thank you. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposal would be appropriate for the following reasons. The proposal is in compliance with the PD standards and guidelines, promotes economically beneficial development patterns, promotes pedestrian interest, safety and comfort, and provides public, social and cultural amenities for workers, visitors and residents. <clears throat> Please refer to my staff report for further details on this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, the zoning administrator recommends that the application to amend plan development 527 be approved and forwarded to the city council committee on zoning landmarks and building standards as such. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thrun. Uh, is Alderman Riley here or did he give us a, le a letter for the record? I do have a letter of no objection from Alderman Riley. Fantastic. Chairwoman, can I add one point of clarification too? I, I don't know if it was mentioned in the presentation, but uh, this item would normally have a lakefront protection ordinance attached to it as well. Um, the fact that this is an interior alteration only on the pier, the project was granted a lakefront waiver for that portion of the project. Okay, that's good to know. That helps. Um, well, it's an exciting, um, exciting project. Um, do I have a motion on the proposed amendment to institutional plan development number 527? Submitted by Illuminarium Chicago LLC for the property generally located at 600 East Grand Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. So moved by Commissioner Cox. And seconded by? Commissioner Sir. Commissioner Searle. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Commissioner Gaza. Yes. Commissioner Lyons is recused on this. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada. Yes. Commissioner Novada is a yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Shaw is also recusing herself. Commissioner Spazzato. Yes. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Mr. Villegas? Yes. Commissioner Wagespach? Um, motion passes. Congratulations. Um, please, when you do get a request for information on the WBE and MBE, that you be sure and fill out that form so that we can document uh, your, your uh, participation in that, your compliance in that. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you all thank you very much. much. Thank so, you. Thank you. Very much. Uh, you know, we've had a number of really exciting projects uh, throughout the day here. So the fact that we've got so many and, the, and that we're moving right through them um, is, is in no way um, uh, to, to dismiss the, well, let me rephrase it differently. This is, it's, it's, we do want to actually really uh, note how many exciting things there are happening in Chicago. So uh, with that, we will move on to item D11 which is a proposed plan development submitted by RIU Chicago LLC for the property generally located at 150 East Ontario Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the property from DX-12 downtown mixed use development, excuse me, mixed use district to a business plan development. 
The applicant proposes the construction of a new 28 story hotel building with an overall height of 345 feet containing 388 hotel keys and two internal loading berths. A 6.4 FAR bonus will be taken and the overall FAR of the plan development will be 18.4. This is in the 42nd Ward. Heidi Sperry will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Ms. Sperry. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Heidi Sperry with the Department of Planning and Development. And today I am joined by members of the development team representing Ryu Chicago LLC. The subject site is located on the northeast side of East Ontario Street, mid block between Michigan Avenue on the west and North St. Clair Street on the east. This is located in the near north side community area of the 42nd Ward. CMAP data from 2020 shows the population of this community area has increased by nearly 30% over the past two decades. And additionally, nearly 60% of the residents in the community area work within the city limits. The prevailing plan for the area is the Central Area Action Plan of 2009, which established the goals of in encouraging high quality, high density development and vibrant mixed use districts in this portion of the near north side. The proposal before you today supports these objectives. On the right are views of the site from the east uh, and west along East Ontario Street. And as seen in these photos, the area surrounding the site includes a mix of mid and high rise buildings, which range from historic to contemporary. The site is currently vacant and is situated between an 18 story office building to the west and a 15 story a hotel building to its immediate east. Surrounding land uses include retail, office, residential, hospitality, entertainment, and institutional. The site is currently zoned DX12, that's Downtown Mixed Use District, and the applicant proposes to rezone the site to establish a business plan development and utilize a 6.4 FAR bonus, resulting in an overall FAR for the PD of 18.4. The proposed use of the bonus is consistent with DPD's policies. DPD has assessed the compatibility of the proposed development within the character of the surrounding area in terms of use, density, and building scale, and has determined that the project is appropriate. The proposed hotel use is compatible and synergistic with surrounding uses, and as seen in the rendered view on the right, uh, the proposal uh, fits well in the existing built context. Now, members of the development team will provide further details on the proposal. Mr. George. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. Uh, Madam Chairwoman and members of the commission, my name is Jack George. I'm an attorney. I'm also here with my uh, partner, Chris Leach, who worked with me on this project. Uh, also with me today uh, is uh, the architect, Mia Lam, from uh, Lucian Lagrange Studio, who will also be going through and explaining the project. Uh, I just wanted to give a little context with respect to the community outreach. Uh, we did meet with SOAR and the Streeterville Organization of Active Residents. We met with them. We had a community meeting on April the 8th. We did our PD filing in May the 21st, May 26th of 2021. But in addition to that, we've had numerous meetings with Alderman Riley and the Department of Planning and Development uh, over the last couple of years regarding this project, which resulted in we reduced the number of guest rooms from 410 to 388. We reduced the height of the building from the proposed 390 to 345. We also removed the ballroom and meeting rooms and a fine restaurant. And we also re, uh, uh, worked with, DP, with CDOT with respect to how Ontario Street would be uh, working with respect to loading zones. We also did away with a cul-de-sac which would have had some impact on the pedestrian traffic. And so there were a number of different changes that we've made. And so there's been extensive community outreach on this program. And so I would right now turn it over to Mia and have her go through and explain the details of the design of the building. Uh, Mia. Good afternoon. Can you, can you hear me and see me? Yes. Can. yes, great. Uh, my name is Mina Lamb with Lucien Lagrange Studio, the architects. I'm going to take you through uh, the floor plans as well as the exterior uh, design. The building is, is fairly simple in its stacking. The bottom two floors are public uses and uh, with guest rooms above. This is the ground floor plan. 
um, with Ontario to the south. And, uh, you know, this is currently a vacant lot. It's, it's fenced off. It has been for many years. This proposal will infill the void and create a continuous uh, a street wall between the neighboring buildings. It was important for the ground, for, for the ground floor to, to create active uses for the full frontage. So off of the main entrance on Ontario is the lobby with a coffee shop um, to the east. Uh, the services loading is accessed from the public alley on the north. And along the, the sidewalk, there are, we're, you know, we're not proposing any new curb cuts or lay-by. The, the, the approach was to minimize uh, landscape features and elements so that, uh, so that the, the obstructions to the pedestrian traffic flow is reduced. Um, there are three cars identified on Ontario Street. This is a 60-foot loading zone that is that will serve for pickup and drop-off uh, of, of guests to mitigate traffic uh, on Ontario Street. Next slide, please. This is the second floor, which houses a dining room and a kitchen on the back. Uh, this dining room is primarily to serve uh, breakfast for the guests. Uh, that's the extent of the public uh, 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 program for, for the guest. Along the street frontage, we've set the set facade back and created a, a covered loggia terrace uh, element so that at the breakfast room, guests can stand on the terrace and look over the street. Next slide, please. This is the typical guest room floor. Uh, there are rooms facing north and south. We've, we've notched, we, we stepped back the corners on, along Ontario Street to reduce the bulk and break out of the box um, uh, to contrast the neighboring buildings. Um, the other element is, you know, this is a mid-block building. So the east and west facades are on the lot line. And what we've done is um, at, the, at the main uh, circulation corridor dividing the guest rooms, when the, when the Buildings to the east and west are cleared. We've introduced windows um, at that location to help articulate and break down um, the, those facades even further. And I'll show you that in the elevation. Next slide, please. This is the, this is the roof plan at the top of the building on the south where it says level 26 terrace. There is a setback at that level that, is a, a, that provides a terrace. And then behind that is the mechanical equipment. This slide shows that um, the, the building design will meet 50% of, uh, of its available roof will be green roof. Next slide. These show... Um, the main building elevations around the facade, the south elevation is the elevation that fronts on Ontario Street. Um, the facade is relatively more solid of it in expression and, um, and, and also you know, in massing, there's a clearly identifiable base, middle and top. Like I said, the, the base is the public spaces with the, with the, uh, the guest rooms above. And the, the, the building being more solid has openings at the typical guest room floors that are more in scale with the neighboring buildings, which I, I think will be shown in, in better images later. I think it's imp important to note in these elevations that the care and level of articulation uh, shown on the south elevation will be carried through on all four elevations. Next slide. The, the, so this, this shows the remaining elevations where, where we are carrying that, that articulation on all four sides. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, again, the simple stacking section with the public spaces up at the base, very high ceiling um, in the lobby level, guest rooms, and then the three-story mechanical area that is set back uh, from Ontario Street. The next slide, please. This is the overall building exterior design. Uh, the approach for the massing was to, was to uh, break down the massing. And, and, and we did this, uh, like, like I st stated, by, by stepping the corners and articulating um, the base to be a different material and expression. At the top, we've, we've set back the, the top facade so that it does break down the mass as well as uh, sculpt the top few floors to have a more identifiable uh, expression in the skyline. I will go through some of the building materials, um, starting with the base of the building. 
the, the, the facade is a precast clad uh, a panel that will be detailed to look like a stone facade. We've maximized um, the glass at, at, at both floors. On the second floor, uh, the, the glass wall is recessed behind a colonnade loggia, and this allows uh, a, a terrace uh, for the, for the, uh, the dining uh, guests on the second floor. There is a canopy that runs the full length of the main central expression that, that uh, 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 protects uh, the sidewalk uh, pedestrian. Uh, so, so then the, the precast uh, comes down to a granite base. The, the tones and the palette of the, of the building is a warmer tone. This is meant to be more inviting and to create a sense of comfort on arrival for the guests. Um, you can see with the, oh, sorry, with the overall uh, building image in the middle where the, the building is articulated to complement the more solid buildings of, of in the neighborhood, um, uh, to the, especially directly to the east. Next slide, please. At the typical guest room floor, this is the facade. It's articulated. Uh, the material is an architectural uh, concrete uh, expression that, that also has reveals to break down the mass, uh, sorry, break down and articulate um, the facade to, to appear more stone-like. Um, we've, we've, it, it, it shows very minimal detailing. This is, you know, a reference to um, a more modernized solid facade that, that, that as, as you go up the building, it starts to, to be uh, more, more, like I said, more modernized and with, with less details. At the very top um, of the facade is the three-story uh, facade, which has uh, louvers, and, and grills, decorative grills to screen the mechanical equipment so that they are not visible from the neighboring buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the, uh, th this, this slide shows how, um, identifies how the, the, the design, the building complies with the transportation traffic uh, and, and parking guidelines. I think um, the, main, the main thing here was the minute to minimize and mitigate traffic congestion uh, associated with the development. And I would, I, I would call, point out two key program elements that do that. The first is that there is no on-site parking. And the second is, um, as Jack mentioned earlier, with the removal of the ballroom and the restaurant, um, this will significantly reduce the number of non-guests coming to the site. Next slide, please. Um, this is the, the, the traffic study. You know, we, we, we went through this and we have our consultant, uh, traffic consultant here to answer any questions. I, I do want to point out uh, that, that, you know, the, the building from the get-go from the, at the street level was designed to further contribute to an active pedestrian district. And that, and that because of the two drivers that I mentioned, the, uh, this development will minimize and, and, and not create significant impacts on the capacity of the adjacent intersections along Ontario Street. Next slide, please. The next few slides um, show how the design is compliant with the uh, zoning ordinance relative to urban design, uh, at first at the pedestrian scale and then at the more neighborhood scale. So the site has been vacant, you know, and it's currently a void. And so the design of the facade at the street level was to, you know, in, infill that void, provide a continuity to the street wall, will provide street level active uses for the full facade and will enhance the pedestrian experience. Um, this is done through um, having, you know, maximizing the transparency with large openings for both the floors of, of, the, of the base, as well as um, uh, uh, using high quality materials, finishes, and uh, detailing. This gives, you know, the, the guests and the pedestrian an area in the neighborhood a, a more of a sense of arrival. We believe that what we've done here really complements uh, the neighboring buildings and enhance the, the pedestrian experience for that block. Next slide, please. 
Um, in, in terms of the neighborhood scale of the, of the development, um, the building respects the context and scale of the surrounding buildings at the typical guest room floors and at the top, as I mentioned, we've tried to break down the corners, sculpt the mass so that it's, it contrasts the bulkier boxy buildings that are around it. And, and, and more importantly, it, it does identify a skyline, um, a, a unique feature at the skyline, as well as um, at landscaped areas at that roof terrace setback. Next slide. This, this is the site plan um, sh showing the design of the sidewalk in front of the entrance on Ontario Street. There are currently three existing trees. Two will remain and the one in the center will be removed. Um, there are planters that are added in front of the storefront windows along um, where, where the facade is set back. Thank you for pointing that out. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, like I mentioned before, the, the design approach here was to minimize any new uh, landscape elements because we understand um, there is, there can be at times heavier pede pedestrian traffic uh, that connects from St. Clair Street to, to Michigan Avenue. And the goal was to keep this uh, air, sidewalk area as open as, and, and, as possible. Next slide. This is the uh, sustainability matrix. We've identified um, strategies in here that demonstrate how the project will comply to achieve 100 points um, to meet this policy. Next slide. Uh, relative to stormwater management calculations, um, the building design will exceed the ordinance by 50%. Um, at this point, I will turn it back to Jack George. Thanks very much, Mia. Uh, I just wanted to finish up with this slide dealing with the economic and community benefits. Uh, first of all, we definitely are committed to the goals of 26% uh, MBE and 6% WBE. With respect to the economic benefits, the estimated projection cost for this project is $145 million. Uh, construction jobs are 200, permanent hotel jobs would be 150. We're making a contribution to the Neighborhood and Opportunity Fund an amount of $2.9 million. Uh, the annual property tax contribution would be $2.9 million. The annual hotel tax contribution would be $4.4 million. And the annual sales tax on expected international tourism is $11.1 million. Um, Again, I'd like to thank uh, the commission for giving us the time to make this presentation. And I'd also like to give again special attention oh, yeah. to Heidi Perry yeah. for her time. Thank you, Mr. George. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the project material submitted by the applicant and has concluded <clears throat> that the proposed business plan development is compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of use, density, and building scale. And the project is adequately served by existing public infrastructures and facilities. Finally, the project is compatible with the surrounding zoning. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the zoning administrator of the Department of, plan De uh, of, the Department of Planning and Development that this application for business plan development be approved and the recommendation to City Council's Committee on Zoning, Landmarks and Building Standards be passage recommended. Finally, I would like to add that Alderman Brendan, Brendan Riley of the 42nd Ward has provided a letter to the Plan Commission expressing no opposition to this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mary, and thank you to the development team. Um, do I have a motion on the proposed plan development submitted by RIU Chicago LLC for the, pro oh, I'm sorry, hand just went up. Uh, Commissioner Tony. Thank you, Chairman, just quickly. Um, and Heidi, this is a good photo here. Uh, obviously the new hotel is in the middle it, it, do we have hotels on each side of this building existing? We have a 15-story hotel immediately uh, to the east, and we have an 18-story uh, office building uh, to the oh, west. Oh, I thought that looked like the old Sheraton, which was the Irish hotel. Anyways, that, um, for the benefit of the committee, though, when I, I was asking, because I had some constituents call me about this one, this, um, this RIU concept, <laughs> I think, 
you know, why do we need another hotel? And I think the uniqueness of this concept uh, to Chicago might be worth just a, a brief explanation uh, for the members of the commission. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Michael Rushke, are you on? Yes, can you hear me? Can you address the question that Alderman Tunney asked about the uh, nature of the uh, operation here and how it would be working? Yes, I'd be pleased to, and uh, thank you for everyone's time this afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to bring RIU, uh, which is a Spanish hotel owner and operator, um, uh, to Chicago, because the benefits they bring to the city are very unique. Uh, first, RIU owns uh, around 125 hotels and resorts around the world. Their primary business originally was uh, resorts in the Mediterranean and Ibiza uh, and the islands in the Caribbean, Mexico, South America, Central America, and the like. About 10 years ago, they formed another division, an urban division, to open up uh, central city hotels. Uh, in the United States, they started about 10 years ago with a hotel in Miami. They've opened two hotels in New York. Uh, and they recently, in late 2019, they acquired the Sheraton Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco and converted it to an RIU grant. Uh, they've been looking for a, a site in Chicago uh, to fill to, uh, as, a, as a destination for their clientele for many years. And we were fortunate to uh, make arrangements to acquire this mid-block site, half a block off of Michigan and Avenue for them. And we've been working with them now for three years and planning uh, to get the hotel started. RIU is very unique in the sense that they are partially owned by TIU, which is the world's largest international travel agency. Uh, there's a cross share ownership relationship. So primarily all of the guests of the RIU hotel are booked through TIU, which is their international travel agent. So they will be bringing approximately 100,000 international tourists to Chicago every year uh, and these are international tourists that, uh, but for having an RIU Grand Plaza in Chicago, would probably not otherwise stop here because their, their program now in North America is they book trips for their people and they'll go and spend two, three days in Miami, two, three days in New York, two, three days in Chicago, and, and, and then maybe on to San Francisco at Fisherman's Wharf. So it's very exciting to bring uh, the, and increase the level of international tourism, which has been a goal of the city and the hospitality and the restaurant industry uh, of Chicago for the last uh, two decades. And uh, so this is quite an exciting project. Um, <clears throat> as, as Jack mentioned on a slide earlier, uh, the, the international tourists spend more than twice a domestic tourist and the estimated spend uh, with international tourism is over $100 million, uh, which is around $11 million of sales tax, just on their estimated average spend. And then in addition, of course, uh, the property tax contribution and the annual hotel tax contribution is over $7 million a year. And I'd like to emphasize that RIU is uh, building this uh, without asking for any public support or subsidy. In fact, they're contributing to the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, $2.9 million. And uh, so it's quite an exciting uh, opportunity for Chicago. It is a plus plus. They're not going to be taking uh, hotel guests uh, out of other hotels. In fact, they would be bringing international tourism to our city, which is very exciting. And I'm very pleased to be part of part of the team. We we are their developer. Um, uh, we are, we are not an economic owner. RIU owns 100% of all their hotels. They have no debt and they have no partners. Um, so I I wanted to interrupt for a second because I know I, I wanted to ask a specific question about the uniqueness of the concept versus a typical transient hotel. In re, in and this came up in in some of the questions about maybe larger groups coming and going at the same time versus independent transient guests. 
And then that gets me to the loading and the impact on Ontario. Um, so, you know, the, and then the question is the whole idea, my understanding is to get these international guests out and experiencing Chicago and it's fine restaurants and such. Um, but it was more of a, um, in the, uh, in the traffic plan about the uniqueness of the enter, you know, the arrivals and departures and, and, and the way they use the city. Um, so that was more, uh, what I thought was more interesting in terms of the traffic plan and, and uh, the impact on Ontario. Yes, and I'd be pleased to address that. Uh, they do not charter aircraft and they do not bring 50 to 100 uh, guests on a charter flight uh, to a city. Uh, they Most of their guests arrive by taxi, limo, or Uber. Uh, occasionally, there might be a group of 10 or less uh, uh, on a plane and there might be a, a panel van uh, that will deliver guests, but they don't have tour buses. They do not use tour buses at all um, because they do not have large groups. Uh, that is why they don't have a need for a ballroom, uh, uh, for example. They do have a large breakfast room because it's uh, part, of, part of their package is uh, a, a very, uh, a buffet breakfast is included uh, in the room rate. And, uh, and that's the primary and only meal that they serve to their guests because the guests don't want to eat in a hotel. They want to go out and experience Chicago. Thank you very much, Mr. Reschke. That was really interesting. And thank you for that question, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Cox. Uh, yeah, no. Um... Alderman Tunney, thank you for uh, soliciting that answer because uh, that was uh, uh, literally all new information uh, that really helps to put this uh, hotel into greater context. Might even explain the kind of uh, longing for that old, old world European uh, classicism that the building took. Because I, you know, when we first saw this building, uh, we had no idea uh, why uh, the nostalgia uh, for this period, uh, but given the clientele that you're describing, uh, it makes a little more sense to me. Uh, so uh, that was very helpful information to, to, put, uh, to put my support in context. Thank you. Um, and with that, do I have a motion then on the proposed plan development submitted by- Madam, uh, Madam Chairman, I, I, I had my hands, I thought I had my hands up. You actually, you actually didn't, it just went up right, right as you said that. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, I had the opportunity to um, visit one of their um, facilities in Jamaica. My One of my nieces had a wedding out there. Uh, it, it actually reminded me of a, crew, a, a vertical cruise ship because they have all you can eat, you know, comes with being there and you know, so it was, it was just very interesting uh, how it's set up. Uh, I can see tourists coming from all over the, the, the world. Uh, if, there are, if they are a part of this organization, like I say, it's like a, a cruise ship on land. Um, and, and I can see a lot of people coming to um, their facility uh, to vacation. Um, I think, you know, matter of fact, I, I thought it was so beautiful when I was there, me and my wife was thinking about joining their club, right, to become a member, because it's like a one-stop shop for uh, the patrons who, who patronize uh, that place. So so I think this is great for the city of Chicago. It brings a, a unique vibe uh, to the city. Um, and, you know, um, and we never have enough rooms in the city of Chicago as far as competition goes because we're constantly trying to get more and more, uh, more and more conventions to come to the city of Chicago. So I think this is great and uh, I support it. Just want to say that. Great, thank you. And I agree, this is, this is will be good for the city of Chicago, particularly when it's gonna bring additional um, tourist um, into the city and along with them, their dollars and excitement about the city of Chicago. So uh, adding to our, our long list today of really uh, great projects, do I have a motion then on the proposed plan development submitted by RIU? Oh, man is pregnant and the young woman is pregnant, all right? 
Alderman Viegas, so move. Uh, Commissioner Garza, I second. Thank you. Um, with that, let me go go to the what did I do with my roll call sheet? Commissioner Biagi. Yes. I'm I'm I misplaced my roll call sheet. Okay, there it is. All right, Commissioner Biagi, Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner yeah. Got it. Commissioner Corley was a yes. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores. Commissioner, Gar Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? You might be recused on Recusal this one. Recusal on this one. Sorry, Chairman. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Moore? Yes. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Nevada? Okay, nothing for her. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Commissioner Carroll? Uh, yes, despite the design, which I'm not particularly in favor of, but yes. Well, I think, you know, Commissioner Cox's comment about how, you know, it does, it does, ex does explain it. And personally, I think it's kind of cool. But anyway, uh, sometimes these things become, I suppose, a matter of taste. But it is a good location for a hotel. I think it's urbanistically a good place. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Commissioner, I don't know if Commissioner Sp Spazato was in and out. Are you still here, Commissioner Spazato? Nick Spazato is a yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tenney? Yes. Commissioner Villegas? Uh, yes. Yeah. And Commissioner Wagesbach? Okay, he stepped out. All right, great. Congratulations. Motion passes. Madam Chairwoman, Commissioner Novara is a yes. Apologies. Okay, uh, okay got it. Uh, next item on the agenda is D12, a proposed amendment to residential plan development 1023 and a Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by CCA Lakeview LLC for the property generally located at 3630-3636 North Lakeshore Drive and 601-627 West Waveland Avenue. The property is currently zoned residential plan development 1023 and is within the public use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake Front Protection Ordinance. The applicant proposes to change the zoning designation from residential plan development 1023 to be to dash five neighborhood mixed use district and then to residential business plan development 1023 as amended. The applicant proposes the construction of a 19 story and a six story residential building connected at the base with 333 residential units, 145 parking spaces and a 5,000 square foot restaurant with an outdoor patio at grade. This is in the 46th ward. Catherine Hurd will provide a context overview can we get your slides up, Ms. Hurd? Uh, and the applicant will present their proposal. Yes. Um, I, Noah, it still says host disabled participant sharing. Uh, Kamal, can we give uh, Catherine the co host role? Sorry. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. For the record, my name is Catherine Hurd with the Department of Planning and Development, the applicant CCA Lakeview LLC. Can you still hear me? Can. Yeah. Okay. Um, CCA Lakeview LLC is here today to request approval of a plan development amendment and also lakefront protection ordinance application to construct a 19 story and a six story residential building connected at the base with 333 residential units, 145 parking spaces and a ground floor restaurant with an outdoor patio at grade. It's located at the corner of Waveland and Inner Lakeshore Drive. The project is located within the Lakeview community area, which is a vibrant, dense, community with excellent access to the lakefront transit and a range of neighborhood amenities. Um, the project at Lakeshore Drive in Waveland is one of the few remaining large lakefront development opportunities in Chicago. It's outlined in red here. You can see the proximity to the lakefront and how highly visible it is on this slide. The site is also very well served by transit, both buses and the CTA red line. The existing site is undeveloped except for existing driveways that will be reconfigured. It is surrounded by residential uses with the lakefront immediately across Lakeshore Drive. 
now I would like to pass it off to Jack George with Ackerman to go over the details of the proposed project. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and members of the commission. My name is Jack George. I'm an attorney. I represent the developer of this project and also my partner, Chris Leach, worked with me on this project. On this particular slide, we break down and give a little bit of the project summary. It shows here the net site area, the maximum floor area ratio. Uh, it does talk about the height of the buildings. The one building, the 19-story yes. building, is 228.6 feet. And the other building, the smaller building, the six-story building is 75.6 feet. Uh, there are 333 total units. There's a 11 affordable housing units, uh, 145 par parking spaces. We have two docks, and then we have 50 bicycle parking spaces. The next slide, please. This next slide shows uh, the six-story building and the 19-story building. Uh, both of the buildings are connected at the base around a shared courtyard. The next slide, please. This view here is a view, it says here view from the northeast direction, but it's really, to me, it's a view looking south along Inner Lakeshore Drive, and it shows in the foreground, the foreground there, the six-story building, and then just to the south of that is the 3600 uh, uh, North Lakeshore Drive buildings. There are two of them that are just to the south of us. The next slide, please. Again, this is a view looking along Inner Lake Shore Drive, looking south. Uh, the, the existing uh, inset drawing shows what's there now, which is green space. Uh, and uh, to the in the back of it, you can see the, the New York uh, condominium project. And then also to the south, you can see the 3600 building. The next slide, please. This is a view looking <clears throat> along uh, Inner Lake Shore Drive, looking south. Uh, the one to the right of that shows a view looking along Waveland Street, looking west. Uh, then to the bottom left is a view looking along Inner Lake Shore Drive, looking north. And then a view looking uh, along Waveland Street, looking east. Um, next slide, please. Uh, there are, in the planning context here, there is the Lakefront Protection Plan of the, in the Lakefront Plan of 1972. And we meet both the policies, policy number eight and policy 10 of that lakefront application. Also with respect to the 46th ward, it has a master plan that was instituted in 2013 uh, for, and this shows that we are complying with that, with the transit oriented development that we have here. Uh, it also has two quality residential buildings, which fits in with the context of that plan. And the, it will have an infill of a vacant lot that's presently there right now. The next slide, please. This next slide shows um, uh, the community outreach. And uh, this project here has, uh, we have had uh, extensive community outreach in this, pro in this project as Alderman Kaplman will probably talk about too. Uh, we started out in 2018 with town hall meetings. We went, we did it in 2020. 2020, we had a number of different meetings, 2021. We have had a number of different meetings. We have had, uh, uh, with respect to the 3600 building, which is just to the south of us, we negotiated with that building and had a, an agreement reached in which they support our project. We made a number of uh, commitments to them, which were reduced to writing, which, we, which were then uh, uh, resulted in a letter of support from that building. Similarly, for the bu building to the west of us, the New York condominium project, we had a number of meetings with them uh, and uh, that was also reduced to writing and they indicated they, they support the project too. We had meetings with uh, the East Lakeview Neighbors Association. We've had two meetings with them and they issued a letter of support for the, for the project too. And then we ended up by having a large meeting with the 46th Ward Community Organization with all the different uh, organizations in that community. And, they, and that was uh, uh, successful. We, I think they, they voted uh, 25 to, out of 30 people, 25 of the residential groups supported our building. Um, the urban design, I think, uh, I think you're now gonna pick up this with our architect. We're gonna, the architect is gonna pick up and go through now the slides on this. So Chuck, are you gonna go, th uh, go through this and explain these uh, design features of the building? Thanks, Jack. 
um, Madam Chair, Chairwoman and Commissioners, uh, thank you for your for your time today. Um, we really appreciate this. Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Sash. Um, I'm with BKV Group. We're the architects for this uh, project. So here uh, on this first slide, we just wanted to go through some of the, the massing progressions uh, of this project over the years. On the left here uh, shows the, the massing for the, the current PD. Um, as you can see, it, it's much taller than the, the project that we're currently proposing. Uh, just uh, as a matter of interest there, the, the purple uh, or blue, um, dark blue colors are the amenity spaces. And then on the far right, that salmon color at the base is, is the, the restaurant space. The, the cyan color is essentially all residential. Um, as we moved through, we, we went through some uh, massing options where it ended up being a courtyard building, all of the same height. Um, it kind of closed off that courtyard and uh, also blocked some of the views uh, for the, the neighbors to the south in the, the 3600 building. Um, so what we ended up with in terms of massing is something that we, we spent a lot of time uh, working with the, the neighbors on. Um, one thing that is not totally evident here is the building, uh, the gray building to the, to the, to the west, um, it's kind of in the, the background there. That's the, uh, the New York uh, condo building. Um, the way that is designed is actually the, the units on the, the that face um, our building are actually chamfered on the corners. So their outlook or their aspect is uh, 45 degrees. So they're essentially facing um, kind of to the, to the Northeast and to the, to the Southeast. So the way that we we positioned the the uh, tower was basically directly in front because that had the least impact on their views. Then we had the shorter building to the south because then that had a lesser impact on the, the views for the the 3600 uh, building. And then we widened the, the courtyard between the two buildings um, to to make that more of a, a useful space and, and uh, gain more access to sunlight. Next slide, please. So on the site plan here, uh, we have Waveland to the north and Inner Lakeshore Drive uh, to the east. Uh, to the left, we have the, the New York private residences and then to the south, we have the 3600 building. The uh, cul-de-sac uh, that is in the northwest corner of the site is essentially in the same location as the existing cul-de-sac, um, as you saw on an earlier slide. The difference is the, the access for that uh, was originally close to the corner of uh, Waveland and Inner Lakeshore Drive. It came off Inner Lakeshore Drive and went directly west. The way that we have changed this uh, to gain access to the site um, is that cul-de-sac uh, opens to the north to, to Waveland Avenue, and then uh, access to the parking garage is through that cul-de-sac, going down a ramp into a, a basement level parking and loading area. Likewise, we have a secondary access point at the south end of the site from Inner Lakeshore Drive again, going down a ramp to that lower uh, basement parking and loading area. So just uh, to go through some of the, the features here, the restaurant entry uh, faces Waveland Avenue, it's right in the corner of Waveland and Inner Lakeshore Drive. Uh, along, the, the fit, along West Waveland Avenue there, uh, as we'll see once we get to some elevations, uh, we have some townhome looking um, buildings, uh, uh, units at the base of the, the high rise to, to reduce the scale along that, that um, street. Uh, we have obviously the high rise there on the, the north side, 19 stories. 
Um, we have 188 units in that building, and then that's connected um, to the, the mid-rise on the south side, which is six stories uh, with 145 units in it. As you can see, between those two buildings, we have a, a very um, developed uh, landscape area, uh, highly amenitized, um, and the main entry for the building is off the, the cul-de-sac uh, in the, the northwest corner there. Um, along the streets, so we have, there's an existing C CTA bus stop on the corner there, which will remain in the same location. We'll have uh, accessible access across the streets, uh, crosswalks, um, across Wavelands and in a Lakeshore Drive. We also have on Waveland there, six loading spaces, um, three either side of the cul-de-sac entry and then two further to the east, uh, which would serve as a valet area uh, space for the uh, restaurant. We also have a, a uh, dog park there um, and all of the, the roof areas are either used for um, uh, unit balconies or uh, green roof spaces. And then the mechanical uh, units, we've spent a great deal of time looking at view angles, et cetera, from um, the neighbors. And we've screened those with uh, sculptural elements as you'll see in the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. Open space here. So as I was saying, the, the courtyard area in the middle is um, has a lot of functionality for the residents. Uh, a lot of the, the amenity spaces on that uh, first floor open up into that space um, and essentially become one with it. Uh, we have um, a fully landscaped site plan on all sides, uh, even on the facing the interior lot lines. Um, and the amenities uh, for the residents include uh, pool, saunas, fitness area, and the, the dog park, as I mentioned before. And uh, all of the, the landscape uh, complies with the landscape ordinance. You can see on the right there, the upper right, um, a, a view that Jack showed earlier. You can see a brief view into the, the courtyard space there. Uh, we stepped that down so that the, uh, you're not confronted with a, a big wall along uh, Inner Lakeshore Drive. So that will be um, well landscaped. And then an aerial view um, on the bottom right there. So you can see some of the green roofs. It's a little bit small to see at this scale. But uh, Next slide, please. So looking at some of the elevations now and the materials proposed for this building. So this is um, a view from Inner Lakeshore Drive. So the, the east elevation, uh, essentially all of the materials um, are brick, uh, metal and glass. Um, so along the base uh, predominantly is where the, the brick material is. Um, we use similar materials between the two buildings to tie them together. Uh, the uh, metal panel, we have in a few different profiles just to add some interest with shading as the, the sun hits them. Um, it's not very evident in this elevation, but uh, um, that would be the case. And then the, the high rise, there is uh, sitting above the base. Uh, it's set back from Waveland Avenue. So the, the pedestrian perspective um, as you're walking along the sidewalk is that that uh, is set back and kind of your focus would be on the, the first two floors of the building. Next slide, please. So this is a view along uh, Waveland Avenue, so the north elevation. And this is where I was referring to the, the townhome looking um, stylistic uh, 
base for the, 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 the units on, on the first two floors here. So we have uh, a basically a, a walk-up condition. So you have stairs for each of these units. You have planters. It's uh, well landscaped as well. Uh, we have some variation in the brick colors there. So trying to, to um, get a feel for you know, a, a smaller scale uh, since this is the facade that actually faces the uh, lower four-story buildings across uh, Waveland Avenue. So we wanted to bring the scale down along that edge. And then to the left there is uh, in black is where the uh, entry for the restaurant is. Next slide, please. Any chance, uh, since you guys are over your time, I'm wondering if any chance you could, we want to see this information, but can you pick it up a little bit? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, we can skip over this slide and the next one. Uh, they're essentially the same as the last two, just a little bit more detail on the materials. So uh, first floor plan here in blue is the residential. Purple is the amenities, which is the first floor is where most of those amenities occur. And as you can see, they open up into that courtyard area. The uh, pinky ready color is the restaurant. Uh, next slide, please. Is the basement level parking. So you can see the ramp down uh, on the south side from Lakeshore Drive and on the west from uh, Waveland Avenue. Uh, we've opened up that garage entry for uh, ease of navigation there. We have uh, loading down there as well, so it's all hidden from the street. This is a typical floor, uh, all units. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the floor of amenities um, on level uh, 15, we have a, a Sky Club. Next slide, please. Uh, green roof, as I was saying earlier, all all roofs had are um, have green roofs. Apart from some of the areas you can see with the cross hatch there, um, that have uh, that are essentially balconies for the residents. Next slide, please. Uh, sustainability. So, as I was mentioning before, uh, green roofs are a big part of this. Uh, we will have uh, electric vehicle charging stations, uh, CTA digital displays, since this is a very well served um, area for uh, buses, etc. And then another very important aspect of this is the enhanced bird protection, uh, given that this is a high rise and um, proximity to Lake Michigan, we want to make sure that uh, the glass is treated um, for that. Next slide, please. Uh, traffic, the traffic study indicates uh, the, the current infrastructure has the capacity to, to support the development. Uh, the two access points to the site uh, disperses the traffic generated by the development and uh, all parking and loading is below grade. So taking that off of the street. We also have our traffic consultant uh, on the call if there are any questions. Next slide, please. Uh, stormwater, they'll be uh, basically in detention tanks um, in the basement level. So we'll meet the, the stormwater management ordinance. Next slide, please. And ARO, we have uh, 11 ARO, ARO units, affordable units um, in the development. And I think I'm passing it back to Jack now for the economic Thank meeting. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Chris. This last slide, this economic and community benefits goes through and talks about the 200 new construction jobs, the 45 permanent jobs, the development costs of 100 to $110 million, um, the 1.2 to 1.4 increase in real estate taxes that will result from this development being approved and being built. Uh, as you can see, we reduced the height from what was previously approved down to 228.5 feet. And also the other one went down to 78.6 feet, the smaller building. We had the relocation of the Lakeshore Drive entrance so that it much, it's much more adaptable and, 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 and works much better than what was previously done. 
We, uh, the reconstruction of the cul-de-sac also helps to alleviate the backup of cars on Waveland Avenue. As uh, Chris just talked about, we've achieved the LEED certification. We have electric uh, vehicle charging stations and we have green roofs. Uh, again, I would like to take a moment and just say thanks very much to Catherine uh, for her time and effort that she put in on this. And thank you to all of, uh, all of the commissioners and you, Madam Chairwoman, for giving us the time to make our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank Catherine. You. Uh, again, for the record, Catherine Hurd from DPD. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the project materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that this proposal is in compliance with the applicable policies of the Lakefront Plan of Chicago and the purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance. It has also been concluded that the proposed development would be appropriate for the following reasons. Um, it's compatible with surrounding zoning and planned developments nearby. It is um, economically beneficial development patterns compatible with the existing neighborhood, um, high quality uh, publicly visible facades and the urban design. So please refer to the staff report for further details regarding this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the zoning administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that this application being in conformance with the provisions of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance be approved subject to compliance with the plans presented to you today. It is also recommend also the recommendation of the zoning administrator that this application to amend residential plan development number 1023 be approved and forwarded to the city council committee on zoning landmarks and building standards. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hurd and thank you, Mr. George and, you and the team. I also wanna note for the record, it's probably been now about 15, 20 minutes since Commissioner Osterman also joined us. Uh, Commissioner Tunney. Thank you. Uh, so I, I've got, this is not in my ward, but I used to live at 3700, so, which is the building to the north. When I was there, this whole plot was empty uh, weed yard for practical purposes. So I'm very familiar with this site. Um, and I know there'll be others that will comment on the lack of affordability in the history of PD, so I'm not gonna dwell on that. Um, and I think actually for the record, this tower Lakeshore Drive or this 3660, what it's called now, while I think it at the time was the largest brick building, it's probably one of the ugliest buildings that I've seen uh, being constructed, was constructed. So this new addition is probably an improvement. Uh, with that, um, in the conversation, uh, Mr. George, did any, you talked about 3600 and 3660 being in support of this. What about our neighbors on Waveland? Did we have support? I know you, I think you skipped over 3700. Mm -hmm. What about the other uh, three and four flats on Waveland? Well, uh, in response to that, Alderman Tunney, uh, with respect to 3700, we did have a meeting with them. Uh, we didn't hear anything back from them. I had two meetings with them. Uh, as you can tell, I had, uh, I had noticed uh, a number of people about these different hearings and we had extensive hearings on this. And so all the people on Waveland to the along Waveland, uh, some of those people did come to the, to the uh, Lake, Central Lakeview meeting and talked about it and we responded to the, any questions we got from them. Uh, every uh, chance we, can't, we, have, we were given, we, we tried to meet with people, which we did. And so I don't think there's anybody within 250 feet at least, which was required by the zoning code, that, that they didn't get notice and get an, didn't, weren't right. given an opportunity to be heard. I just okay. also- well, But I, you know what, Jack, I just, I, I just wanna know that, I know that the outreach was there, uh, but you know, my concern Waveland from Lakeshore Drive on the north side is all low rise, basically, you know. Um, and given the way you, it seems like based on the presentation, you certainly worked with your high rises, 3600 and 3660. Um, but 
I, I just wanted to say probably our neighbors on Waveland think they got the short end of the stick. Um, and I'll just leave it at that, Jack, because I know you do your job properly. Um, but, but, I, I just but want to say, Alderman Tony. Waveland is a, is a one way street. Is right. it Waveland is a one way street there? Okay. So that gets me to the next question. Um, you, you seem to have a lot of loading zones on Waveland adjacent uh, to your property, new ones uh, and, and such. Is there, will there be any, and is there from a, from a public, from a safety point of view, is there any, I know Waveland in certain parts is a very narrow street. Um, I don't know if it's this far to the lake, but uh, would it make any sense with the, the loading zones and the next question, the restaurant loading zone, uh, why there would be any parking on the, what would be the south side of Waveland from, it, you know, I mean, you might get, looks like four or five spaces in between those loading zones, but it just seems to me with the amount of traffic and, and this restaurant concept would be kind of weird to have like three, three parking spaces for the, you know, for transient parking. It, is, is that is that the case going to be or what? It is. We How much loss of parking? How much loss of parking on the south side of Waveland will be will happen? Our traffic engineer is on the phone, is on this presentation. Can you speak up and just address the question that was raised by Alderman Tunney? Michael Berkshire. Michael, um, are you on? Or Louie? Yeah, Jack, I'm I'm on. Um, uh, Alderman, yeah, this is Louie Abuna. Uh, we, uh, I believe we are going to be restricting uh, six to seven parking spaces. Um, the ones that are adjacent to the entrance to the, um, to the, to the, to the development, um, those are not going to be restricted all, uh, all the time. Uh, they'll be only restricted for loading during certain times of the day. Um, and Jack, I, I, if you want to chime in on those uh, restriction hours, I, I don't recall when they would be restricted, but they're not going to be restricted all the time. So there will be parking available for the residents in the area to use those uh, spaces for parking. That's well, Louis, Louis, you know that if you can find a space on that block of Waveland, you're, you're certainly not going to move it pretty quickly because it, there are so few parking spaces available. So, uh, and it, and I just want to know if there's going to be, it sounds like there's going to be X number of spaces that will be either partially taken away from loading zones and even the ones in between the cul-de-sac and the corner, it would be interesting to see, you know, how many spaces would actually be left for transient parking. And, and then I'll just say the last thing, um, I'm looking even from this view from Irving, from Irving all the way to, in my opinion, diversity, uh, we don't have a restaurant on, a restaurant concept on Lakeshore Drive. And I know there's a lot of building, I mean, a lot of our residents south of, or south of, uh, in the 44th Ward don't want that kind of commercial activity um, on the, on inner Lakeshore Drive. So, could you comment a little about that? Because I'm looking at the aerial. I don't see, I think a couple of them have a, like a dry cleaners or a, or a mini market or something, but all the way from Irving to, in my opinion, to diversity, there isn't this kind of active restaurant. And I don't know what size it is. I also know that it's on the corner, but where does the loading and the trucks for the restaurant concept I just, this is new, this is new territory for our lakefront in this area. And I would like to get a little bit of understanding where this came. I'm, the people are there, but this is unusual uh, use on Inner Lakeshore Drive. Well, that will respond to that, Alderman Tunney. I'll have Paul Fromm from the development team uh, respond to that question. But the size of the restaurant is 5,000 square feet. Uh, the type of restaurant that they're talking about putting in here is a family neighborhood restaurant type. It's not any type of fast food restaurant or anything like that that we're talking about. And uh, this was discussed at great length with the neighborhood neighbors concerning this concept. 
and you may be right that this is the only one between Irving and diversity. But when we when this was explained in great detail to the at the neighborhood meetings, uh, there was a support for it because they felt that there was a need, there was an absence of that type of family type restaurant, and people felt it was a good thing that it was coming to the neighborhood. But Paul, maybe you can address it uh, better than I can. And, and sure. also the loading of the, I mean, where are the trucks coming for the restaurant since it seems to be all the way up to the front? Paul, do you want to answer, uh, Alderman Tunney? Sure. Yeah. So I, I think, Jack, you, you mentioned well, right? So I, we really believe that the lack of restaurants along Lakeshore Drive is really why we believe it will work. Uh, we want somewhere that's walkable. It's something you can go to for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and, and drinks at the end of the evening. Uh, really focused on people who live in the neighborhood and the community um, to be able to use that as kind of a third kind of space for them to use. Uh, from a, a functional standpoint, all of our loading is taking place through the garage. So there's, we've, we've dedicated that back driveway for loading. It goes into the garage and we'll have an elevator that goes down from the restaurant into the garage to keep all the loading and trash happening off of Waveland to avoid that sort of um, congestion there. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm not sold on it, but I, if that's what the neighborhood, you know, I think the historically the neighbor, the density along the lakefront was to support the commercial along Broadway. So there was a his, there was a reason why historically we didn't want that kind of commercial activity. Um, we, we wanted people to be able to get involved, get in the neighborhood too. And I, I just unique, I, I'm not saying I'm for or against it, but it's, it, I can't believe that between Irving and diversity, there's nothing like this. And you're right, there might be a market for it, but there's also reasons why there wasn't because the density has always been there. So I'm not set on that. Thank you. Well, and the issue isn't so much of why the developer thought the concept might work, but it, what the, also what the neighbors felt they wanted. So you all are saying that in that process, the neighbors said they wanted a restaurant? They did. There was a great deal of support, um, uh, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, uh, about this. We This question came up and uh, there were some people that didn't think it was a good idea, but there were, I think, a majority of the people that felt it was a good idea. What they were concerned about was whether or not this was gonna be some type of, of a franchise situation, like a McDonald's or a, a Wendy's or something like that. And we, it was a commitment made by our client uh, when we made the presentations that it would not be, that it would be a family owned, family operated neighborhood type of restaurant. And that was, that was well received by the community when we made those, when we made those presentations. And that commitment was made to them in writing? No, no, we didn't make it in writing. We just, we, it was a commitment we made when we, were bef when we appeared before them, that that's the type of, of restaurant it would be. And, and as I say, the, the developer is on, is on the call, is on the um, you know, call right now with us uh, and he can make the commitment again. So Paul, do you wanna to respond to that, that question? Sure, yeah, I mean, the, this will not be a, a sort of fast food chain restaurant. It'll be a, a local Chicago high quality operator. Um, we view this really not only as an amenity for the neighborhood, but for our residents as well. And we really want it to be a, a high quality place. It's the only reason uh, we're proposing it in the first place. So um, yeah, we're, we're absolutely committed not to do sort of a fast food chain type concept. Thank you. Here, woman, it's Noah. Can I add, I just want to add a clarification to that because I think it'll help Alderman Tunney's question and might help the other members' questions is the PD statements specifically, you know, as part of the uh, negotiations that the attorney was having with the community groups, the PD statements um, hold that the amount of square footage in the building that's dedicated to any commercial or retail space shall be only 6,500 square feet, no more. Um, and it was based on the footprint of this restaurant that's intending to go in there. It also prohibits the restaurant from having any type of live entertainment or live performances at the request of those uh, neighboring buildings uh, through their attorneys. That is helpful. Thank you, Noah. Commissioner Reyes, followed by Commissioner Tesoro. Yeah, could you please, Catherine, uh, pull again the affordable housing uh, information? Uh, it, it went too fast. I couldn't capture it. So if I understand correctly, this new development is 105 units, right?
Now, okay. those 11 units are going to be on site. I can't, okay, so give me one second. Yeah. Yes, are going to be, be on site? What, what is this, the, the details and what is the income? They will be, at, they will be on site and it's 60% of median income. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Searle. Commissioner Searle, um, I, I thought we should respond to the question that was asked by uh, the person who spoke on this earlier um, to assure her that uh, the structural engineering and and the engineering next to their building at 30, I think she was at 3,600, uh, would, would be safe. Yes, Commissioner uh, Cyril, uh, the answer to that is, is that that was a, a definite issue that came up when we negotiated the agreement with the 3,600 building. And we, there's language in that agreement, that written agreement that was signed by us and by them that provided that there would be a, a pre and post construction survey of the land and the property and the buildings. There was a language in there with respect to monitoring equipment that would be placed into those buildings and our buildings and on the land. There was a provision in there that said that we would uh, share on a weekly basis the results of the monitoring equipment that would and the vibrating equipment. Uh, there was also a provision in there, of course, that we would have the necessary insurance in the event anything ever did happen. But there's a great deal of specific language. We don't, 3,600 was represented by a very able lawyer and, uh, and we spent an awful long time negotiating a, lot, a number of different points, but specifically we dealt with the issue that was raised earlier by the person earlier this morning about questions about the, the structural integrity of her building and our building and whether or not there was any uh, studies being done or will be done to protect that building from any type of uh, adverse impact as a result of our project. So we have covered that at great length. Thank you. Commissioner Searle, it's great the way you remember and then remember to bring that stuff back. Uh, let me go to the Alderman, Alderman Kappelman. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Your patience is amazing. It's a long meeting. Um, but uh, this has gone on for uh, three years now, uh, multiple meetings. Uh, Jack said nine. I thought for sure there was a lot more than that. Um, I, I will speak to the uh, restaurant. Uh, a number of the residents in that area are 70 uh, plus. Uh, I'm very close to that myself. And uh, they wanted something closer by, uh, especially when grandkids came in. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, a place that they could all eat. Uh, and then uh, this was, besides all these community meetings, it did go before the 46 Ward Zoning Development Committee. Uh, it's about 35 different members uh, because 25% of the ward uh, have low income, 25% of the members uh, represent that group as well. And uh, they voted overwhelmingly in support of this. I think 25 votes in favor, two against, and five abstained. So uh, with that, I, I ask uh, everyone for their support. Thank you very much, Alderman. Appreciate your being here. Uh, Commissioner Cox, before I at request a motion. Um, I mean, I, I think I would be remiss if I did not talk about uh, the um, challenge of, uh, or the responsibility, if you, uh, maybe that's better, of when you build uh, on the lakefront. Um, I think that there's a higher standard uh, for what is uh, worthy of facing on to uh, our great lakefront. Uh, I spend uh, a lot of time biking up and down uh, the lakefront. I probably know every building. Uh, I can point out every building uh, because I've been up and down them so long. And I share um, Alderman Tunney's assessment of the tall brick building, uh, which is really uh, quite ugly. Uh, and I certainly never thought that I would be uh, ushering in the first building uh, on the lakefront uh, that does not promise to be particularly exceptional. Um, it is, um, you know, I think, and we've done the best we can in the planning department to help the architects and the developers uh, to get something that 
um, will be, you know, uh, unoffensive. Um, but there is so much about this uh, that should be held to a much higher standard. And so just as in the um, affordable housing component, um, you know, there's no, uh, it is the bare minimum. It was the standard by which, uh, you know, it was no negotiated years ago. I'm so glad that we have a new standard for affordable housing uh, that might give us a better chance to truly create uh, integrated housing. And I'm also thrilled that we now have a committee on design uh, so that the planning commission doesn't have to become the committee on design or a handful of people in the planning department don't have to be responsible for achieving design excellence. So I just, the process, um, we brought it forward, uh, but I thought that the developer and the architect should know that we do not think that this is their best work. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on the website of the architects, and I know that they can do extraordinary buildings. Uh, this one is absolutely average. Uh, I'm not confident that it is worthy of our lakefront, um, but it does meet the letter of the law in terms of uh, being uh, approvable. So I will be supporting it, but I felt I simply had to make this point uh, because this is the first lakefront hour that I'm seeing uh, in my tenure here as commissioner. Thank you thank so much. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Lyons. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, um, I would like to see if there's a, I, I think I was very, I think many of us, I mean, there's many speakers sort of speaking very passionately about the community, um, about the need for um, equity and inclusion um, and thinking about um, uh, the long-term impacts um, for that, for the area. Um, so I feel like I, I haven't quite heard um, response to that. Um, we had a lot of speakers and, um, you know, it was very compelling testimony. Um, it, the one thing I did, I did hear too, which um, um, about the environmental impact study. Uh, Mr. Lyons, if I could stop you right there, a lot, most of the testimony we heard this morning is on the next item. Uh -huh. um, so, so just, just in case, in case you might've been confused. So, so oh, okay. Got it. Thank although, you. Although, although I suspect some of the issues may still apply, but just, just, to, just to make sure you're clear. So go ahead and continue. Got it. No, I think I, um, I may be misspeaking, but um, yeah, I think uh, I'll reserve my comments then. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner. <clears throat> there was one person who raised the issue around that uh, Commissioner Searle mentioned um, around the concern about the given that we're particularly given even that New York Times article that we saw a couple of weeks ago around, um, around uh, the, the pending impacts of uh, climate catastrophe. So um, we need to pay particular attention to how buildings are built along the lakefront um, among, among other reasons, including those raised by Commissioner Cox. Um, any other comments on this one, um, on, on this, this one on, um, on uh, North Lake Shore Drive, 3636 North Lake Shore Drive. Okay, we're gonna have to have two motions or two, uh, two votes on this particular um, item uh, because of the, 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 uh, the different um, development addresses. Um, I think, or why are we having, I mean, I know we're having two different votes. What exactly it's is it? It's because it's a plan development as well as a lakefront application. Okay, thank you. All right, so do I have a motion on the proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance submitted by CCA Lakeview LLC for the property generally located at 3630-3636 North Lakeshore Drive and 601-627 West Waveland Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. Moved by Commissioner Wagesback. Thank you, Commissioner Wagesback, seconded by Next Rosado. Uh, thank yes. you, Commissioner. So we'll vote on this one first. Uh, this this motion first. Uh, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Cordova. Yes. Fox. Yes. Um, unenthusiastic. Yes. 
Um, Commissioner Flores is not here. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Lyons. Yes. yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada. I think she's gone. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes, but unenthusiastic, yes. Uh, Commissioner Shaw. Commissioner Rosado. Yes. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Villegas. Yes. And Commissioner Vegas, but. Yes. Okay, now for the second vote that Commissioner I Osterman. Yes, oh, I'm too. Sorry, Commissioner. Um, no, I came. No, no, but I, I did note that you were here, but then I just didn't. Uh, I, in my list here. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Welcome. Um, second, do I have a motion on the proposed amendment to residential plan development 1023 submitted by CCA Lakeview LLC for the property generally located at 3630-3636 North Lakeshore Drive and 601-627 West Waveland Avenue finding that meets requirements for approval. Motion and second. Motion by Commissioner Wagesback, or is that so? Uh, that's fine. And then seconded by Commissioner Moore. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Biagi. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Cordes. Uh, yes. uh, thank you, Burnett. I got it. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Yes. Commissioner Gaza. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Osterman. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Scozato. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. I'm like, okay. okay, I got Scozato. Chairman, Commissioner Shaw too. And Commissioner Garza as well. Sorry about that. Okay. And then Commissioner Villegas. Yes. Commissioner Connie's yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and then Commissioner Wagespot. Yes. All right. Motion passes. Uh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Chairman, did you get me for both votes or just one? I just got you for one, but I'll mark you for the other and so will the record. Thank you. All right. Commissioners, we have been real troopers today. We've got two more items. The next one on the agenda will probably take us a bit, so grab your grab your water. <clears throat> next on the agenda is D13. He proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application and an amendment to plan development 37 submitted by Lincoln Property Company National LLC for the property generally located at 4600 North Marine Drive. The property is currently zoned residential institutional plan development number 37 and is within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District. The applicant is proposing to construct a 12 story residential building with 314 units and 136 vehicular parking spaces. It's in the 46th ward. Michael Berkshire will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Madam Chair, I will be recusing myself from this one. This is Commissioner Searle. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and Chairwoman, uh, actually, uh, I will be presenting this, so. Um, oh, you're on behalf of my yeah. thing. <laughs> so you're stuck with me for the next two also. Um, so good afternoon for the record. My name is Catherine Hurd with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant Lincoln Property Company National LLC is here today to re request approval of a plan development amendment and another lakefront protection ordinance application to construct a 12 story multifamily residential building containing 314 dwelling units on the subject property generally located at 4600 North Marine Drive. Over half the residents in the uptown community area have obtained a bachelor's degree or higher. A vast majority live in a one or two person household and over 70% of the residents work in Chicago. 
the project is nicely positioned between two mass transit opportunities, the Wilson Red Line CTA station and the 136, 146, and 147 bus lines on Marine Drive. It is also located near Montrose Beach, Montrose Harbor, and just north of the Clarendon Park Community Center. This slide illustrates the land use context, which is predominantly B35 and RT4. This slide illustrates the sub area being created on the southeast portion of existing PD number 37 that will permit the new residential use. The uses in the remaining sub areas will not be changed with this amendment. Now I'd like to pass it off to Mr. Paul Shadel with DLA Piper to go over the details of the proposed project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hurd. Next slide, please. Um, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Paul Shadle. I'm a lawyer with the law firm of DLA Piper and with my partner, Katie Janky Dale, we're representing the applicant. And with us today are Joe Segoviano from Lincoln and then from Valerio DeWalt Train, the project architects, Joe Valerio and Bob Weber. Uh, we also have Louie Abuna from KLOA, our traffic consultant. Next slide, please. These are, oops, this just shows the location of the site. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, just, just to give you context, this shows uh, the view of the site from Marine Drive, looking west with the building in the left center, the gray building on the top, and then on the bottom a view uh, looking from the south uh, with the building in the center. Next slide. This is the current condition of the site from the southeast. It's right now a surface parking lot. Uh, next slide. Uh, from the southwest at the corner of Clarendon and Wilson. Next slide. Uh, and from the east, from Marine Drive. This is from the northeast looking toward the surface parking lot. Next slide. And then from, uh, this is from the Southwest and I will turn it over now to Bob Weber from uh, the architect to describe the design. Good afternoon all. For the record, I'm Bob Weber, architect and chief sustainability officer of Larry DeWalt Train. I'll walk through the architecture of our project. So here we have the east elevation view from Wilson Avenue and Marine Drive showing our 12 story building. The building facade is organized using a two story grid and details articulated to give the elevations a sense of depth. We can see the main entry and residential lobby at the lower levels facing Marine Drive with residential levels from levels three through 12. Next slide. Zooming in, we have a close up view of the main entry. The main entry is set back following the 25 foot landscape setback along Marine Drive and is fronted by a ground level plaza with built in seating. The building materials are high quality face brick, metal panel, and wood veneer rain screen. Bird safe glazing is incorporated at the large expanses of lobby glass. Next. This is the elevation along Wilson Avenue. We have a variety of architectural materials and detailing. This is incorporated to enhance the pedestrian experience along the sidewalk. Our U-shaped building allows a setback to occur above level three. Active uses along Wilson include the main lobby, which you can see to the right, a large bike room you can see on either side of the stair tower. Architectural details extend from the third floor amenity deck down in front of the podium along the entire facade. Next. Here we're at Clarendon and Wilson, this is the west leg of our tower. Similar materials and expression are employed here as on other sides that we've looked at. You can see the second egress stair terminating at the base of the building. This creates also a second uh, ground level plaza at the southwest corner of the site. Next. Swinging around to the north side of the building, you can see it's adjacency to Weiss Hospital. This is really a four-sided building uh, seen in the round. So we've maintained the same architectural expression and material quality as employed on all other facades. With that, I'll hand it back to Paul. Next slide, please. The, the, the design of this building and 
here and today are the end of a process that began at January of 2020. And just wanted to lay out that a number of meetings have occurred. I can go through each of these, but we began with meetings with the aldermen, did an intake submission with Department of Planning and Development, made some changes to design, the design based on that, and have also met with the Uptown United Development Partners twice, with the Lakeshore Area Neighbors Association, with the 46th Ward Zoning and Development Committee um, prior to coming to you today. Next slide. There have been some changes based on this review process. The original proposal at 14 stories was reduced to 12 stories, the podium from 37 feet to 30, the number of dwelling units from 315, I'm sorry, 350 to 314. Uh, there were some changes to improve both the east and north elevations, which Bob described, uh, and changes to the main entry and marine drive elevation. That was all before January of this year, and since then, in response to additional comments from the community, the aldermen uh, and the zoning and development committee, there are changes to the glass, uh, to address bird safety issues, to address ride share management, tree preservation and, and other landscaping feature and the electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, actually, I'm gonna turn it back to Bob at this point. Sorry, Bob, this is your area of expertise. Uh, sure. Take it from here. Yeah, so this, this summarizes what Paul was describing, kind of where we started and where we are today um, through a process, including uh, many, many reviews. Uh, we, we improved the project over time and we, we feel this is in a good, good place today. Uh, next slide. So I'll walk through a few of our floor plans here. We have the ground level floor plan situated uh, within the site context. Again, you can see the main entry at the southeast corner with a uh, brand new 25 foot setback conti continuously landscaped um, uh, section along the, the existing sidewalk. We think that'll be a really great enhancement to the experience along Marine Drive. Um, our, our lobby contains other residential support spaces, including a, a very large 157 um, rack bike storage for the residences. We also have a dog uh, dog room at the north uh, corner of our, of our building. All building utilities are organized along the north side. Uh, this gives access to our loading dock, to our trash room from the existing uh, private service drive. The, uh, the only new curb cut is on Clarendon that accesses our two level parking garage. Uh, there is an existing curb cut on Wilson that will be removed as part of our project. Next. Here's our typical floor plan. Um, the plan overall is a mix of studios, one beds and two beds. As Paul mentioned, 314 total units uh, occurring on 10 residential floors. You'll notice the, uh, the elevator lobby as well as both egress stairs occur at the plan edges, bringing daylight um, to the uh, interior public spaces. Next. Uh, here's our roof plan. Uh, we are committing to at least 50% minimum extensive green roof. Most of this occurs at the very top of the building. Uh, we have amenity, outdoor amenity spaces planned for level three and level 12. Uh, all mechanical equipment occurs within a uh, screened in penthouse. It'll all be fully screened from, uh, from the perimeter. Next. So going through the four elevations, this, this um, is, is duplicates what we saw in the 3D views. This I is the south this view from Wilson. I did he ever had to do. But now I am gone. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, this is our east elevation. Again, you can see the main entry from Marine Drive. Next. Here's the elevation to the north facing the hospital. Um, next slide. And our west elevation along Clarendon. Next. So here's a building section. It shows the organization of our two parking garage levels, 10 residential levels with mechanical panels at the top and residential lobby at the uh, southeast corner. So we've included a few massing and material diagrams. On the left, this is along Wilson Avenue. This shows a variety of massing moves and materials that helps activate the pedestrian experience there. 
on the right, you can see our double height entry portal. This is a brick and wood element that places visual priority on the main entry um, with level three set back and then the level four building tower starting up above. Next slide. And here we have a partial uh, diagram of the top of the building facing Marine Drive. This is to highlight the unique architectural details that occur at the top of the building, differentiating from the bottom and middle, creating the, that classic architectural composition. Next slide. So a few points on our traffic plan. Um, our project location provides convenient access to bus stops immediately adjacent, the existing bus stops immediately adjacent to the site on both Clarendon and Marine Drive. And the Wilson Red Light stop is less than a half mile to the west. Um, our development improvement includes 100% screen parking, loading dock in the rear, and a new standing zone on Marine Drive. Uh, the standing zone is intended to reduce the impact to existing traffic patterns for quick deliveries, taxis, Ubers, et cetera. Next. Uh, we've submitted a full traffic study by KLOA. Um, the study concluded no adverse impact to the surrounding uh, community. Um, we wanted to show that way back when at the beginning of the project, we looked at many various massing options for the site. Um, these were reviewed and discussed with DPD. Um, you can see we, we've got a variety of orientations of the tower. Ultimately, we landed on option five. This is a U-shaped building with the uh, podium courtyard facing south. This proved to be a really efficient plan and it provided the most um, access to daylight and views for the majority of the uh, residential units. Next, please. Um, pedestrian orientation and urban design, um, fully complying with the zoning code. We focused on articulated and active facades and our building massing complements the surrounding, uh, the existing um, surrounding neighborhood and, and maintains a pedestrian streetscape. Next, please. This is our landscape plan. Uh, as you saw with the green roof at the top, the landscape plan highly increases permeability of what is currently just a surface parking lot. Um, this attractive landscape will uh, attract pollinators and we think adds to the beauty of the site. Uh, we've surveyed all existing street trees, um, which occur on Marine and Wilson. Uh, we're striving to maintain those and think we will be able to save all trees except for two. Next, please. Uh, closer look at our material, uh, material palette, um, including quality face brick throughout, metal panel accents in a couple of different colors, aluminum windows with high, performing, high, high performance vision glass, and low iron uh, glass used only down at the lobby levels. Next, please. Uh, sustainable development policy, path to 100 points, um, we are focused on overall building energy efficiency, water efficiency, enhanced landscape design, and including EV charging stations within our new parking garage. Next, please. And to the stormwater management ordinance, uh, volume is controlled by green roof and other added impervious landscape areas uh, around the site. Detention will be a chamber system underneath the parking ramp. After construction, our project will improve the existing conditions by decreasing surface runoff from the existing parking lot. And with that, I'll send it back to Paul. Thanks, Bob. Um, I do want to address the ARO. Um, this project will, as I mentioned earlier, contain 314 dwelling units. Um, we will satisfy the requirements of the ARO by providing eight units on site available to residents who qualify at or below 60% of AMI. And an unusual feature of this project is that the in lieu fee payment for the other 23 units of about $3.08 million will be directed toward Sarah's Circle, another project in the ward uh, that's written into the ordinance. And that project will provide housing available to people who are eligible at or below 30% of AMI generally. Um, so I wanted to point that out. Uh, the alderman very much wanted the other units to be on site, and that's what Lincoln will do. 
Uh, next slide, please. Just to summarize some of the economic and community benefits, uh, Lincoln will of course seek to achieve the city's goals with respect to NBE, WBE and city resident hiring. Uh, we expect this project to generate between approximately a thousand construction jobs, 200 on the site at any one time, six permanent jobs. The estimated project budget is about 80 to 90 million. As noted earlier, there will be the $3.087 million paid into the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund, but directed to Sarah's Circle. We expect the project to generate somewhat in excess of a million dollars a year in property taxes. Um, as noted earlier, all of the parking and loading is pulled on site with only a single curb cut, transforming a surface parking lot into a first class uh, residential structure and seeking no city funds. Um, with that, I would just respectfully request the plan commissioner's support for the lakefront and PD applications. And I did wanna note that our entire team is available to address issues that have been raised today. Uh, we also have Irene Dumanis from Weiss Hospital who is available to address questions that may be raised by the plan commission. Um, and um, that's really it for now. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Catherine. Thank you. Again, for the record, Catherine Heard from DPD. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the project materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that this proposal is in compliance with the applicable policies of the Lakefront Plan of Chicago and the purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance. It has also been concluded that the proposal, the proposed development would be appropriate for the following reasons, um, has gone through uh, the required public review um, has uh, encourages unified planning and development is designed to reinforce desirable urban features and the um, publicly visible sides of the building have been finished um, in good urban design. So please refer to the staff report for further details regarding this proposal and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the Zoning Administrator of the Department of Planning and Development, this application being in conformance with the provisions of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance be approved, subject to compliance with the plans presented to you today. It is also the recommendation of the Zoning Administrator for this application to amend the existing plan development number 37, be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning Landmarks and Building Standards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hurd. Um, Alderman Koppelman, I know that you're here. Would you like to, to uh, make some comments? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman uh, Cordova. I, I wanted to mention Paul gave a good layout about all the different meetings. But I also want to point out that all those meetings were recorded and uh, posted on the 46 Ward website. In addition, uh, Lakeside Area Neighbors submitted 94 questions that were also answered, and those questions were also posted on the website as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Weiss Hospital. This is a hospital that serves many of our seniors and our families uh, who have Medicaid and, and uh, Medicare. Uh, the thing I like most about this particular pro, uh, hospital is that it has a gender confirmation program. I'm a former licensed clinical social worker who's worked in a number of different hospitals in Chicago. And I remember uh, when I had uh, people who wanted uh, to transition, um, I would have to refer them out of state. This is, exists right in this community. Um, the uh, Weiss Hospital also reaches out to those people who are living on the streets, who are living in tents and in the parks that are all along the lakefront. And so they open up their hospital as a warming center uh, to help those in need. They also did a very good job of uh, really reaching out to the community to provide uh, COVID vaccinations, especially those people who are hesitant or uh, English was not their first language. They really did a good job of uh, reaching out to them. Uh, I have spoken passionately to uh, Commissioner Navarro in the past about the need for affordable housing, especially for people earning 15% or less of the area median income. What I like about this particular uh, project is 
close to $3.1 million of in lieu will be given to Sarah Circle. Sarah Circle provides housing to the most vulnerable. Many of these women have a chronic mental illness. They have gone through multiple traumas. They've never felt safe before in their lives. And Sarah Circle uh, provides housing to this group. Uh, for people on SSI, Supplemental Security Income, they typically, well, they get $792 a month. Um, so for them to have an affordable apartment, that's $264 a month. It's a third of 792. That does not exist in this city. It does not exist in this country. That's why it's so important that when we provide affordable housing to the most vulnerable, we, we, we have to provide heavy subsidies. And this will provide the heavy subsidies uh, to provide housing to, uh, to this group of residents who call uh, uptown their home. And so um, uh, th this is, I, I can't stress enough, um, how important this is. Typically, a lot of neighborhoods don't like offsite housing because they can't guarantee that this offsite housing will benefit the residents in the community. Here we do. And not only does it benefit uh, members of the community, it's a, a 40, uh, this project, uh, Sarah Circle, will be constructed at 4747 North Sheridan. It's just two blocks away, um, but it, it houses people who earn 15% or less of the area median income. Some of the residents at Sarah Circle have zero income. Uh, their only alternative is the streets. So now they get the opportunity to not only have a safe place to live, but they also have wraparound services to help them live to their fullest potential. So I ask, um, uh, all of you to please support this um, project. Thank you. Any qu uh, questions from Commissioner uh, Reyes? Go ahead. Um, I, I briefly, I just want to say, I agree with what Alderman Kaplan mentioned. I, I think that from my perspective, and I am very familiar with, uh, with Sarah's uh, place, um, I don't see that we need to take from one opportunity to give to another. Uh, there are opportunities within the Illinois Housing Development Authority in terms of just applying for support of housing, which is exactly what you're describing, which is critically, criti I mean, there's no doubt that there is a significant need of that type of housing. Uh, so don't get me wrong. I am not against Sarah's circle. I think this is, the, they need to continue to have the, the, the funding that is needed to produce that type of housing. But from my perspective, it doesn't have to be at the expense of having 31 families living in this beautiful building if they would have done all the units on site. And I understand this is what Commissioner Cox said early that I see this from the affordable housing perspective as just providing the minimum, exactly what is, you know, the 2015 ARO requires as the minimum. So I, I cannot wait until the new 2021 ARO comes in place. Um, so that's kind. Of, that's my general comment. I, I just want to make one little comment. Um, when Sarah Circle went before Ida, Ida said they would provide assistance to help Sarah Circle on the condition that the city of Chicago would also contribute um, a portion as well, a, around three uh, million dollars to meet that. And so this this meets the requirement that Ida has placed on Sarah Circle to fund this project. I, I, I understand that, but it's sad for me to see that we have to take from one opportunity to be able to produce the other. That's, all, that's the comment that I'm making. We need to push the envelope harder to be able to get both. In other words, what she's arguing for is the idea of providing these the affordable housing on site. Um, uh, Commissioner Cox. Thank you, Commissioner Reyes. Commissioner Cox. Uh, so this is a very... Uh very rich and important conversation that we're having. So, you know, please uh, for, forgive us for indulging. There are lots and lots of testimony today of people who absolutely love their uptown neighborhood and they're very protective of it. And I, you know, and they have a good reason to be. I, I've toured it with um, Alderman Kaplan and uh, they, have an, uh, they have a really wonderful cross section of affordable housing. And what I heard today are people who are fiercely afraid of losing that affordability. 
And so I think their sentiments are completely understood. Uh, that's, that said, I feel also that they have to understand uh, the hospital and the situation they're in, sitting on a very valuable parking lot that is generating no revenue uh, for them and the ability for them to take them the proceeds that they get from that uh, parking lot and put it right back into medical services for that community. That's absolutely important. And I actually also believe that the commitment um, to, um, to Sarah's circle to give a very vulnerable population uh, housing with dignity uh, in that area, uh, we should be, I, I was surprised that people did not think that that was uh, um, inconsistent with the values that Uptown has. I think it is. Uh, I think it very much is. And I'm, you know, I'm, I want Sarah Circle's housing to look as good uh, as this housing. And so I hope that we have the, the wherewithal economically to make sure that Sarah Circle is an exemplar of supportive housing. And I don't know a whole lot about uh, that project, but I'm going to be watching very, very closely to make sure that it is as gorgeous uh, as this building we're seeing. So I'm very supportive of this. I think the they've been the Alderman has been incredibly creative uh, in getting uh, the very best for his community out of this development. Uh, so I certainly hope um, that um, he has the support. Um, to move this uh, project forward. I won't even speak about you know, the architecture because it's exemplary, uh, it's excellent, uh, but I also found their strategy for how to get, um, to have other people benefit from what some people are seeing as a loss. Uh, I wanna applaud them for going that extra mile. Uh, and to, uh, to my colleague Reyes's comment, I, I am tired of seeing people meet the minimum, the bare minimum affordable housing, uh, we should be pivoting to people doing, going beyond the call of duty. Uh, and I actually think that the commitment to Sarah, Sarah Circle is an example of going beyond call of duty. So that's my, uh, my thoughts on the matter. Thank you. Commissioner Osterman. Thank you. Um, a question to the representative from Weiss Hospital. Um, I think some of the comments earlier and some of the comments that I've heard in the community is that um, the sale of this and the development of this property will hurt the long-term financial, um, you know, the financial stability of Weiss. And Weiss has been a critical hospital in our community for um, for many, many, many years. So I think if uh, if you could respond to, you know, how this, if this, goes through is Weiss going to be in financial hardship and close and would this be the impetus for doing that absolutely thank you so much for having me on today so my name is Irene Demonis and I'm the chief executive officer of Weiss Hospital I've been part of all the meetings um, that um, Alderman almost all the meetings that Alderman Kappelman had held with the community and heard all of the questions and their concerns I can tell you that the hospital is not closing. I can tell you that Pipeline made a commitment to invest 100% of the proceeds from the sale of the lot into the back into the facility. And what this will allow us to do is to continue to grow programs such as um, Alderman, you have mentioned. One, our, one of our flagship pro programs is the gender confirmation surgery program. That program was actually recently moved from the suburbs back into our medical office building, which allows us to continue to grow the program to provide these patients with other services in a safe um, space and safe environment. In addition, we have expanded our um, behavioral health services by opening up um, outpatient behavioral health program just in the beginning of 2020. And even with the pandemic, when we were not able to see patients in person, we made sure that we're able to reach out to these patients through telehealth visits because we understand the need in our community. I can tell you that we are watching that particular service line very closely. We know um, that behavioral health is underserved, so we are going to be expanding our inpatient geriatric behavioral health program to add additional beds and um, continue to serve our 65 plus community. Over 60% of our patients are from that community. and. Um, 
recently WISE became um, designated hospital uh, or designated as a senior friendly, age friendly facility, which allows us to provide um, excellent service to this community as well. We're looking at um, other programs such as Women's Health Program. We started that program at, um, in the beginning of 2020 and supplementing our um, two excellent physicians with a breast surgeon that just came on board in the beginning of July. Um, we are a, an acute hospital that serves this community. We, you know, are very in tune with, 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 with what this community needs. We understand that we have a senior population that's significant. We also understand that we have younger population that runs along our lake front and sometimes injuries happen. So between our orthopedic and spine program and our sports medicine program that is also expanding, we'll continue to bring these services to the community. I can tell you that we just started the construction um, and renovating um, our fifth floor, our first floor, and our second floor to um, bring the state-of-the-art orthopedic program into this community, including robotic surgery. So this community hospital now has total joint replacement robotic surgery as well as spine robotic surgery with physicians employed by Weiss Hospital and the aldermen and Senators Simmons and Feigenholz and Representative Harris and um, Croak were able to tour our construction just a few weeks ago. So I guess my, it's my long-winded answer to tell you that we're here to stay. We're actively investing. Our total investment is over $40 million so far between the programs that I have mentioned, the facilities, and um, the new electronic medical record system. Pipeline is committed to continue to see this hospital grow and serve this community. Um, okay, we're gonna hold your feet to the fire on that. And I think I um, the elected stakeholders in the community and the, the or surrounding, and I'm in that, but my residents go there. Um, I think with COVID where it is and the mental health um, impact of COVID on people from all walks of life, I think there's lots of services that I think people desperately need um, in this part of the city. And I think uh, you can grow in a good way, but the goal is to keep you open and thriving and, and serving our community. So um, we'll be watching how that goes. I think uh, to to the, the development, um, as the chairman of the housing and real estate committee and the neighboring alderman, I'm a big believer in doing units on site. In, the, in our ward, we do that. However, um, in this situation, um, knowing Sarah's circle as I do, and um, being quite frankly, very jealous of what Alderman Kappelman has done with Sarah's circle, giving them property and having them develop to help women who desperately need it and who otherwise would be on the street. Um, I think this is a really important use um, to help the women that will be impacted by these units that will be developed, specifically at the corner where the building will be built. I think that's going to also be an added benefit to um, that part of the uptown community. So um, seeing that, I will be in support of this, but um, I appreciate the, your comments from Weiss, and I will be looking forward to supporting any way I can, your ongoing efforts, um, but also want to make sure that you're there and we'll hold you to your commitments. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Before I call on Commissioner Lyons, um, kind of along the lines of the hospital. So you're using the parking lot here, here if you're what you're trying to do here is use the parking lot for development. Where will they where will the patients park when they go to the hospital? So the hospital has a parking um, 12 story uh, sorry, six story parking lot adjacent to the hospital um, right off of Clarendon which has a bridge that's connecting that uh, parking structure to the second floor of our medical office building. That parking structure we just recently renovated. We invest about $12 million into renovating that parking structure, and it can absorb um, all the parking that we have in the flat lot. In addition, it can absorb a significant increase in the hospital's um, operations as well. All right, thank you. Commissioner Lyons. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify the, am I understanding correctly that the, instead of doing the affordable onsite, it's the, the 3 million in lieu fee, and that will be directed to the Sarah Circle. One, I well, guess. I, I, I can answer that, Commissioner Lyons. It's a quarter of the units will be on site. They, they could, the, the ARO provides that those units may be on site or at a location within two miles of the site. Those units will be on site. The other 75% of the requirement will be provided through the payment of the in lieu money. 
Understood. Thank you for the clarification. Um, before, you, before you go to ne your next point, uh, Commissioner Lyons, I want to kind of follow up on your question there. So, um, and Noah, maybe since, since Commissioner Nevada isn't here, um, so the, the payment in lieu, what's been suggested here is that's going straight to Sarah's Circle, but I thought it went into a fund. Yeah, I, I can explain that too, unless Noah, unless you want to, Noah. Go ahead, Paul, and I'll fill in if you're incorrect. Sure, fair, fair enough. Um, it will be put into an escrow fund that will be made available to Sarah's Circle at the time of construction. There's a deadline. They have a certain period of time after which it would go back into the city's broader affordable housing fund. But it's being essentially sequestered in that escrow for use by Sarah's Circle. Because, okay. you know, the timing of the construction is a little bit different. They're still working on their capital stack. And when they do that, they will then draw on that escrow to build. Well, obviously, that's Correct. allowed. Um, um, go ahead, Noah. Chair, gonna... Chairwoman, I was just going to add that I believe Alderman Kaplan sent around the letter, and in his letter, he attached to it the uh, commitment letter from the Department of Housing for the Sarah Circle project that said if this project were built and if this fund were to be paid, it would cover the uh, request for um, bridge funding that they would need from the city. And that and was part of the Alderman's uh, letter. And Chairwoman well, Cordova, it's also that's also in the plan development statements that's set forth. Thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Lyons. Uh, thank you. No, and thank you for the, the follow up. Um, I guess I'm just, I, I, in, um, you know, piggybacking a little bit on Commissioner Reyes's comments um, that it just generally it feels, it doesn't feel great to, to feel like we're, you know, that the, and I, I wonder if it, if it really is a but for um, this that um, Sarah Circle would be able to be built, but I guess the it it does still feel like it's the bare minimum of the um, of the sort of the letter of the law of the in lieu fee um, going towards this, and I just think um, you know given sort of the, where the community's at um, that uh, that we should be able to do both um, to do the to do on site and to do um, to do a project that that fits the community um, and. Um, provide the funding that's needed for Sarah Circle. Um, so I just hope um, in these conversations we can move move towards that. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Moore. Um, thank you. I just wanted to uh, go on record saying that I really like the model where the money is given directly to a local nonprofit organization that does housing development in the community. And I think we should think about that uh, going forward. That way, uh, the developer could keep doing the development they're doing, and we could get some capacity to smaller developers, nonprofit developers, or local developers in the community. Cool. Great. Um, thank you. Um, okay. I I'm not sure how to ask my questions, but I, I, I uh, but I do know that. Um, you know, Commissioner Cox made reference to the passion, the numbers of passionate people who came with their concerns about uh, the increasing rate, increasing amount and rate of the gentrification that's occurring um, in Uptown. Uptown, I think it was also mentioned that it's a port of entry, it has been, always been, um, and a very diverse neighborhood. And and the, and the the data shows, in fact, that that's that that is changing. And so, um, you know. It's, it's in a sense, it's a bigger issue than any one particular development. Um, it's a difficult one, but it still seems like um, every development project is an opportunity to think about this and think about what can be done to, um, to help stem the tide of that. And, and I think their point was that adding another, lux or adding another luxury condo uh, building is, is going to move things further along in, uh, in that trend. And, I, and as you point out, Commissioner Cox, they're, um, they're worried about losing uh, the character um, and the composition of their neighborhood. So this is really tough. And in addition to what we heard, I just kind of want to hold this up. I don't know if you guys can see it there, but no, you probably can't because of my, um, here, maybe you can see there. That's the stack of just items that we received just on this, uh, the letters we received just on this item. It's what, a couple inches thick. Um, and so I got through most of them. And so it was, um, you know, I think some of them have been, uh, some of them are really hard to address. Um, some of them I think have already been addressed in the questions we're asking. Um, I guess one of the big questions that sort of, the two things that got raised that I thought were interesting um, that 
for two additional things that got raised that I thought were interesting. One was by the, the, the person who identified herself as a scientist, a PhD in science of some sort and uh, assumed environmental related science, uh, re uh, reminding us of our, our responsibility to protect the lakefront um, and raising issues um, around what might be the potential impact of, of further development along the lakefront. I, I'm not sure where to take that in terms of a, a question for our body, um, but that was, that was one issue I think somehow I'd like to see that somehow that addressed. Uh, there were a lot of comments that were made about transportation, about traffic uh, and the traffic flow and the generation of the traffic flow. And maybe that's something that Commissioner Biagi or the developers themselves could address. Um, and then there was a third one, third issue, and uh, which is the issue generally around the character of the surrounding area and whether or not this development really fit within the character of that area. And I noticed even um, in the slides that were presented to us from DPD, it was not recommended to us to support this because it fit within the character. And so based on the testimony that we heard it, I think, and the letters, this very thick pile of letters here, that I think part of their point was that it doesn't fit within the character of the neighborhood and it's fundamentally changing the character. And, and that, that point really, I think is probably an easy, um, was, was, a, was a tough one. To, I think there, you know, there, there may be some things we really need to think through on that. Um, so those were some of the things that, that really struck me in listening to what people had to say and going through, and going through these letters. Um, uh, just, and then a minor point that I wanted to make. I know that the developer's presentation says something about as a result of meetings, or no, that was a different one, never mind. It was about the, the bird buildings, the bird, uh, was it this one? We, where, you, where the comment was he changed the windows to because the neighbors raised the I think that's a city or city requirement that that the uh, windows have to be protected of beer, a beer, a bird. So that wasn't something that was done to ingratiate anybody. That's a requirement. But um, so anyway, so maybe we can get a little conversation going on this, uh, Commissioner Tunney and then Commissioner Biagi. Chairwoman, I have more of more of an issue just about the plan development process, not about the issues okay. that you brought up. So okay. Okay, I we'll can, come I'll I can come hold back. on that. All right, thank you, Commissioner. I'll come back to you. Commissioner Biagi, were you going to address the traffic perhaps? I was going to address, yeah, a little bit of it. I, um, I think in terms of, you know, the traffic planning, uh, we did take a close look at it. We feel comfortable with it. I think the, the existing parking and the investments that the hospitals made in that structure is very helpful uh, to ameliorate any challenges here. So uh, we feel comfortable with it. Um, I also wanted to address the shoreline question because that is something that CDOT's very involved with, um, certainly end-to-end. Uh, uh, -end, it's a climate challenge. We, we also paid attention to the New York Times article that you mentioned earlier, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and so one of the projects that is eventually coming this way is the North Lakeshore Drive reconstruction, and that includes um, a significant amount of attenuation for wave action along with redoing the drive um, so that would run right along here. Um, and so that's a work in progress. That's many years of work that uh, preceded me and that will continue on. Um, and we're sort of in this, in this conceptual uh, somewhat engineering phase right now. Um, and so that, I think that helps address a couple of things that will also touch on um, how we can do a better job with managing traffic flows that are happening right on that part of the lakefront, really emphasizing public transit uh, as much as possible, uh, but then also getting toward that wave action attenuation. And I'll yeah. leave to the developer to fill in on anything else uh, on the traffic plan that you wanna uh, add to that. Thank you, Commissioner Biagi. And it's really great to hear that, you know, that, that it is something that that you and your team are, are thinking about it because it, it really does point to again a, a, a really huge and important conversation I think for us um, again not only as it relates to this development but even more generally so thank you I appreciate sure. the thoughts. Um, developers want to respond to the issue around the traffic? Uh, Paul Shadel again if there are specific questions for the traffic engineer we can certainly have him answer those. I would just note as a general matter that there was pretty robust conversation with both DPD and CDOT around the design of the site and using the existing drive on the north side that separates this parcel from the remainder of the hospital campus and reducing the curb cuts that you know interfere with surrounding traffic to only the one on Clarendon. Uh, again, it was, it was not just sort of plopped down on the page. It was a pretty well thought out design. But again, we can answer any specific questions about the traffic, but the traffic study did conclude that the project 
as designed would be compatible with the surrounding right of way network. Okay, thank you. Um, does it does the traffic uh, your traffic person want to say anything generally? I mean, I guess your your point is if we have any specific questions, um, and I don't. I think. I mean, it was really wanting to get a confirmation of what you just said, but- Sure, did, Mr. Did Abuna it? is here, I believe. I, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, Louie Abuna with KLOA. Uh, uh, Paul is correct. I mean, our analysis took into account uh, the intersection surrounding the site. Um, obviously, this is um, uh, not gonna be an auto-centric development. Uh, there is uh, ample alternative modes of transportation um, you know, in terms of proximity to to the L and to other, uh, you know, bus lines. So we anticipate um, a significant reduction in the amount of traffic. Uh, you know, the the access being on Clarendon will, uh, to the garage, uh, will minimize the impact and the interaction with the hospital uh, ambulance traffic uh, that uses that common access drive on the north side of the, uh, of the property. Um, our analysis generally showed that the intersections nearby uh, namely, uh, Wilson with Clarendon and Wilson with Marine uh, generally have adequate reserve capacity to accommodate this additional traffic. So we did not conclude there will be any significant impact. Uh, and CDOT has reviewed the traffic study and um, they've concurred with, with our findings as well. Thank you. And I did notice that uh, I figured there was, there was transportation around that area because I did notice the number of units compared to the number of parking spaces are going to be available. Um, so I think it was 314 units and 126 or something parking units. So that's 136, Commissioner. 136. Thank you. So that's um, I guess that 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 suggests you're encouraging people to not drive so much. Correct. Um, what about the the other issue that came up is that people that people raised was about the 200 and I'm sorry about the several historic buildings um, in the area that this uh, this was a uh, th this was not compatible with those historic buildings or somehow it was going to negatively impact those historic buildings. Any, any comments or thoughts about that? I mean, I, I, mean, I would just comment uh, today, we've see, we saw one building uh, that was uh, a kind of hyper classicist building uh, everything else we've seen uh, was squarely planted in the 21st century. Um, so I, I think that is the dominant uh, trend is in to that, build- in that, in that area right around there. I'm talking, about, yeah. I'm talking about the immediate area. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, I think uh, we, 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 we see buildings all the time before this body that are in the midst of historic areas with historic buildings. Uh, and they still are designing with the technology and the uh, construction methods of our time. So I'm not confident that uh, we have a whole lot of choice here, but to use the uh, technologies of our time and the, the character and the language of our time. Uh, well, that, that makes sense, but I think that's part of why people were opposing it because they didn't want the, the, the character of that area to change with that sort of introduction of, of, a, of, a, of the modern architecture I mean, and we can you know, we know there are certain neighborhoods where you wouldn't want those kinds of buildings interjected into that given their given the historic nature of and i think that's what i understood to be the argument they were raising or that i read in the comments uh, mr valerio were you going to comment on that specifically yes very very quickly um, uh, first of all the context of sorry the joe could you identify yourself oh i'm sorry joe valerio Valerio Duval train uh, architects for the project. I apologize for being um, uh, ignoring that requirement. Um, you have to understand the context is a mix of modern buildings, including Weiss Hospital and uh, the adjacent uh, uh, Lake Towers building. Uh, the modern buildings are brick. The historic buildings are brick. The modern buildings use earth tones in their brick. The historic buildings use earth stones in their brick. Um, we tried to design a building that created a bridge between some pretty awful modern buildings and the wonderful historic buildings. And we worked very hard with that uh, in that effort. And we worked uh, very closely with DPD's uh, staff to create that bridge. And I think, I think that bridge is what we're trying to achieve uh, because 
I think the unfortunate building, new hotel building downtown makes no gesture to anything but an era that is gone. Thank you. Um, well, just, I, I don't want to debate this now, but just that last <laughs> comment could be a justification for destroying all the older buildings in the city, but we won't go there with that one. We'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll we won't. Uh, yeah, yeah I, 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 I don't think, I, I, don't I didn't say we, we should we should demolish old buildings. I just, I just oh, basically but, said, you but, have but, to, to consider them as the context. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm just saying the idea that, oh, well, you know, we're in a new era. Let's, you know, so it's almost like, you know, the next sentence to be raises all kinds of other possibilities here that might not be the path that we want to go down. But, but I understood it, what else you were saying. So anyway, uh, Mr. Buck, uh, uh, Michael Berkshire, what were you going to add? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Berkshire, and I've been uh, shepherding this project through uh, this process. And I just wanted to take a minute to talk briefly about the resilience and the sustainability associated with this and its impact on the lakefront. Um, just to, uh, to remind everyone, this is currently a very dark asphalt parking lot. And the proposed development with its green roof and also the amount of landscaping that it's, it's providing is actually adding to the permeability of this, exist, of this site, meaning its ability to absorb <laughs> the amount of rainfall that falls on that site. So there will be less storm water leaving this particular parcel than it than is now. And that is significant because storm water entering our overburdened combined sewer system is what causes a lot of our issues associated with water quality uh, in Chicago. So this is actually improving the sustainability and the resilience of this particular parcel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, and thanks for raising the issue of stormwater. I noticed on some of the projects we heard today, there were some uh, projects who said they went over and above and, and described um, very quickly, but uh, some some rather innovative approaches to the stormwater, at least went a little bit above and beyond. And then there were others that were just at the minimum. And um, I think we do, I think it, the whole issue of how we do stormwater is really important and uh, encourage all the developers to continue to be um, innovative about, about how we do stormwater. Um, okay, well, listen, I think people, thank you, thank you everybody, because I think you understand and agree that given the passion and the amount of not only public testimony, but the, um, you know, the, the numbers of letters and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, the real um, sincere love of their neighborhood that, that we witnessed today and through these letters, I think it's, it was important for us to, to vet and to consider what was being raised. I think, uh, I think I, I got the ones I think that I, I, I could remember. And, and, we, and if there's any other issues that people want to raise that came out of public testimony, please feel free to do so. Commissioner uh, Roman, could I say one thing? Please, Mr. Please, Alderman, go ahead. This is Alderman Kappelman. Uh, I think I, I agree with the passion that a lot of the residents have about affordable housing. What we're realizing is that a lot of people are moving into this area for two reasons. There's been some great infrastructure improvements like the $203 million makeover of the Wilson L, but also violent crime in this area has dropped down to historic lows, like, like we've never seen ever before. And so this area is becoming very, very popular. And what we found is that if we don't provide more housing stock due to the great demand, they'll go after our biggest amount of affordable housing. And that's our naturally occurring affordable housing. And that's what we really need to protect. So I, I joined with the residents, like, let's protect that. But we do that by actually addressing the high demand for housing because our area has become very safe uh, and it's very transit friendly now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, no, thank you, I appreciate that. And it helps also to further the point about the connection between uh, the residents' concerns about the changing character of the neighborhood and, and affordable housing, which is why our earlier conversation about affordable housing um, is so important. And, um, and, and what we hope we don't see is any, is any conversions, right, from uh, yes. from, from previously affordable housing to, to high rises. So it's, it's kind of a different conversation to talk about taking a, a parking lot that now is gonna be put into a, a, a property tax revenue generating 
property versus another property that maybe is torn down to make way for condos. And that's, we've seen that in a lot of other neighborhoods where we've lost affordable housing. So I think it becomes important commissioners that um, that there not be a trend in uptown to 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 take down buildings and, and, and that are affordable and replace them with these these new high rise condos. Yes. Uh, it's a different situation here. So um, and it was clear also uh, Alderman Copperman you know that you that you you know that you took this process very seriously, thought about it a lot and and uh, created many opportunities for people to be engaged, which is part I think why we ended up with with so much uh, passionate feedback. Um, all right, thank you everybody. Madam, Commissioner Madam Chair, if I could just jump in, I apologize. I was remiss in rushing through my presentation. I did wanna thank the Alderman Kappelman and Commissioners Cox and Novara and the various city departments for engaging with us over a long period of time and just say that we very much appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Shadow, appreciate that. Okay, Commissioner Tunney, you've been patient, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Uh, as a Alderman that, um, had to go through a plan development process to re uh, retain a hospital in their neighborhood. I just wanted to bring some of that history uh, into questions that I have about the Weiss uh, plan development. So the plan development, I believe, has three or four, how many parcels in it? Four parcels, one of which is, one of which is the request for this development, correct? The, it, it, is to get out of the plan development for hospital use to use, uh, to sell this lot for um, for uh, market rate housing or mix of uh, housing, that's correct? Uh, Commissioner Tunney, I can address, it, it actually has three sub areas with sub sub areas in sub area A. Uh, there, is in, it, there is actually today in sub area C, which is, I don't know if, if, if uh, we could put up the slide that shows the whole thing. Anyway, on the west side of Clarendon, the northwest corner of Clarendon and Wilson, that's sub area C, which today is fully residential. There's the sub area A1A in which this building would be located, which would be residential. There's sub area A1B to the north, which contains the hospital and actually does allow residential, but there's no residential there today. And then there's sub area B, which is again on the west side of Clarendon and that's the parking structure. That's how it's structured today. And the request is to amend the plan development to leave this sub area in the plan development, but to allow this building to be built. Which was a predetermined uh, use. It says, uh, you know, the, when I worked with St. Joe's, uh, all parcels had to be medical and medical in use. And if they were to, uh, have any other use, they would have to go back to the plan commission and get relief on the use. Is that so? That isn't that is not the same as Weiss. Well, I think it's a little different in structure, but that's true, Commissioner. That is why we're here is to request that approval for the for, for the pure residential use at this portion of the site. You are correct. Okay, so um, I think that gets to the question that Alderman or that Alderman Osterman talked about. And I, I, I think that's been the concern of some of our other electeds uh, about whether Weiss will commit to hospital use for the, you know, not even foreseeable, okay? But the real concern is the trust factor, I believe, in this hospital remaining a hospital. There are other issues about gentrification and whatever, but I think, the concern um, is that um, Weiss is, this is step one of selling off these properties. And if they were unfortunately to come back and to amend another parcel or God forbid, um, the, um, the asking to get out of the use, what protections are the community, do the community have in regards to uh, the unfortunate day someday that the hospital decides to leave. They would have to amend it legislatively though, commissioner, in order to eliminate the hospital I, use, to change it to another use. Similar to what, similar to what we're doing today? It would, have to, it would have to go through the full legislative process, yes. And every parcel, I mean, it would, you know, I mean, they've got the other, the other parcels. So, you know, I, I think that that's 
I think that's a major concern. Um, and I've spoken to a number of electives and I've also talked to Alderman Kappelman. Um, I think our state people deal with healthcare in a different perspective. And as you know, we're finding ways with Mercy Hospital on the south side about, you know, we can't close these hospitals. And obviously the community is very concerned about not just this, you know, reinvestment based on the proceeds, but I think they're just scared as heck that this hospital is going to go away because the land value and the economics of hospitals make the land sometimes more valuable than the operation. And without, um, you know, and that's, I, that's a concern that I think Alderman Osterman has talked about. And I know Alderman Kappelman's concern, but I, there's no way we can guarantee that that hospital will be here 25 years from now. Is, is that correct, Paul? <laughs> That is true. Uh, yeah. We can't even guarantee that we will be here 25 years from now. Well, the city will be here. So. Well, I'm talking about us individually or institutions outside right. of the city. Yes, the city right. is forever. But I, I think the point you're making is a very important one. Um, I find it a separate issue that we should address uh, how we, through the mechanisms that the city has, can help our community hospitals remain solvent over the course of many years. And that's probably a discussion that the hospital administrators would be happy to have. Uh, but I don't think um, denying their ability to develop a vacant parking lot is the way that we guarantee that they will be here in perpetuity. I think it's a very valid conversation that the community would like to have. And as I said, you know, I suspect that uh, anyone who administers a hospital uh, would be anxious to have a dialogue with Alderman, with the, with the administration about how we can assure um, that they stay open um, uh, in the long term. I, I mean, I think we welcome that conversation. I just think it's a yeah. separate conversation about whether this lot should be uh, sold and developed so that they can remain solvent, at least for this near future. Uh, which I'm, which I have to assume is one of the reasons why they've entered into this agreement. Yeah. Commissioner, I don't, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with you whatsoever. Um, what I do, see, what I have seen is that we lost Columbus Hospital in Lincoln Park to a high-rise um, residential, and we, we because it was not in a plan development, so that they they were sold out. They didn't have to get any relief under the, then, then dense lakefront zoning. So that was the case in, in Lincoln Park. And then I was challenged with St. Joe's, which is in Lakeview, again, along the lakefront, was not in a plan development. So it was at the time, Mayor Daly said, I want all hospitals in plan developments because all hospitals were not in plan developments for, for hospital and you know, healthcare issue. So I spent, and I went through the same heck that, that Alderman Kappelman is in trying to protect them and gave a 12-story a, a office building, which my residents sued me for three years later. So I'm very aware of what plan developments and retaining hospitals and how important they are, in some cases, how controversial. Um, and so now we're up here, obviously, the surface parking lot is not the highest and best use along the most valuable land probably in the city. But the uh, another technical question is, did this PD have a minimum parking requirement? And is that's number one. And is that is is not having the surface lot affecting the minimum parking requirement for Weiss? Uh, Noah, are you going to try to tackle that? Yeah, I don't know if Paul, if you want to give the specifics, but Alderman, it, it, the the parking was shifted around to to incorporate all the parking needed for the plan development. You know, as the uh, uh, the CEO from Weiss, uh, you know, stated, they have a very large parking garage. All of their parking requirements happen in their lot. This building will provide the parking that it needs in order to meet the ordinance for for its separate building. So there, the PD as a whole will have enough parking to provide for all of the uses that are in the PD as a result of this development. And I could just refer, if it would help Alderman or Commissioner Tunney, that um, 
as noted earlier, there would be 136 spaces for this building, which is a transit-oriented development. Uh, there would be there are 17 spaces in subarea A2, which is just to the north. Then that uh, subarea A also is served by the parking structure, which includes 779 parking spaces that serve the hospital, 193 spaces that serve the medical office building. Uh, there are then another nine spaces in subarea C, the apartment building, the northwest corner of Clarendon. And um, I'm sorry, there are nine, another nine spaces in that parking structure that serve that residential building at the northwest corner of Clarendon and Wilson. And then in that subarea C itself, the building at the northwest corner of Clarendon and Wilson, there are 29 more parking spaces. And, and to I, Paul's I, I point, believe, that's all laid out on the bulk table. That's and I believe page. this was part of the analysis that CDOT did and that Lue Abuna did as part of the traffic study is to ensure that this parking is sufficient to satisfy demand. Thank you. And I don't want to belabor the point, but generally hospitals have a minimum parking requirement for the use. And I don't know where they got it or how they achieved it, but taking away this parking lot is not uh, affecting the parking requirement for the hospital. Is correct? That's correct. Correct, and I don't know. I, okay, maybe Irene wants okay. to address demand too, Commissioner. If you no, want. I, I no, it sounds like there's plenty of parking, but you know, normally parking around any institutional use, university and stuff, is very, very specific. You need X number of parking spaces for the use, and um, how they get that is a, up to them. But uh, uh, so that those were more technical in, re, in re relationship to the PD process that I had worked on extensively to keep. St. Joe's um, maintain, maintained in Lakeview. So those were my angle on this development. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments or questions? I'm not seeing any. Um, so on this one, we, uh, we also need two votes on this one, one because of the Lakefront Protection Ordinance and one because of the PD. So do I have a motion on the proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by Lincoln Property Company at National LLC for the property generally located at 4600 North Marine Drive, claiming that it meets the requirements for approval. Uh, moved by Commissioner Cox. Seconded by. Next, Pizzato. Seconded by Commissioner Spizzato. So let me do the roll call. Um, I think I'm clear on as to who's here, but if I miss someone, you'll let me know. Uh, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Brumfeld, are you still here? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes and yes. <laughs> Commissioner Burnett. Commissioner Burnett. Okay. Commissioner Cordova um, is a no. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Commissioner Flores is not here. She, she had to step out. She might make it back for our last item. Commissioner Garza. Yes. Commissioner Lyons. No. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Commissioner Novada is not here. Commissioner Osterman. Yes. Commissioner Reyes. No. Commissioner Searle is recusing herself on this item. Commissioner Shaw is not here. Uh, Commissioner Sposato. Next Posado is a yes. Commissioner um, Tunney. Commissioner Tunney. Commissioner Viegas. Commissioner Vegas Buck. Yes. Okay, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 votes. So nine to three, motion passes. Um, but now I go to the next one on the amendment to a plan development 37 submitted by Lincoln Property Company National LLC for the property generally located at 4600 North Marine Drive, <clears throat> finding that it meets the requirement of approval. Do I have a motion? So moved by Commissioner Cox. Moved by Commissioner Cox, seconded by? Seconded Commissioner Wagaspeck. Thank you. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Commissioner Cordova, I mean, Commissioner Burnett, I guess is gone. Uh, Commissioner Cordova is a no. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Garza? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? No. Commissioner Moore? Yes. 
Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Osterman? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? No. Commissioner, again, um, Commissioner Searle recused herself. Commissioner Spazzato? Next Spazzato is a yes. Commissioner Wagespach? Yes. Uh, motion passes nine to three. Um, congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. The time that you took. Thank you. Uh, last on the agenda, uh, our com commissioners, did you hear me say that? Last on the agenda? Uh, I made it and we're not going to be here till eight o'clock tonight, which is what Noah was thinking. Um, last on the agenda is D14, a proposed oh. amendment. I was thinking too, uh, is a land plan development. Last on the agenda is, is D14, a proposed amendment to plan development 180 submitted by the Benedictine Sisters of Chicago for the property generally located at 7416-7460 Northridge Boulevard. The property is currently zoned plan development 180. And the applicant is proposing to establish two sub areas to allow for the future development of a senior living facility in the northern sub area. No changes are proposed to the southern sub area, which includes the existing school, monastery, convent, chapel, <clears throat> and care facility. Um, Catherine Hurd again will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Ms. Hurd. Thank you. Good afternoon for the record. My name is Catherine Hurd. I know you all are sick of hearing from me. No, we're not. <laughs> I'm with the plan, Department of Planning and Development. The applicant, the Benedictine Sisters of Chicago, are here today to request approval of an amendment to PD 180, which is generally located at 7416 to 7460 North Ridge, which is on Ridge Avenue, approximately between Birchwood and Jarvis. The applicant is proposing to create two sub areas and modifying the allowed uses within one of those new sub areas. The site is located within the West Ridge community area, which has a racially and ethnically diverse population, particularly for the North region. This area is predominantly residential land uses, much of which was constructed prior to 1969. The applicant is proposing to create two sub areas within the plan development. Sub area A would be modified to allow for a future development of a 100 unit senior living facility. The applicant was previously approved for uses related to the Benedictine Sisters Convent, which includes housing, recreation, educational mission, which will remain the only uses permitted in sub area B, which is the southern sub area. The site is located close to the northern limits of the city and is reasonably well served by surrounding amenities. The current site <clears throat> is also <laughs> surrounded by residential uses, but reasonably close to Howard, which is the nearest commercial corridor. Now I'd like to pass it off to Tyler Manick with Shane Banks to go over the details of the proposed project. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. For the record, Tyler Manick with Shane Banks, Kenyon Schwartz. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Sister Judy, Sister Judith, and Sister Mary of the Benedictine Sisters of Chicago, and Tom Zimmer and Joe Perez of Plant Moran, their development consultants. Uh, this slide includes some of the background of the Benedictine uh, Sisters. In 1852, the Benedictine Sisters migrated from Germany to the United States in order to establish their religious order in the United States. By 1860, the Benedictine Sisters established their first presence in Chicago. And as of 1865, the Benedictine Sisters opened St. Scholastica Academy. During the late 1890s, the Benedictine Sisters acquired uh, the parcel that we're talking about of 14 and a half acres at 7416, 7460 North Ridge and Rogers Park. In 1907, the Benedictine Sisters built their, the convent where they reside now, which included a boarding school and they relocated their uh, residence to the convent also in uh, 1907 with their St. Scholastic Academy to the subject property. In 1924, the Benedictine sisters added the St. Scholastic Chapel with an attached school building to their campus. And in 1958, they added an arts building at the south end of the school. In 1980, the Benedictine sisters established St. Joseph's Court to care for their elderly sisters. Due to declining enrollment, the Benedictine sisters were forced to close uh, St. Scholastica Academy 
in 2012, 2013 school year and currently lease the school to a Cerro Charter School. Uh, on June 9th, 1977, the city of Chicago passed an institutional plan development PD 180 for this property to uh, establish the existing uses, which is the monastery, the convent, the chapel, the um, St. Joseph Court Care Facility and the Charter School. The goal of the Benedictine Sisters for mending PD 180 is to create and transfer ownership of subarea A, that northern subarea, to a best in class senior living developer to build a senior care facility that will serve the needs of the, el of the elderly, including for the sisters as they age in place be a and be a positive addition for the neighborhood and honor the sisters' legacy and their over 120 year stewardship of this land. Currently, there are 22 sisters residing at their campus with an average age of 84 years. The cost of maintaining their property and the sisters' ability to care for themselves at St. Joseph Court has become uh, unsustainable as the, and their existing uh, residential needs need to be modernized. Since the subject property is currently underutilized, the sisters need to monetize some of their parcel to support their ongoing ministry while providing for their future residential and care needs. Catherine, if you can move to the next slide, please. This slide depicts the different uses on the Benedictine Sisters campus, which includes the single family residence on sub area A, where certain sisters reside. Uh, below that, St. Joseph's Care Facility, where elderly sisters currently reside. And below that, the St. Scholastica Monastery, where other, the rest of the sisters reside. This is also where they dine and pray together. Below that is a St. Scholastica Chapel and the Cerro School with the school's athletic fields to the west. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, the Evanston city limits is approximately 16, 650 feet to the north of this. You can go to the next slide, please. This slide uh, identifies the sub area boundaries in relation to the surrounding area. Next slide, please. This slide depicts a four-story Acero Charter School uh, from a viewpoint of Ridge Road on the eastern boundary of the PD. The school has a height of 69 feet. Next slide, please. This slide depicts the four and a half story St. Scholastica Monastery where the sister, some of the sisters currently reside. Uh, the monastery has a height of 61 uh, feet above grade. Next slide, please. This slide depicts uh, the athletic fields uh, that are on the west, uh, western boundary of this PED along Oakley. Next slide, please. This slide depicts, a, this slide depicts a school parking lot from, from Oakley. Uh, the school's parking lot provides 96 spaces, which is accessed off of Jarvis on the southern edge of the PD. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this slide is another depiction of the athletic field uh, from the south, uh, Jarvis Avenue. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, depicts the entrance to the schools on uh, 96 parking spaces from Jarvis Avenue. Next slide, please. Uh, and, this slide and this slide depicts a two and three story southernmost school building on the campus from Ridge Road. This building is 42 feet in height at the uppermost floor. Next slide, please. Uh, at this time, I'd like to thank uh, the Department uh, of Planning staff and uh, all their women had in for all their efforts in helping the Benedictine Sisters uh, make this project happen. Uh, the, the Benedictine Sisters team met with all their women had in and the department on several occasions to come up with a plan to meet their future needs. Um, in addition, on June 7th, there was a com community meeting held by Alderwoman Haddon that was attended by the 49th Ward residents and 50th Ward residents, which is the adjacent ward to the west. Um, in addition, after that meeting, Alderwoman Haddon's office did take a survey of the 49th Ward, including the adjacent 50th, 50th Ward residents, and uh, the Benedictine sisters were fortunate to receive overwhelming support for this request. Uh, next slide, please. This slide uh, depicts some of the community and economic benefits. The senior living facility that is being proposed here is gonna be open to the public. 
Uh, this, uh, the Benedictine sisters had plant Moran to commission a market study that uh, identified that there's going to be a senior living deficit in the area. Uh, in, as of 2024, there's anticipated to be a need for 219 independent living units and 161 assisted living units. Uh, so this proposed project not only will uh, fulfill the needs of the sisters to be able to age in place in a, a property that they have held, held for over 120 years, but also for the public uh, to also fulfill their, their needs. There's an anticipated economic investment uh, to build a senior living facility of $48 million to $60 million to construct this facility. Uh, and there's an anticipated 275 to 400 construction jobs created by the senior living facility with a estimated 75 to 85 full-time employees uh, to operate the senior living facility after it's built. If we can skip to the 19th slide, Catherine, on the ARO slide. So as the slide indicates, this property is located in a higher income area within uh, the meaning of the 2015 ARO ordinance. Uh, the future senior living facility will be subject uh, and in compliance with the ARO requirements. There's a maximum uh, senior living units of 100 being built here. And if all 100 are built, uh, that would mean 10 ARO units would be committed at the site, 10% uh, of whatever's built. And Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. The team is ready to answer any questions from the commission. All right. Um, so again, for the record, uh, Catherine Hurd with DPD. So I uh, just wanted to mention that this um, is to create sub areas and to allow uses within those sub areas. So anything that would be proposed within sub area A would have to go through our site plan approval. Just wanted to mention that for the plan commissioners. Um, so it would be going through all of the regular um, reviews with DPD, CDOT, MOPD, the older woman, and then would come back to plan commission um, for a presentation for comment. And then um, they would still be subject to all of our all of our policies. So just wanted to make sure that was clear. So the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the project materials and submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposed development would be appropriate for the following reasons. Um, it's compatible with the surrounding zoning and promotes economically beneficial development patterns compatible with the character of the existing neighborhood. Please refer to the staff report for further details regarding this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the zoning administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that this application be in conformance with the provisions um, sorry, be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hurd. Uh, what about Alder, Alder Woman um, Haddon? Do we, do we have a letter from her? Do. We do. In, the, in, in support, yes. She was unable to attend, but she did su submit a letter to us, yes. I would assume. Okay. Uh, Commissioner uh, Reyes. Yeah. Um, so when the ARO is going to apply, when the, the, the future development comes back to PD for approval, come back to the plan commission for approval, because uh, it's, it's going to be the 2015 ARO, the 2021 ARO. I believe the 2021 will be effective in October, if I remember correctly. This is Noah. Uh, Commissioner Reyes, this, this would be approved prior to October 1st, 2021. So the, the 2015 ARO would be what is held for this project. Okay, thank you, Noah. Um, thank you, although I think Commissioner Reyes, I'm sure you'd like to see people going by the 2021, even though it may not be. Yeah. Yeah. And just, just to clarify, if, if for some reason this does not pass the Committee on Zoning and it does not pass City Council and does not make the October 1st date, then it would be ended up being subject to the new 2021 obligations. Great. Do I have a motion? Thanks, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, thank you, Noah. 
Do I have a motion on the proposed amendment to plan development 180 submitted by the Benedictine Sisters of Chicago for the property generally located at 7416-7416 Northridge Boulevard, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? I'll make the motion, Garza. Thank you, Commissioner, seconded by? Commissioner mm -hmm. Searle. Commissioner Searle, thank you so much, Commissioner Searle. Um, Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Commissioner Brumfield. Oh, Commissioner Burnett? Yes. And yes on the other ones that I missed. And, and Madam Chair, Commissioner Brumfield is a yes. Okay. My apologies. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Cordova is a yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Flores? Uh, I know she she came back, did she not? Okay. Uh, see, so I you may have voted yes on other items where I couldn't hear you. We still can't hear you now, but I'm seeing your hand. Well, so welcome back, Commissioner. Commissioner Garza is a yes. Uh, yes. Wait, I'm sorry. I am a yes, uh, yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Uh, Murphy. Yes. Osterman. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Searle. Yes. Commissioner Sposato. Amen for that vote. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Vegas is gone and Commissioner Vegas Buck. Yes. All right, motion passes. Congratulations. Uh, thank you to all. Well, we're, we haven't, we need a motion for adjournment, but I want to thank, first of all, all the commissioners who hung in here all day long. Uh, we made it before five o'clock. How about that? Um, and with that, can I get a motion for adjournment? So move. By Commissioner Burnett, seconded by Commissioner Moore. Thank you. And let me go through the roll call here. Commissioner Biagi. Yes. Enthusiastic, yes. <laughs> Ryan, uh, Commissioner Brumfeld. Yes. Lots of enthusiastic yeses. Uh, Commissioner Burnett. Yes. Commissioner Cordova, enthusiastic, yes. Um, Commissioner Cox. Woohoo! <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is? Let me look at, let me see your face. Yes. Uh, Commissioner um, Garza. Yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. That didn't sound very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> that was either like, are we done? Really? I want to keep going. Um, Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Searle. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Tunney? Yes. And my cat says yes, too. Um, and Commissioner Wagespot? Well, I was just catching a second win, but yes. <laughs> All right, Commissioner, that motion passes. We are officially adjourned. At, this concludes this month's meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission. Uh, we are adjourned at 4.50 p.m. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. What a committed group. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Bye. Thank you, Madam Chair.